Yes, good morning, everybody. Good evening, wherever you are. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to the Solasi meeting being held uh, virtually, but it's supposed to be in uh, the beautiful city, Buenos Aires. It's a shame it is virtual, but this COVID gave us a lesson. So this is a combined uh, session between the PIX Society and Solasi. We want to thank Solasi leadership for giving us an opportunity to be with you and to share some uh, educational material with our colleagues from Latin America, but of course, uh, all over the world. And I hope that we have uh, many people joining from different parts of the world. Without further ado, I have a great uh, uh, moderator uh, people here. We have uh, Dr. Carlos Pedra from uh, Sao Paulo, Argentina, Dr. Alejandro Perón from, uh, Buenos, uh, from Cordoba, Argentina, not Buenos Aires, Cordoba. And then we have uh, different uh, panelists uh, with us. We have Carlos Zabal from Mexico, Dr. Shelabi, Emma Shelabi from uh, Istanbul, Dr. Garay Francisco from uh, uh, Santiago, Chile, Dr. Jose Alonso from Buenos Aires, Argentina, Raul Arrieta, who was uh, Argentinian by birth, but uh, Brazilian by uh, heart now. And uh, <laughs> all right, Dr. Damski from uh, Barbosa from Argentina. And last but not least, Dr. Uh, Daniel Arrieta from uh, Santiago, Chile. Welcome to all of you. And let's start our session with the first speaker, of course, needs no introduction, Dr. Carlos Pedra from uh, Argentina, who is going to talk to us about a relatively new valve. Some of you may know it. It's called my valve. And it's not mine, it's his valve, but it's my <laughs> valve that he will share with us this. You have 12 minutes, Dr. Pedra, to share with us your uh, knowledge and experience about this valve. Please. Thanks, Ziad. I didn't know I was Argentinian as per your introduction, but anyways, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Brazilian, I am sorry. No problem, Ziad. <laughs> so uh, this is the title of my talk and I deliberately changed it uh, for uh, initial experience uh, with my valve in pulmonary and tricuspid positions. Um, the my valve slides were provided by Mario and I was involved in the Venus valve study and I'm a proctor for Medtronic. These are my disclosure. So this is a slide that is well known. About 85% of patients with RVOT abnormalities had enlarged post-op RVOTs and about 15% have either conduits or bioprosthetic valves. Uh, what are the options for transcatheter revalvularization? Some valves are balloon expandable, like the Melody and the Sapien. Uh, although these valves are mostly used in conduits and, and bioprosthetic valve, the Sapien valve can be used as well in enlarged post-op RVOTs. But for this um, uh, configuration anatomy, the self-expandable uh, valves are more appropriate. Of course, there is the Harmony, the Venus, Pusta is also available and Alejandro will talk about that. Uh, my job here is to go over the MyVal. Uh, it's a very interesting design. It's made of nickel cobalt. Uh, the valve itself is made of uh, bovine pericardial. It's a tri-leaflet valve. There is some coverage here of PTFE, a PET, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, also in the inner portion and outer portion. Uh, the, the purpose of this is to avoid paravalvular leak in the aortic positions. There are many uh, options in terms of, of sizes with uh, 1.5 increments. And uh, it's a mixture of open cell uh, design above and closed cell uh, below. The open cells uh, give access to the coronary arteries if need be in the aortic position. And once this valve is crimped onto the balloon, uh, you can see this configuration uh, here. I'm not going to go over each of these, but more or less you can see uh, the height of, the, of this uh, row here, then the second row and blah, blah, blah. And this is very good because uh, you can see the valve very easy when you deploy the valve. Uh, this is an example of in the aortic position and you 
uh, have very uh, a very controlled uh, deployment. Uh, of course, most of us go very slowly in terms of uh, deployment uh, when we inflate the balloon to get uh, a perfect position, uh, such as in this case. Uh, one of the advantages of these valves is that they have big uh, valves. Uh, larger diameters such as the 30.5 and 32 and uh, these are already available here uh, in Brazil so we are lucky uh, tomorrow I'm going to do a case with the 32 valve and the balloon is interesting as, as well there's a leaf here uh, as you can see uh, in in blue and and there are a proximal and a distal stopper uh, which prevents uh, slippage of the crimped valve. So the navigation is good. It goes through the tricuspid valve easily uh, once you, you pass through uh, the, the true orifice. Um, the, the size you want to achieve depends on the, uh, on the amount of, of volume. Although the balloon gets up to six atmosphere, depending on the volume uh, you inflate the balloon, you achieve the size. And there is a very nice delivery system as well. Let's see if I can change the slide here. Uh, it has a rotation knob here. And once you rotate, uh, it does like that. This helps to negotiate the aortic arch. And once you uh, put uh, this upside down, uh, you can do the same rotation and you can negotiate the right ventricular outflow tract. So uh, this is very handy. Uh, in terms of the introducer sheet, uh, it's called Python, uh, Python, uh, which uh, is a surrogate for the, uh, of the snake because it enlarges once uh, the, the, the valve passes uh, through it. It's like a, a, a snake uh, uh, swallowing its prey, right? And, then, and it's a very nice system, although the hemostatic valve is not that very good. Once you use in the aortic size, we call it the hemorrhagic valve. Uh, we make a joke. So they have to get better. Uh, so there is a, a connector here that helps you uh, to uh, transfer uh, the valve itself uh, through, the, uh, through the introducer sheet. And once you advance, the introducer sheet uh, enlarges the, the Python, as you can see uh, in this a little movie here, so it's 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 very interesting, and uh, the the Python uh, sheet also uh, is very good if you want to uh, recapture the valve. Uh, this is not possible with the Edwards valve, uh, at least in most of cases. But if you want to recapture, if something goes wrong with your implantation, you can uh, pull everything back. And, and take it out of the body with uh, not much uh, of effort. And they also have a balloon, it's called Mammoth, for pre-dilation. Uh, it has a nice uh, soft distal automatic cone. The balloon itself is similar uh, to other balloons in terms of sizes and atmospheres and, and the amount of volume. I'm not going into that. So the purpose here is to report two cases. Uh, on the use of these valve, one in the pulmonary position, the other in tricuspid valve. So this is the first case, a uh, four, uh, 14 year old male uh, with two previous surgeries for tetralogy of a low. He had a primary repair in 2007 with a transannular patch and a monocusp. And then because of uh, uh, severe PI, uh, he had undergone in 2016 uh, pulmonary valve replacement with a trifecta 21, which has a true ID of 19. He was symptomatic and had pulmonary valve stenotic and free PI with RV dysfunction and increased volumes on uh, MRI. So this is the aspect of the dysfunctional RV. We did a TE uh, during the procedure Usually we don't do that routinely, but because it was our first case, so we decided to go with uh, TE, even for the uh, pulmonary valve, you can see how stenotic it is and, and with some uh, PI, uh, there's a better appreciation of the stenotic valve here uh, with a significant uh, gradient and very low 
uh, mobility. So this was the first angel. You can see where the valve uh, was implanted with free uh, PI and, and stenotic uh, appearance. But let's move forward. So we tested for coronary arteries. As you know, it's very unusual to have a compression of the coronary arteries. Uh, and we used the mammoth balloon and it went very well. And we had uh, almost 19 millimeters um, waste on this balloon. So we decided to use a MyValve 21.5 and it navigated really well. There was some fine tuning in terms of positioning. Uh, we inflated the balloon very, very slowly. Uh, we didn't use any uh, pacemaker here. So at the end of the inflation, when we took uh, the balloon out, you can see how stable the valve was on the right side. But, you know, uh, the appearance, uh, oh, it's stuck here, let me see. The appearance here, uh, it, it, seems, it seemed to us that it, it needed some more uh, flaring because we had uh, uh, not even 18 millimeters on the way. So we flared using uh, Atlas Gold Balloon 22, and we got a better appearance in the end uh, with uh, restoration of, of uh, the function of the valve and the final diameter was almost uh, 20. So this was the echo uh, appearance in the, oh, I'm sorry, this is the hemodynamics. We had a bit of gradient here between our V and MPA, and we ended up with a 10 uh, millimeters of gradient with uh, no PI. And this is the echo uh, done during the procedure uh, with a good valve function and uh, the circular, circular aspect in the end. So it was very rewarding. And the two month follow up, uh, we did that two months ago and showed that the valve was working really well when we do MRI after a year to assess for RV remotely. So this was the second case, a 24 year old male with Epstein disease and a small functional RV. Uh, he had undergone three previous uh, procedure, uh, uh, pulmonary, a tricuspid valve replacement with EPIC, the, after that a pacemaker, and again 2011, uh, a biocore 33 in the tricuspid uh, valve. Uh, he, has, he had been symptomatic with uh, a significant gradient across the tricuspid valve and moderate uh, uh, TR with dilated RA, IVC, and, and, and dysfunction of both uh, ventricles. Uh, if you take a look uh, at the app, uh, BioCore 33 has an ID of 28.5. Uh, and the Angel CT, I'm not going to show here, showed an internal diameter of 27 by uh, 29. But on echo, uh, as you're going to see, there were lots of uh, debris inside the valve with immobile leaflets. So we discussed with the Mario people, they wanted us to go for 30.5, but I was sure that 29 was, uh, uh, was going to function well. Uh, and we use the 29 valve. So this is the very dilated IVC, uh, the, the right ventricle with the here with the septum bulging towards the left ventricle, the appearance of the valve with very immobile leaflets, just one leaflet uh, open in here. Uh, so because of that appearance, I was sure that the 29 valve uh, was going uh, to work well. At that time, we didn't have the 30.5 in our country. Uh, these uh, uh, are some more pictures of the valve with stenosis and insufficiency. So this was the first angel. This patient had, a, had had a gland shunt in his third procedure, and this valve had a very favorable angle of entry. So we didn't have to uh, work really hard to get the wire through it, and we parked the Lundquist wire on the RPA, and the valve navigated really well across uh, the valve with some push and pull with the wire. So this is the fine tuning in terms of position. And we use a little bit more volume, uh, 35 instead of 32 on the 29 uh, valve to achieve a very good apposition. So here is the very slow inflation of the balloon. 
and this is the final appearance with some flaring, uh, both in the proximal and distal end. So we were happy uh, with the result. Uh, there were some very nice uh, pictures on echo. This was the fine angel showing the valve with no insufficiency uh, whatsoever. I'm gonna show, uh, I'm not, haven't been able to achieve, uh, let me go. There you go, there you go. So hemodynamics under GA, we had three uh, millimeters of gradient uh, of um, between uh, RA and, 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 and diastolic uh, pressure of the RV. And we, did, and we achieved the zero gradient in the end with very good function on echo. I think uh, T helps a lot during these procedures for the, for the tricuspid valve. And you can see the valve opening uh, well, except a little bit for one leaflet here, but we didn't have any significant insufficiency. This guy got really better. It's just a month of follow-up. So we're looking forward to doing some more uh, cases. Uh, when he came back, the, uh, this was the appearance on TTE. As you can see, the valve is working well uh, with no uh, stenosis, with no insufficiency. And there was better feeling of the uh, left ventricle, and this is the 3D picture showing the valve uh, working uh, really well. Uh, so in conclusion, this valve seems a promise to, uh, to restore valve function, both in pulmonary and tricuspid position. And I'm looking forward to hearing Ahmed, who has a very large experience with this valve. It's user fan friendly, has a wide array of dimensions. See, uh, dimensions you can probably use in enlarged post-op or VOTs. It's approved in our country. However, a longer follow-up with larger number of patients is needed to establish valve function in the long run and other applications. Yeah. So with that, I finish my talk and I thank, thank Solasi and I thank Pix. Ziad. Th thank you. Thanks, uh, Carlos. Uh, we're running a little bit late uh, with this. So what I'm going to do Hopefully, at the end of this session, we'll have questions for everybody. But let's now proceed to the second talk. Alejandro, do you want to present the second talk? It's Francisco. Yeah. Okay. So uh, our 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 second speaker is a friend, is a, a very well known uh, leader in LATAM, Dr. Francisco Garay from Santiago de Chile. He will talk about the experience of the Venus P valve in uh, Latin America. So Francisco, uh, you can start with your talk. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Alejandro. Sorry. Um, can you see the presentation? Yes. Alejandro. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to present for you uh, the mostly the follow up of the experience with the Venus P valve in, in Latin America. Uh, at this part of the game, all of you know the, the Venus P valve. Uh, we have presented this valve in previous meetings and we have do uh, we have done a couple of live cases as well, and some of you have had a first line experience with this. This is the self expanding nitinal valve, and I will show now mostly the, the experience and the midterm follow up of this experience that we did in Latin America. This is my disclosure. And I have to tell that uh, from 2016, to June 2021 recently, uh, we have implanted, we have done 41 implants of, with the Venus P valve in here in Latin America, uh, mostly in Argentina, uh, two centers in Chile and Carlos also do some cases in Brazil. Uh, so we have done, and I will show you the, the summary of this experience that uh, resumes experience of 10 centers in these countries and involved 21 operators and I think a little more. Um, most of the patients that have received a venous P valve are patients with a diagnosis of tetralogy of fallow. Um, this is the summary of the first 29 patients we did. 28 of them were tetralogy of fallow. Uh, and one additional patient who, who the original diagnosis was a pulmonary atresia intact ventricular septum. 
So in all of these patients with a transanural patch, uh, some of them with some an additional diagnosis, like you can see here, two patients with mild PA branch stenosis, uh, two, patient, two patients with a pul pulmonary artery stents previously, uh, a patient with a MPA aneurysm, a patient with a residual VSD, uh, LPA agenesia, a patient with a cardiac defibrillator, and one patient with a pacemaker implanted as well. So some of the, these patients uh, have particular uh, um, stuff, you know? So as a summary, uh, we have done 41 implants with the venous P valve in native RVOT in 41 patients. So that tells us that we were successful in to select uh, appropriately uh, select patients that could receive at the end the implant of the venous P valve, including, including one patient who underwent a hybrid procedure uh, because he needed a MPA picature to reduce the RVOT. Uh, and after that, uh, perventricular delivery for the valve in the same procedure. The global follow up for this group is of the 32 months as a median. And, and the range goes from patients with one month follow-up and the, all the patients um, a little more than five years of follow-up. Uh, we have had no mortality related to the procedure. And so far in this follow-up of 32 months, we have had no endocarditis so far, like us, and we have had no explantations of the valve needed in this period. And I have to say that about complications that during the procedure, mostly of the complications were minor complications. You remember that at the beginning of the experience, fever was uh, usually seen. So we recorded uh, five patients with fever post implant. One patient needed a um, transfusion of red blood cells. One patient referred chest pain for the first 48 hours of, after the implantation. One case, we had an unfolding during the deployment. Uh, it's not uh, difficult to diagnose and not difficult to treat. Um, we have seen three patients with stent fractures in the, in the stent. And I decided to put this in the minor complications. And I tell you later why. And about major, major complications, we have one case with a proximal malposition of the valve that resulted in a severe tricuspid regurgitation that was very well tolerated. However, the, because the right ventricle was not going all the well that we were expecting, he, this patient needed a tricuspid valve replacement three years after the original position. And particularly in this patient, the venous P valve was not removed because the valve was uh, examined and looks good, was function well, and after the tricuspid valve replacement, the venous, valve, the venous P valve remains working very good so far. Um, three cases with a prolapse of the valve into the RVOT. Three of these patients were, the valve was successfully recaptured into the same delivery system. So we discovered that it's possible to do. And one patient who had a complete AB block that was transient for and cells recovered in the first for 24 hours of uh, observation. Um, and one patient who, um, who presented a ventricular tachycardia that required electrical cardioversion and that was presented 18 days after the implant. And don't, don't need nothing more than that. And, remains on, on, on medication for the rhythm. Okay, now, then this is some images of the fracture that we see. Of course, at the beginning, we were very concerned of, because of the fracture, and you can see the fracture of the stent are presented uh, when happened in the proximal third of the valve as soon as six months of evaluation. But during the, the follow-up, you can see that even nearly three years of follow-up, the, the fractures uh, seems to be not progressive in time, should be related to the 
to the model to the concept of a, of a self expanding valve uh, in the contractile infundibulum of the RVOT. So the, this, the, beside of that, the no collapse of the valve have seen in these patients with uh, with fractures and the valve has remained uh, very functional as you can see here. So I decided to to inter to consider these fractures as a part of this concept of this model of the self-expanding valve in a contractile infundibulum. So uh, I'm not concerned anymore about these fractures in, in, in this valve. Well, okay, what about the valves we implanted in this 41 patients. Um, you can see that the diameter of the implanted valves were all between 26 up to 36 millimeter valve, which is the largest valve available. And most of the valves are between 30 uh, up to 34 millimeters. So you can have an idea that we are dealing with very large and dilated uh, MPAs and RVOTs. The mean implanted valve diameter, as you can see in the box below, was about usually five millimeters larger than the minimum MPA diameter during the procedure. And what about the, the valve length? Um, all the valves we implanted were with the valve length of 25 or 30 millimeters in the length of the central straight part of the valve. And interestingly, interestingly I, I separate this in the first three years of the experience where we implanted mostly 30 millimeters length valves. And the last three years of the experience that we moved and we have a shift and now we prefer to implant the shorter valves and we implanted more uh, 25 millimeters length valves as you can see here. And that is because the, it was demonstrated by us and by other groups that the shorter the valve, the, the easier to advance and navigate with the delivery system and you avoid the problem of a proximal uh, entangling of the tricuspid valve apparatus if happen. As a summary, the, the length of the valve usually is a little shorter, about four millimeters shorter than the MPA length that we measured on echo or angiograms. Okay, so I will show you now uh, the summary of the medium term follow-up of this. You can see on echo, you can have a very good idea of uh, the functioning of the valve. You can see the leaflets, you can have measurements on the, the degree of regurgitation if exist and the degree of uh, gradient if exist. In the 13 patients that have uh, most uh, prolongated, the, the longer follow-up with a mean of 39 months of follow-up, we have demonstrated a peak gradient in the venous P valve no higher than 60 millimeter mercury gradient as a, as a medium. The range goes from nine up to 25 millimeters mercury gradient in, in those patients. And you can see here in the, in, the, in the graphic that most of the patients remain with no regurgitation or trivial regurgitation and no more than a mild regurgitation in some few patients. What about the MRI information during the follow-up? You can see here a beautiful image of, about how you can see the, how it looks, the venous P valve in the RVOT. And you can see the measurements these guys do on the uh, regurgitation that disappear after the valve implantation. And you can see the information for the first 10 patients who have had a MRI during the follow-up after one year the, of the procedure. And you can see how, uh, how the regurgitation fraction of the pulmonary valve decreased from significantly decreased from basal 47% of regurgitation to almost nothing, 3.3% of regurgitation on MRI. You can see additionally that there was a uh, uh, remodeling, remodeling, a change in the right ventricle volume and diastolic volume here, and you can see how it decreased significantly from a basal of 140 to about 98 ml per square meter after the implantation, most longer than one year after the implantation in the patient. And the same occur with the end systolic volume for the right ventricle who decreased very significantly 
from basal to 74 to 48 ml per square meter one year, more than one year after the, the procedure. The ejection fraction of the right ventricle is not that consistent in change because there are more issues than just the pulmonic regurgitation to explain the, the ejection fraction. But you can see here that it's not bad. Uh, some patients uh, improve, uh, the other patients remain the same. Um, but um, most important than the MRI is what the patient feels. So you can see here the functional class from the basal in about, it was 24 patients, I think, that most of them were in functional class two or three and most than one year of follow-up, most of the patients remain now on functional class one and no patient on functional class three. So they, the patients, say they feel very good and change the functional capacity after the implantation. So uh, as a summary, uh, our experience like others has demonstrated that the venous P valves could be, uh, was able to safely, safely implanted in patients with a severe PR and dilated RVOT. Uh, the venous P valve so far in the midterm follow-up has demonstrated to restore the pulmonic valve function in a sustained way during the few years, at least after the implantation during the, this midterm follow-up. And of course, the clinical experience is increasing, is ongoing, but so far he's demonst he's demonstrated, has demonstrated a good valve function and a good durability uh, in this period of time. Beside of that, I have to say that the experience uh, between different centers and colleagues in Latin America has been a very useful and, uh, and gratefully for the colleagues, for the professional experience, and of course, for the patients. So thank you to all of thank the you. people who Thanks. have participated in this. Thank you, Siad. Thank Thanks, you, Francisco. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, do you want to present the second, uh, the next uh, speaker, please? Carlos? Sorry, oh. sorry, my, my oh. mic was, was okay. off. Let me see, who is the next speaker? Raul, Raul. Raul Arrieta, my brother here, oh, my wow. very good friend, and he's gonna go over new insights to treat uh, uh, the tricuspid valve. Maybe he's gonna talk about some new technologies. Raul, please, welcome to PIX at Solasi. Hola, buenos días a todos. Voy a hablar en español porque mi inglés no es bueno. Good morning, my uh, talk is about the new insight about the uh, tricuspid valve replacement, the percutaneous approach. We know that uh, there are very important uh, anatomical implications to consider in any percutaneous intervention, like the the and the AVN and the uh, coronary arteries go through the groove, the subvalve, the right subvalve group, uh, groove. You know the tricuspid re replacement is a very current. We have two main causes. First one is uh, secondary to uh, functional issues or functional, which is the one that is uh, more in vogue due to uh, left heart disease, right ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, and right atrial abnormalities. And also we have the primaries, which are the congenital and the acquired, like uh, endocarditis and carcinoid syndromes. So we have some options of treatment, of percutaneous treatment. Uh, in this scenario, uh, we have that the uh, one of the possibilities is to implant the prosthesis in the native valve. Another possibility is to uh, try to clip the leaflets of the tricuspid valve. And the other one is to perform an annealoplasty. I'm going to talk very quickly about these options. Let's start first with the valve implantation. The valve implant, sorry, Evoke is uh, one of the prostheses that I consider that's very interesting. It's produced by, manufactured by Edwards. It's uh, bovine pericardium, 
It goes from 44 to 48 millimeters in size. The differential is re relatively low profile and it has a multiplanar system that is uh, easy to deploy. It's a, a, a study, a compassion study with uh, only 25 patients, but with uh, pretty good, uh, interesting results, uh, reducing the tricuspid uh, issues with uh, and no procedural deaths. But uh, as we know, since these are already compromised patients, all eight of them required a permanent peacemaker. So as we said, we this is uh, the area we'll see. We had an improvement after 30 days after the implant in the functional class, as well as uh, with the level of tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, many of them uh, ended up without a major or significant tri tricuspid regurgitation. So we believe that it has a good future. Yeah, another one is the gate device, uh, needs to know a valve self expanding uh, with a Pretty large size, uh, 42 French with the introducer. It can be inserted through the internal jugular vein uh, with, because uh, it needs uh, quite a large introducer or by thoracotomy on the left atrium. So this is the valve of the skate device. And you can see it's a equine uh, pericardium. And we'll see here uh, the way that we've shown the initial experiences with uh, 30 patients. 25 were implanted through the transatrial access uh, to using a thoracotomy, and only five transjugular. And in spite that we had some of the patients that uh, had to be converted to surgery in the transatrial group, uh, we've had a a little bit of a higher mortality compared to the previous one, but the results are pretty interesting. Anyway, you have 77% with uh, reduced uh, mild to uh, no uh, regurgitation. Uh, so with a functional class, sorry, but uh, it could be it should work for a better French uh, French size because it is a 42 French. We have other alternatives. We have studies with a few patients with the Cardiovalve by Boston Medical, Lux Valve from China, and the Intrepid by Medtron Medtronic. These are alternatives that could appear in for a primary implantation of a tricuspid valve. The second way that we can uh, treat this is uh, using clips, and uh, here's the first uh, option that is uh, very interesting. That was developed in Germany. We have uh, risk outcomes after a year, and uh, they've studied a feasibility study in the United States, and this is some kind of a device similar to a clip, in which we have a central uh, shaft, and you can, uh, through these paddles, you can uh, close each of the, of the leaflets independently one or the other or both of them and this is shown uh, in this feasibility study after a year of the implantation very good results in terms of uh, functional class as well as the regurgitation uh. so the other proposal would be an aneuroplasty a percutaneous aneuroplasty uh, here the option is the cardioband system also by edwards and this is a intravenous uh, system uh, 16 French, uh, we, where we use a, ba a band that is uh, clipped around the annulus, and then we do a contraction of the annulus, like this. You can see in the imaging, it is a pre contraction. You can see uh, the echo before the contraction and after the contraction with cardio band already compressed. For these patients, we've had a study with 30 uh, patients, zero mortality. Uh, it's been possible to implant the valve in 28. The main risk has been uh, bleeding. And uh, there had been a mortality of almost zero. So this gives us a lot of enthusiasm and 44% uh, of mild uh, regurgi regurgitation. So results are promising. The, in the treatment, uh, percutaneous treatment of uh, congenital heart diseases, 
have uh, the implantation of valves or of annulae and uh, the tricuspid uh, most of them have been focused to valve in valve procedures here we have the indications of uh, the disease there is, this is a recent publication where the prostheses have been the melody and the sapiens sapien with very good results in the long and mid, in the short and midterm and the tricuspid uh, regurgitation when it's treated with uh, valve in valve the results are pretty good the tricuspid uh, regurgitation went to, uh, we went to a very small numbers of uh, moderate but mostly mild and now we can see that uh, the large majority is uh, has some relief with stenosis uh, using by using the valve. But uh, some of the main risk factors may be the EDH and the uh, functional class over four. So the, these are the worst cases when uh, we implant the tricuspid valve and. For Melody and Sapien, we've had no uh, no difference in re-interventions. In 2015, in Incors, in the city of Sao Paulo, we implanted with a, we had an experience with a Brazilian valve called Innovare. This valve has been applied with a transapical uh, position and in the Mitchell position. And this uh, encouraged us to use it in the tricuspid position. And here we have the 20 millimeters of uh, height, several measurements of width and diameter, sorry, and it can be uh, clipped, uh, it could be placed with uh, balloons, the mitral balloons that we have, like Max L.D. and Crystal. We prepare it uh, regularly. Here we have the, you know, how it's done. Uh, this is a, a very friendly way to work. Uh, as uh, well, Carlos Pedro already discussed a little bit about the MyVal, it's similar. Uh, yeah, we follow the procedure, the protocols. We go through the right jugular vein. This is the vein of choice. Or the right jugular or the femoral, maybe too. We use a uh, dry seal 24 French. Uh, for all uh, patients, and we use the Landerquist guide. It's placed uh, through the uh, distal AP, and we used a pre-dilation balloon as we uh, went through the annulus. Here we have uh, an image which is similar to the one that Carlos showed. Here, during the implantation of the valve, you can see the marks well placed in the plane of the previous valve. The uh, geography of the first patient that we uh, did uh, in 2016. This uh, was a compassionate use and in the latest years we have uh, increased our experience, we have taken the experience of that, from that patient to help us now. Most of the surgeries of where Elstein anomaly follow pretty high functional classes and the remaining patients uh, the small the younger pa youngest patient was 11 years old this is uh, the fellow uh, for two uh, tricuspid valve repairs and this is uh, eight hours after the percutaneous implant there was no severe complications during the, the implantation of Innovare. None of the patients were, had surgery. And the complications that we had were uh, two patients with no pace, no pacemaker uh, was needed. We had a pseudoaneurysm in the right uh, jugular vein. And one patient had thrombus and it was a, a COVID positive patient. 
with, uh, with uh, anticoagulation. We are packaging these options for the replacement of the tricuspid valve or the primary implantation in native valves. This is in development with several possibilities, several good possibilities. Uh, we need to improve some of the aspects in anticoagulation and the French sizes on the to go on the venous side. We also have the clips, uh, the leaf, clip in the leaflet. This is an attractive option. We study with the Pascal system and the aniloplasty with cardioband, which was uh, an important option as well. And obviously, valve in valve is uh, right now one, another option that uh, has excellent results right now with the Sabian valve, the My valve, and uh, our Brazilian Innovare valve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, Raul. Thank you very much. We're going to proceed, and our next speaker again needs no introduction, Dr. Alejandro Perón from Cordoba, Argentina. He will talk to us about the pulse tabac. Alejandro. Thank you, Siad. Good morning. During the last um, uh, uh, period of time, we have had some difficult times with the COVID, but this is a great opportunity for all of you to be part of Solasi, and we thank you your time and your 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 uh, your uh, understanding in order to organize this meeting. Uh, in in the name of Jose Alonso, Jesus Damski, uh, Liliana Ferrin, that we we have tried to organize this uh, in the best way possible. In, during the next 12 minutes, uh, I will talk about the post the initial experience in Argentina. These are my conflicts of interest. Uh, we know that pulmonary incompetence uh, is inevitable after transannular patching. We know that the incidence is approximately 60 to 90 percent of patients. Uh, it conduces to a reduced exercise performance, progressive RV dilation, pr uh, uh, appearance of arrhythmias, as, uh, and, uh, um, and also can be associated with sudden cardiac death. So these are the typical right ventricular alpha tract anatomical feature that we can face with our patients. The right ventricular with rv 2 p conduits after surgery and also those patients with transalmer patch with dilated right ventricular alpha tract. And why we are very interested in this type of patient in this part of the world, uh, you know that uh, the use of uh, bulk conduit homograph and bioprothesis is very, very rare uh, 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 in Latin America with uh, approximately 10% uh, of the patient having that type of treatment. Most of them, most of the 90% of the patient, they receive a transoral patch uh, a repair as a surgical technique during the cardiac in intervention. So we, we, we have those kind of space and we are very interested in, 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 in bad that can treat this type of uh, patients. With, what are the lessons that we have learned during the last uh, few years? If you have a dysfunctional right ventricular outflow tract, we divide those in uh, conduits or bioprothesis and those patients that have transanular patch or native tract. If you have conduits or prothesis uh, and the, the measurements are between 16 and 22 millimeters, we have the melody bulb to implant those patients and between 21 and 28 millimeters, also 30 millimeters, we have two options, the sapin XT on S3 bulb, and also now that Carlos just talked about the my bulb uh, uh, um, uh, uh, procedure. And if you have the transannular patch or native trap and the, the alpha track measured between 18 and 32 millimeters, we have several uh, uh, options now. The Venus P bulb, as Pancho just talked uh, uh, about, the Harmony bulb, the Methanic PT bulb, and also the pulsa valve. I will focus in the pulsa valve that is a self-expandable uh, niche in support frame. As you see here, three leaflet per sign pericardial tissue. Uh, it can uh, you can accommodate the valve in a, a 18 to 20 French cartridge delivery system. The outer diameter goes uh, between 18, 18 to 32 millimeters, and the flare diameter between the 22 to 34 millimeters. The length is 38 millimeters, also comes available in 31 millimeters length, and the stem bulb diameter range from 18 to 32 in two millimeters increments. 
And you see here the total length is 38, the outer diameter goes between 18 to 32, the flare diameter between 22 and 36. So the flare diameter is four millimeters larger than the outer diameter. And the profile delivery cut is both. Um, between 18 frames, if you can, uh, if you uh, uh, insert a ball between 18 and 20 millimeters, and 20 French sheath if you uh, are implanting a ball uh, uh, 30 or 32 millimeters in diameter. How we select the bulb size? Uh, so we have an, uh, we we make an average, and we take measurements of the main pulmonary artery. We measure the proximal, the mid portion, the narrowest portion, and the distal bifurcation, and also the length. And we use several or multiple image modalities: the echo measurement, the CT, the MRI, and also the angio, the angiograms, and also we make an average and taking into consideration that we choose about this approximately one to two millimeters larger than the overall main pulmonary artery diameter. And so you can accommodate the bulb in the right ventricular outflow tract. In order to see if the patients are uh, suitable for this type of valve, we um, uh, focus in this classification of the five types of right ventricular outflow tract, and uh, we have some special re recommendations. If you have a type one uh, right ventricular outflow tract that is a, a pyramidal shape, we you have to be careful, and you have to implant the, the valve in the lip of the bifurcation side. So this type, this type Type one, you have to be careful. And if the narrow uh, portion is enough in the distal portion, you have to implant the valve there. The second type is the stripe shape. So in this case, it's straightforward, uh, is 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 uh, is suitable, uh, and is the the best uh, right ventricular artery tract to implant this type of valve. And you have just to implant the valve in the middle of the main pulmonary artery. So you see, like this graph uh, shows you that this is a suitable uh, right ventricular alpha tract to implant the valve. The type three, uh, that is a reverse uh, pyramidal shape that I will show a case uh, like this, is very challenging. There is a high risk of valve in Stability. The implant, uh, if you have a landing zone uh, 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 long enough, and uh, you may need pre stenting if there is a significant stenosis. So you have to be careful with the type three or the reverse uh, pyramidal shape. The type four, that is a convex shape, also is suitable for this type of valve. You have to implant in the pocket or at, or at the distal bifurcation side, according to the length of the main PA, as in, 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 in this case, but you have a narrow, a two narrowings in the distal and in the, in, the, in the proximal end, that is a convex shape, is suitable for this type of valve. And the last uh, type, that is the five type, the, the type five, is a concave shape. Also, it's challenging. Uh, you have to implant the, in the in the side of the narrow uh, 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 portion, but you may need in this type of patients also presenting in order to uh, to reach a very stable position of of uh, of uh, the valve. So, if you uh, take into consideration the the five different type of right ventricular outflow tract i think that is uh, uh, this is useful to go ahead and to move forward in order to implant this this one the post above implantation worldwide update this that uh, data was provided by Dr. Jibion Kim from Korea. They started in 2016. Uh, until 2019, they included uh, 25 patients. There was a feasibility study uh, with eight patients in, in, in Seoul and also the Korean multi-center study, five centers, 15 patients. After that, the commercial use in Korea was uh, launched and they just uh, 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 included 91 patients in seven different centers starting in 2019. After that, we, use, we started the compassionate use abroad uh, in, in November of 2019. 19 here in Cordoba. So, uh, so far they have included patients from Taiwan, Argentina, Turkey, and Vietnam. 
And also there is, uh, um, there is a C uh, study. The PI um, is Dr. Mario Carminati from Italy. They included six countries, uh, 11 centers since 2019. It has been slow due to the pandemic, but now is, 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 uh, is uh, uh, growing the number of patients. So far they have 35 patients in Italy, Spain, Turkey, and Germany, and also in South Korea. And the total number of patients that uh, receive the bag worldwide is 195 patients. In Argentina, we started in November of 2019 uh, uh, as the, um, the uh, special program that is called Compassionate Use. In Buenos Aires, Dr. Enestrosa, 11 patients. We have three patients in Córdoba, in Corriente with Dr. Ferrin, one patient, and also in Mendoza, one patient with Dr. Pablo Garcia. The mean age of the patient were 37.7 years from 13 to 69 uh, years old. And the diagnosis, most of the patients were tetragyrophallo, aortic stenosis or in, uh, insufficiency, status post ROS procedure in three patients, uh, pulmonary stenosis with commissurotomy, three patients, follow with AV canal, two patients, and also the right ventral ventral status post rastrelli in one patient. You know that the previous right ventricular orthodox drug intervention are in, interesting. Transanal patch, half of the patient uh, ate, but five patients had RV to PA conduit and uh, commissuratory uh, post pulmonary valve stenosis uh, in, in three patients. And the patient had CPS10 implanted in the right ventricular alpha tract, seven of them. So uh, almost half of the experience that we have in Argentina uh, is implanting the pulse valve uh, uh, in previously stented uh, uh, right ventricular alpha tract. One patient has branch PH10, one has uh, a permanent pacemaker, and one patient had received before an, IC, uh, an ICD uh, defibrillator. The diameters of the, of the pulse valve implanted was most of them 28 times 38 millimeters. The second most frequent was 30 times 38 millimeters. So just one patient had um, a 31 millimeter valve in length. So the mean follow-up time is just a short period of time, 9.1 months. Successful procedure was 15 uh, among 17 attempts. One patient had a very large right ventricular alpha tract and the procedure was aborted that one patient had a, a final position of the staining and uh, was unstable. So went for surgery and the valve was sutury fixed to the main pulmonary artery. And the follow-up echocardiogram, no PI, no PS in 15 patients. And one patient, the patient that went for surgery has mild to, mo to moderate PI during uh, uh, echocardiogram. Uh, we've, we have not had any case of infective endocarditis, no, mortality, and so far, no fractures were visualized. This is uh, our first patient. This is the MRI reconstruction. After that, you see the, the balloon sizing for balloon measurement, see the narrowest portion of the right ventricular alpha tract. After that, we, we just correlate with some coronary angiography to see the distance of the coronary arteries. This is our first patient, the right ventricular alpha tract um, uh, angiography, as you see, very large and dilated right ventricular alpha tract. After that, we advance the valve uh, over the right ventricular uh, after track, uh, there is no problem for, with that. After that, we start uh, implanting the valve uh, action in the knob, and you see the distal uh, flare is just uh, being delivered. And after that, you just action the slider, and you see how the valve is deploying the, in the right ventricular after track the, from the mid portion to the, the, last, um, the last portion. So you see there how the valve is in place in the right ventricular after track that no pulmonary incompetence after the um, uh, uh, full expansion of the valve uh, after the final position. After that, uh, this is the second case that we did in Cordova. There was a very challenging right ventricular after track. This patient had a pyramidal reverse shape. You see that there's some, some stenosis here and very dilated main pulmonary artery after that. So we de decided to pre-stent the right ventricular alpha trap with a CP stent, then fix. Uh, and you see how this is the, the, the position of the pre-stenting. And after that, you see the 
push the valve in the lever inside the stand and there was no problem with, with, with that. This is a check in the coronary artery after the valve was implanted over the pre stenting So uh, the procedure went well, went well and the patient recorded, uh, recovered very well. So as a conclusion, the tracheal pulmonary valve replacement is safe and effective uh, the valve restore early, sustained pulmonary valve competence with RV removing and improvement in clinical symptoms as, as, as we see uh, uh, with the data. The selection of patient and right ventricular outflow tract types are crucial for me to the outcomes uh, of the procedure. The Pulsa valve seems to be a user-friendly, safe, versatile, and also attractive device, but further studies are evolving to evaluate an increased number of patients in a more challenging anatomical scenario. Oh, for, all, uh, for all these people, thank you very much. And we will see uh, all together, uh, hopefully in peaks uh, in La Las Vegas. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Carlos. Ale. Very elegant presentation. And I'm gonna introduce Dr. Ahmed Chelebi from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, he's a professor of pediatrics and has a huge experience uh, with revalvularization in the pulmonary position with a wide variety of valves. So welcome to Latin America, Ahmed. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for your uh, kind uh, introducing. And before starting, I would like to thank organizing committee, especially Dr. Siat Jazi, Carlos, and uh, Alejandro, for their kind invitation in this Solasi and Pix Society joint session. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, what is the limit for adverse APM valve implantation in pulmonic position, of course. These are my disclosure. Uh, what is the limit? Uh, uh, let's go on. Uh, it transcatter pulmonary valve implantation in RVO. Ahmed, do you, sorry, Ahmed. Do, do you want to make it full screen, go to slide mode? Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it has been accepted and preferred uh, treatment of expandable valves in condis and bioprosthetic valves. Uh, but they have also been used and reported safely in native area to transanular patch if associated with somewhat stenosis in all and if it is large area without stenosis in selected patients. self expanded valves specifically designed for large native area are all under clinical trial ongoing without any uh, 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 without approval. But self expandable valves are longer and fillet parts at both ends, which means that uh, larger than the original valve size, so need a good RVOT and uh, uh, branch pulmonary morphology, which means that don't fit for all kinds of morphology. What we have for trascat pulmonary valve implantation, it has been, I think it has been uh, talked uh, enough. So, uh, I'm going to focus on the Sapien XT and S3 uh, and limits of these valves because they have, uh, before going on the limits, uh, I'm going to shortly uh, summarize the properties of the Sapien adverse valves. They are originally designed for TAVI, but they have been used successfully in the ROT approved for both ROT with condis and condis ROT with transanular patch for Sapien XT valve. It increased from single size to four size with a good variability from, from 20 to 29. Uh, it is a good uh, skeleton uh, and change to cobalt chromium alloy and left -left design change and refined delivery system. Uh, evaluated from retroflex to ultra uh, delivery system, which means that the, with an expandable E sheet, lowering the uh, profile and also uh, using in the small child is possible, especially in the uh, newest one. Uh, Ultra uh, S3 works through 14 French. These are the comparison table between the XT and S3. Uh, you may see the on the right bottom uh, 
The S3 valve has 32 mm expanded outer diameter at the skirt part of the 29 mm size, which gives us an opportunity to use it in larger ROT. Uh, as expanded height and length are relatively shorter when compared to those valves specifically designed for pulmonary position. In fact, it is also a, an advantage for uh, unfavorable anatomy, small landing zone ROTs. What are the limitations and challenges in TPVI? Age and small body size, it is not recommended generally less than uh, 8 years old and uh, less than 25 kilograms since relatively larger profile delivery systems. And the other uh, limitation factors, size and nature of the ROT, in two small conduits, two large or unfavorable morphology in native ROT, small branch pulmonary arteries, especially for self-expandable valves, and presence of a stand at the branch pulmonary arteries in TPVI with some uh, self-expandable valves. How to overcome the limitation in TPVI? Uh, for small body weight and vent sizes, using the valves with lower profile delivery systems, for example, Sapien works to 14 French issues, so it can be used uh, more than 4 years old, even uh, 15 kilogram patients. We have used in 18 kilogram as well. Bone and stent dilatation for relieving this of the stenosis to delay TPV up to reasonable age that uh, we prefer this kind of approach. And also, if it is necessary, hybrid approach is another option. What about small size of the condis? Covered stent implantation may be performed and overexpansion with high pressure balloons is possible. In this particular patient with a small condit in a small size child, 50 mm lap per condit uh, in a 5.5 year old, 18 kg stats post trunkus repair uh, was implanted a covered stent on 16 mm. Balloon and balloon, then 20 mm Sapien XTVR 14 French was used in this particular patient with a good result. What about the challenges in native ROT without stenosis? It, is. it has variable morphology with wide interpatient variability, no presence of stenosis for good anchoring the valve usually, large size with unpredictable pompiers. This is very important, mostly shows aneurysm dilatation at the proximal part, which means pyramidal shape and it is supposed as unfavorable for pulmonary valve implantation even in uh, self-expandable valves. The smallest part of the ROT may be very short at in anywhere of the ROT. So it is uh, human-made. How to overcome the limitations in TPY of large native ROT? In two large native ROT, using larger balloon expandable valves, Sapien XT up to 29 mm, or Meris My valve up to 32 mm, or two stage approach after presenting for reducing the inner diameter for balloon expandable valves, or ultra adaptive stents for reducing the ROT for implanting of 29 mm Sapien, or self expandable valves uh, which have up to 36 mm. What about unfavorable morphology? Sometimes, uh, uh, excuse me, I can't see the slide, yeah. Let me arrange my, yeah. Uh, parameter shape in short landing zone and landing zone just near the bifurcation Standing for providing a secure good landing zone is very useful. Using relatively shorter Sapien valves and married my valves is possible in this kind of patients in our practice. Presence of a stand at the branch pulmonary arteries, or if you have a small branch pulmonary arteries, filling the branch pulmonary arteries stand at proximal side or balloon dilatation of branch pulmonary arteries. Uh, may be necessary before valve implantation. These are the commonly seen pyramidal shapes in two different patients. Was uh, uh, valve, valve implantation was performed in both of them with 29 millimeter Sapien valves, but how? Uh, our institutional approach, uh, we do routine press before TPR. Why? Not 
Argot is generally not a good landing zone for PPVI, so no single valve covers all morphology and all sizes. So we need to change the RV. What about the advantage? Creates a secure landing zone and anchor the valve after deployment. Provides more accurate position during valve implantation uh, as a marker for avoiding paravalvular leakage. Increase the number of patients who benefit from PPVR. It is possible to cover all kinds of RV morphology and it is possible also a little bit larger RV size by two-stage approach. In patient selection in our institutional approach to do echo and MRI in all, MRI mainly for indication, echo minimum diameter of the RV in case selection usually, sometimes MRI and CT diameter for selecting the uh, candidates, not uh, decision for the valve size. If a minimum diameter uh, with considering the stretching of the RVOT and expandability of RVOT, uh, a cool or less than 26 uh, millimeter minimum diameter at the any uh, anywhere, we do cardiac catheterization and we do balloon sizing and interrogation in all presenting and then presenting with Andra stamp, open cell stamp, which is uh, very well for this kind of procedures and valve implantation. These are the, uh, this is the, our protocol. We observe the significant system blood pressure dropping when we use the 34 millimeter ASD sizing balloon uh, inflated. Uh, we observe the waste on the balloon. If there is waste on the balloon, equal or less than 29 or 28, you go press stenting and then valve implantation in the same and or second season. If there is no waste but blood pressure, systemic blood pressure decreases, we do balloon interrogation or balloon oblivion test. What size of the RBOT is too large? In this particular patient, there was no indentation on the 34 millimeter AGA sizing balloon, and we observe it after blood pressure. Uh, observe it. We take a scene and did measurement and uh, 33 by 32 millimeter uh, on fluoro. In this uh, situation, we do balloon interrogation test that uh, whether to see the 30 millimeter Tyshek balloon occlude completely or near occlusion has occurred uh, at the RVOT. And then, if it is, we go on press stenting with Andra XXL on 30 millimeter Zimat balloon. Um, uh, inflating up the burst pressure and then usually in the second stage we do uh, sapien wire uh, implantation with extra volume up to five millimeter x uh, up to uh, five milliliter extra volume uh, what about the answer answer one in, during the balloon interrogation with a 30 millimeter tie balloon up the burst pressure free contrast passage or free floating of the balloon in the RVOT, this is the limit in terms of size. What about very large aneurysmal main pulmonary artery distal mode stent? But uh, if it, it was valve, it may be uh, very dangerous. But uh, we've implanted the valve just uh, just our part of the uh, stent, and with a good result, you see the uh, no regurg, no problem. And this is a reverse problem shape. It is not problem uh, after uh, presenting. Then very very safe implantation. And what about the primary shape and landing zone? Minimum diameter just beneath the pulmonary artery bifurcation. This is very challenging case. Uh, we put a presentant just uh, beneath the uh, bifurcation and then dilated uh, in small pulmonary arteries on the right side, so we prepared left pulmonary artery after the uh, dilation of left pulmonary artery for secure implantation, and then we went on the uh, valve implantation uh, into the stem just before bifurcation without any jailing to the uh, branch pulmonary arteries. And again, a prominent and favorable shape of the RVOT associated with small pulmonary arteries in this uh, adolescent you will see the uh, smaller part just before bifurcation, little bit uh, crossing pulmonary arteries, very unfavorable morphology. Uh, if you put directly a, a valve 
I think it, 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 it would have been uh, regular to the RV, but it was, as you see, it was successful. Uh, presence of a stand at branch Kumar is not a limiting factor, but we do always filling at the proximal part of the stand, uh, especially if we will use the uh, ipsilateral side uh, pulmonary artery for guide insertion. Uh, in this patient, the guide wire uh, advanced on the wire at the ipsilateral side to the stand. It doesn't matter who, uh, whichever you prefer. So, uh, 17, near 18 percent of the sapien implanted uh, RVOT uh, had bright pulmonary stents in our uh, institutional experience. Our total experience with the near ovals uh, we have used, uh, which are commercially available, and uh, and also Costa uh, Valve as a uh, one side of C. approved study. And totally 257, total sapien valves number 147. We prefer sapien valves, especially in uh, native ROT without uh, pulmonary regurgitation. <coughs> With this approach, uh, excluding the uh, associated stenosis in native ROT, these are the only QPR. 173 patients with QPR retired pulmonary while replacement during the uh, last seven years, uh, 15 of them uh, was sent to surgery directly because of the uh, very large ROT. Uh, 158 underwent the balance sizing and interrogation. Uh, 14 was found to be unsuitable, so sent to surgery again. And 144 suitable over prestated successfully without uh, needing any surgery or any intervention and uh, and then in the same session or in the second session all was uh, implanted uh, um, uh, well 122 was sapien and uh, uh, 50 was wife now Amen. we're running late please try to finish your, your yes, 15 okay. and a half minutes so far i'm, yeah. I'm gonna i'm gonna go to conclusion slides yeah Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, In summary, we're, we're, conclusion: What is the limit for sapien valve implantation in terms of size of the patient, age, and body weight? Uh, I think it is uh, five year, uh, four years old, and fifteen kilo, less than uh, fifteen kilogram. In terms of small size prosthesis, constant implantation and with uh, over expansion, even eleven millimeter uh, conduits can be expanded up to twenty millimeter uh, that we have used melody in this patient. Presence of stents at branch pulmonary is not contraindication of problem in uh, sapien valve implantation. Since the short design of Edwards valve, small branch pulmonary don't cause any problem if bone dilation of the branch pulmonary is done just before the valve implantation, even landing on just beneath the bifurcation. Sapien valve implantation is possible in vast majority of large ROTs with transanular tract, irrespective of the morphology and shape of the ROT. But prestanting is necessary if you want to cover all kinds of morphology and shape of the ROT. The only limiting factor in our institution practice is the minimum diameter of the ROT and main pulmonary artery. However, stretch dynamic diameter is more important than static diameter since the unpredictable compliance of the large native ROT. So, balloon sizing and interrogation is mandatory and a most important part of the procedure. The stenting and valve implantation were all successful in all attempted after balloon sizing interrogation. So we have covered more than 8% of all patients with the PVR with this protocol. Thanks Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're running really short. We only have uh, barely 10 minutes for questions. So uh, I'm going to open, uh, please unshare your uh, screen. We're going to open the uh, floor for discussion and questions from our panelists. Any questions? on any of the talks. I have a question, Sia. Yeah. All right. Is it possible? Is it possible? Thank you. Uh, Carlos, uh, you mentioned the possibility of a pacemaker in a Epstein disease. If you need to replace uh, the tricuspid valve, what is your 
behavior with the leads during the dilation. If you can compress the leads and you can, uh, you can generate a fracture, is it possible? Good question. Same question Good for question. Raul. Raul. Raul and Carlos. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, bueno, en español, eh, lo que nosotros hacemos, hemos tenido dos casos y con el, el, con el grupo de marcapaso le hemos puesto el, el, la válvula y no ha habido problema. En cualquier caso, uno siempre que tiene que estar dispuesto a poner otro cable eh, posteriormente, porque es peor dejarlo sin válvula o con estenosis que con marcapaso. Pero es un trabajo híbrido entre el, la gente de marcapaso y la gente de hemodinamia. Siempre hay, le hemos puesto la válvula y, y no hemos tenido problemas. Carlos. Sí, estoy de acuerdo con, con Raúl porque eh, desde el punto de vista técnico para poner la válvula, eh, para estabilizarla, creo que no es necesario hacer el marca paseo. Si uno quiere, por ejemplo, en la válvula pulmonar, no puede meter otro catéter en el BD o, o mismo en el ventrículo izquierdo con, con una guía, por ejemplo, una safari, esto eh, puede ser hecho. Ahora, um, a veces mismo con el cable, el, el, el marcapaso sigue funcionando, eh, mismo que quede atrapado entre la válvula, donde pasa, hay, hay que trabajar junto, porque si algo pasa hay que encontrar una alternativa, pero estoy de acuerdo con Raúl. And another question is, if the patient has a gradient uh, in our flow track, uh, and you talk about the possibility to use the MyBubble, uh, you prefer, do you prefer the, the landing zone previously with the stent, or you can use directly the, the MyBubble? The my valve. Well, I'll pass this question on to Ahmed because he has so much more experience than me. I think pre-stenting uh, is a must, although we've uh, done uh, direct valve placement without pre-stenting. As you know, in Brazil, we don't have uh, stents that, that go all the way up to 30 millimeters. We have the CP8 Zig that goes maybe to 25, 26 at most. Same thing as the, the Palmas uh, 4014. So we are still waiting for the Andra XXL to arrive, but I think pre-stenting is the way to go. And Ahmed, do you have any comments on that? Uh, pre-stenting or not pre-stenting? Yeah. Of course, some uh, patients with a good RUT morphology, good landings of just middle of the main pulmonary artery and visible sizes. Uh, we can uh, we can uh, put a valve without pre-stenting as well. Uh, with uh, rough transfer pacing or not. Uh, but the, our approach, uh, pre-stenting is very safe in our institutional approach because it is a marker, it is not a valve, it is, uh, it is an anchor for the valve implantation, especially those patients with pure PR without stenosis. I think in those patients without stenosis and very large RVOT, presenting is very useful. Great. Any other question? Daniel? Yes, I have an, a question. Uh, ahead, great Daniel. talks to all. Uh, it was very interesting uh, this session. I want to ask especially to Alejandra Pancho, mm -hmm. yeah, in RVOTs with a severe or moderate stenosis, a pre-standing could be an option before implanting the valve. Uh, in, in the case, Daniel, th thank you very much for your question. Uh, in the case of Pusta valve, um, Herman uh, has started and, and, and we have uh, uh, going in that direction uh, to pre-stand the right ventricular alpha track that we think that are risky or are more difficult or challenging for, uh, for Pusta valve being uh, plantation due to is a straight straight bulb and has some 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 flare distally and uh, approximately there's no problem implanting that bulb uh, within the previously previously stent in the right ventricular tract we have not seen uh, leaks uh, 
uh, through the bar in the set seven patients that we have done. And uh, the performance of the bar, the function of the bar uh, has been very, uh, has been normal. So uh, I think that uh, with the post bar pre-stenting uh, is possible. And uh, there's no, I don't see in the, in the future problem with that. We need more follow-up time, but so far has been very well. Great. Any other question? Uh, just one Any short opinion? question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just excellent to, talk. To, Thank you very much. To complement yeah. the, the, the question of, of Daniel, um, okay. the experience with the Venus P valve, uh, I have to say that the valve has good in, enough uh, radial force to deal with a mild stenosis in the RBOT or MPA, and maybe to deal with a moderate stenosis with, if we pre dilate the RBOT with a high pressure balloon, by say. Uh, once if you implanted a stent in the RVT, maybe it's not necessary to have a, a flare or sand clock shape stent. So if you have an stent, any straight valve, sapien, my valve, yeah. whatever could work for that. Thank you. Uh, Jose, are you still there? Yes, yes. go ahead. Uh, I did. Una pregunta con las válvulas autoexpandibles, el riesgo de infolding a partir de qué diámetro, de qué sobredimensión eh, la ven y cómo se puede este, resolver esto eh, about uh, infolding and how to deal with it. Yep. To all the panel. Thank you very uh, much. Excellent talks. Francisco, okay. do you want to Yes, yeah, yeah. Jose, the, the infolding was reported in, in a report from Shaq uh, in two valves that were 36 millimeter in diameter, I think. And we, and we have one case that was a valve, uh, 32 millimeters valve. Uh, the reason is not clear, probably is related to oversized valve. Uh, it's very unusual. Uh, it's not difficult to diagnose the case we did, and I think I. I, I think that Ziad was with us when, yeah, when yeah. we have the unfolding. It's easy to diagnose because you see an unusual line in the, in the, in the fluoroscopy, yeah. and it's very easy to fix that with a regular balloon, angioplasty balloon. You can in, inflate that inside of the valve and the valve recover the shape. Yeah, yeah I agree with you, Francisco. I think it probably has to do with sizing. I don't think it has to do with the crimping or the deployment. I think it most likely uh, uh, these are oversized valves, probably for the area. But as Francisco said, very easy to diagnose and very easy to manage. Uh, Carlos Zabal, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Zin. A uh, question to Alejandro. Alejandro, uh, Pancho talked about in the uh, last three years, they prefer to use the shorter, uh, uh, the shorter valve because of the risk of expanding with, with the corda or the tricuspid valve. Do you see any concern with the bulk star as it is a 38 millimeter in level? Thank you, Carlos, for your question. Uh, we have an initial experience. And uh, so far, uh, uh, we think that uh, if the rivalry alpha tract is straight, uh, tight, Type, uh, type two, uh, we don't have problems to cover the rival outflow track. We have just implanted one 31 millimeters, and we tend to to implant longer uh, 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 valves. The um, the position is not a problem. You put a lander quiz, and the valve is tracking very very nicely. We have no problem with that, and we tend to implant and try to cover uh, all the main pulmonary artery to secure uh, uh, the, the uh, valve. I think that our preference now is the 38 millimeter that is the, is the longer valve uh, available. I don't see problems in the future with that, uh, but this is our initial experience, uh, Carlos. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just a comment on the length of the valve, Carlos. I think this is important for those of you who hopefully will start using the Venus P valve. I think a shorter valve will be easier to navigate through the alpha tract. And I think, you know, the straight part uh, is anywhere from 20 millimeter to uh, 30 millimeter. And then you have to add 
20 millimeter, 10 on each side. So even if you use the short 20 millimeter valve, that means it's 40 millimeter long. And obviously the larger the patient, the easier to navigate. So I think for, uh, you know, smaller patients, uh, I would, uh, you know, favor to use the shorter valves. It's much better. Okay, so, guys, yeah, we have this. Go ahead, yeah. Carlos. No, no, time is, we're running out yes, of time. We're that's done. what I'm saying. Yep, yeah, we're going to conclude this session by thanking exactly. the moderators, the panelists, as well as, of course, the excellent speakers uh, who gave us great, uh, you know, uh, presentations. And I hope to see you in the next session. Is the uh, link the same link, Alejandro? How yes. to see you at Pigs in Vegas as well, right, Ziad? Yes, we uh, would love to see you guys in uh, Las Vegas, uh, September 1st. We have also a fellows course. So if you have fellows that you would like to send to this meeting, we will cover their uh, hotel, their registration, everything. Is, if they're traveling from outside the US, of course, uh, travel expenses uh, will be the responsibility of the uh, country that they're coming from. But everything else in the US is our responsibility. So I hope to see you then uh, Great. in Las Vegas. Thank you so much. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor for me being here presenting such a distinguished session. I thank all of the speakers for the participation. This session is a talk with experts. How do I do it? A conversation with experts. The first speaker will be Dr. Siad Hijasi, talking about occlusion of coronary arteries. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jose. So um, first of all, thank you so much for Solasti leadership for inviting me to uh, be a part of this great meeting. And I hope that the next meeting next year, wherever it's going to be in Latin America, to be physical meeting. We are fed up from all these Zooms. This is my uh, uh, conflict of interest slide, none related to this talk. So uh, coronary artery fissures, we all know the definition of that, uh, communications between the coronary arteries and a cardiac chamber or a blood vessel. And just for those of you who are interested in congenital aortocardia communications or connections, we have just published a paper last week in pediatric cardiology that will uh, introduce a new classifications for these connections. The etiology, uh, most of them, of course, are congenital. However, there are rare cases acquired, the trauma, stab, you know, gunshot, or projectile injuries. The origin, uh, majority of them are from the right coronary artery in 55%, and then the remainder are usually from the left coronary artery system. Drainage site, majority are into the right ventricle, some into the right atrium, and some, of course, into the pulmonary artery. Sequelae of uh, these uh, fistulae, uh, ischemia and angina, this may lead to heart failure and cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, pulmonary hypertension if they're really huge, endocarditis have been reported, rhythm disturbance, thrombosis, and of course, rarely, but could happen, rupture of these fistulas. Management decision, and this is really important for all of us to understand the management decision because not every fistula needs to be uh, needs to be uh, closed. So if we talk about uh, this, let's uh, talk about uh, depending on the size of the fistula, presence of symptoms and complications, the age of the patient is important, the anatomy of the fistula, and of course, presence of other indications to undergo invasive procedures. Yep, so this, oh, sorry. This is uh, recommendations for coronary arteriovenous fistulas. Class one, if you have a continuous murmur in these patients, you have to do an MRI or CT and or uh, cardiac catheterization to delineate the exact anatomy. Also, if you have a large 
fistula, regardless of symptoms, this should be closed via either transcatheter or surgical route after delineation of its course and its potential uh, fully obliteration, uh, the uh, fistula itself. Third, small to moderate fistulas in the presence of documented myocardial ischemia, arrhythmia, or otherwise unexplained ventricular systole or diastolic dysfunction or enlargement or end arteritis, these should be also closed either surgically or uh, via uh, transcatheter. Class 2A, clinical follow-up with echocardiography every three to five years can be useful for patients with a small asymptomatic fistulas. Class 3, which means you should not do anything for these fistulas, if the patient with a small asymptomatic fistula, they should not undergo anything. So this is a table that we took from a paper that uh, was published by the group in Detroit in 2013, classifying the treatment options for uh, fistulas based on their uh, uh, drainage. Proximal fistulas, if they are medium to large, with or without symptoms, you should do intervention, be it surgery or, or catheter. And then after that, you need to put them on antiplatelet therapy for one year. If the fistula is small, no need for intervention, just observation and no need for anticoagulation. Distally draining fistulas, if they're small, same thing. If they are medium or large, then you need to do intervention. Plus, if they're medium, antiplatelets uh, for uh, a long time, indefinite. If they are large, you may need to do the same thing plus anticoagulation. For large, Symptomatic fistulas, you need to close them either surgically or transcatheter. And plus, of course, during the procedure, uh, heparin, and then you bridge them to uh, warfarin. Catheter intervention uh, goes back to the 80s. Uh, Reddy and his colleague reported on that. Mortality is low in this approach. Uh, we have used detachable balloons, gentle coils, Rashkin umbrellas, unplatzer, everything that known to us, we have used it in the preparation. Closure is applicable for more than 90% of the patients. Small residual leaks or recurrent fistulas is present in about 10% of the patients. Now let's talk about how we do it. So either retrograde approach, and the retrograde approach can uh, be either uh, via the, a catheter by itself or using what we call the coaxial approach. And we will discuss this shortly. And of course, the second approach, anterograde, after you establish arteriovenous loop, you snare the catheter from the vein, and then you introduce the sheath from the venous system and you go from there. Let's see now the retrograde approach. This is a four-year female Patient, 16.4 kilogram, asymptomatic, heart number at birth. You can see the fistula draining to the right ventricle. Repeat. So in this case, we used what we call the coaxial approach. So we put a Judkin lift. Then through that, we put a target catheter, 150 centimeter long. And then we did balloon occlusion and an angiogram to delineate the exact anatomy. And then after that, we started putting what we call target detachable uh, balloons. The first one was eight millimeter by 20 centimeter long. Second coil, the same length. There's the second coil. And then the third coil, it's coming up shortly. Third and fourth coils, they were also detachable, four millimeter by eight centimeter. These are electrically detachable coils. And then we kept putting coils in the same location until basically you include the entire that. So this is the fifth coil, six millimeter by 20 centimeter. You establish, there you go. And after this, you can see the uh, uh, angiogram resulted in complete occlusion of the fistula. This is 43-year female patient, short to breath. She had continuous murmur. Her echo showed RCA to RA fistula. So we took her to the cardiac cath lab for the closure. Frontal and lateral, you can see the uh, fistula coming from the proximal right coronary <coughs> artery. You measure the uh, fistula itself. And then we try to go retrograde by putting a device in that 
patient as you can see here we were able to put the device and then eventually we used a vascular plug we tried a muscular vsd device initially but this did not work well then we removed it and then we put a plug in this patient you can see here and then the final angiogram basically showing that complete closure of this fistula and see the lateral here And you can see closure of this fistula. So this patient did very well acutely in the cath lab. Then we took care for a follow-up. A few hours later, her EKG showed ST elevation, minimal symptoms of chest pain. So we had to bring her back to the cath lab because of the EKG changes. Look at the EKG here. This is just a few hours after with significant ST segment elevation. And this highlights the importance of where you recover your patient and who is taking care of their recovery. And we took her to the cath lab, showed complete occlusion of the right coronary artery. So we had to work on recanalizing this right coronary artery with IVUS and everything. And the bottom line, we recanalized the artery and we stented the artery. And this happened because of thrombus propagation. And as you can see, we were successful in uh, recanalizing the right coronary artery without any problem. And this patient now I have follow-up on here, over nine years of follow-up has done extremely well with no symptoms at all. And here EKG basically normalized. The anterior grade approach, again, as I mentioned initially, you have to establish an arteriovenous loop. So this is a case history of a two-week female neonate, severe heart failure. Her weight is 2.3 kilogram. So the right femoral artery was occluded because she was cast the, from the referring center. She had large LAD fistula to the right ventricle. We accessed the left femoral artery for a French sheath, the left femoral vein for a French sheath, and the right internal jugular vein, seven French sheath. So the uh, hair pressures were systemic. And her cupicus was in, you know, infinite because she had significant shunt. So we put devices. The first device was 12 millimeter amplatzer muscular VSD occluder and seven clipper coils, but she continued to have significant residual shunt. So we uh, took her to this cath lab the second time, uh, accessed the left femoral vein for a French, left femoral artery for a French, and right carotid artery cut down at French, and we put more devices and coils. So this is the uh, angiogram showing you significantly enlarged uh, fistula. We crossed, as I said, and then we established a loop from the uh, femoral artery and the IJ, and we put uh, the uh, amplastic muscular VSD device, 12 millimeter size, as I mentioned, and then uh, other coils. So let me just scroll here in the interest of time, there is the muscular VSD device. These are the coils. But as you can see, there's significant residual shunt. And then the second procedure, we put from the carotid artery a PDA device. And of course, we put a genterical Grifka vascular occlusion device. And then you can see here, uh, no residual shunt. And then there is excellent opacification of the other coronary arteries. This child now is, uh, she is over 15 years of age has done extremely well and followed by my colleagues in Tennessee, and they send me follow-up on hair regularly with excellent results. So the long-term outcome, the majority of these patients, they do very well. Some small percentage with residual leak, persistent dilatation of the coronary artery with late stenosis, arrhythmias, acute and late occlusion with or without myocardial infarction. So follow-up of these patients is lifelong, and you need to make sure that they are on aspirin for lifelong. So in conclusion, coronary artery fistulas are not uncommon. Knowledge of indications when to close is very important. Knowledge of the size, site of drainage and available devices is important. And working with adult cardiologists in, for adult patients and actually for small patients is extremely important. For adult patients, you need to know where to recover them. And I recover them in the adult side, in the CCU. Working with IR is also helpful for detachable coils. Anticoagulation use for large fistulas after closure is 
very important and lifelong follow-up is important. Thank you and see you in Las Vegas in a few weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Siyad. Uh, due to time constraints, we're going to continue with the talks and uh, questions are going to be done after the end of the session. We're going to have a small modification of the program. The, our next speaker will be Dr. Carlos Saval. We have uh, heard a lot about him. Uh, he's going to talk to us about the closure of uh, multiple atrial septal defects. Please, Carlos, take it away. Carlos, please uh, unmute yourself. Now you can hear me, right? Alejandro, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, virtual salasi. I'm going to talk about percutaneous closure of multiple atrial septal defects. <coughs> and I have no uh, conflicts of interest to declare for this uh, presentation. Which important data do you need to consider to uh, for this uh, kind of multiple atrial septal defects? First of all, the number, size, distance uh, between defects and topography. This is very important. Do we need to have an echo uh, and uh, trans uh, the TEE? -E. Uh, and uh, we need to consider the the possibility of an aneurysmatic septum. Uh, because they tend to have multiple perforations and we need to determine if we require one or more devices especially due to the distance between defects and the distance between the defects is under five millimeters it's possible that maybe we could close both defects with just one device and if the distance is more than five millimeters it's likely that we might have to uh, use two devices to occlude the, the defects. Uh, this, for this it's very important to uh, perform a balloon occlusion as a procedure and we can see that uh, with just one device it's important to, it's possible to uh, occlude them with just one balloon maybe or maybe we could need two balloons depending on the distance. And this is uh, an example of fenestrated, <coughs> fenestrated defects uh, here you can see here with the large size of a, an aneurysm. So we could use the, the cribriform devices or the PFOs. And uh, here you see the, the aneurysmatic mobility. We have one of them is larger uh, that you can see better with the colors. It has multiple perforations, basically in the entire septum. So, in this case, we use him by uh, using a foramen oval device, uh, which is larger than the left uh, side. And once we place the device, we only have a very small residual uh, perforation on the posterior side of the uh, the atrium. There's some controversy to determine whether if we put the small device first and the second big one, the large one later, uh, with the sandwich technique or not. But the, this group in London uh, did a, an, an interlocking technique in which one of the devices is uh, inside of the other, but in, uh, in an interlock way. Interlinked, uh, the, so the devices are uh, have a small, uh, smaller volume, and uh, possibly we could minimize the size of the devices that we use. This is one of the cases of one of our examples, doctor, done by Dr. Garcia Montes. You can see uh, placing the both defects 
you can see the placement of the device and then the placement of the second device here and uh, this device uh, we do not we do not have to uh, deploy it completely before we put the other one so they get interlocked after we release the and after we release the devices we're going to see that uh, perfectly well in the intercardiac echo you have the smaller defect the uh, larger defect here we place the the smaller device initially then we can see the larger device and one of the discs is uh, in, inside the other so not both discs inside the other but just one of the device and we can see here perfectly how we can see the interlock technique and uh, avoiding the bulkiness of the device and uh, within the publications that we've seen in the, on this topic one of the trials with a larger number of patients we get this group of uh, Dr. Carminati in Italy where they uh, have 165 patients uh, with multiple defects out of uh, 1280 consecutive patients treated with a success over 80% in this example we can see that, we play, that they placed uh, up to three devices in one of the cases another case that uh, report 148 patients with multiple defects is a group by Dr. Siebert in Germany where they have uh, a success rate close to 90% in this patient group a recent publication from the Xi'an University in China they mentioned that uh, for multiple steps and multiple defects especially if we have one in the sinus venosus uh, close to the inferior vena cava it's useful to create a preparation with the initial 3D model to see here we can check when we have the model one of the defects is close to one of the devices the inter uh, atrium device with the NV. and the other one is close with a uh, ductus arteriosus device and once this procedure is uh, done and uh, this model we perform it in the cath lab with uh, good results this could be potential advantage for these type of defects when we have the with the posterior uh, sinus they're very hard to to do so in our experience uh, with uh, 1453 patients with ASD uh, from March 99 to June 21 we have uh, 75 cases with multiple ASD and uh, 49 cases with double ASD and 26 with uh, multiple defects it's uh, especially with the large majority associated to uh, a septa, atrial septal uh, aneurysm uh, the, the, the age was uh, 15 plus minus 16.7 years 1 to 71 and then we have the uh, average diameter of the larger defects is uh, 15 plus minus 5.5 and 19 plus, uh, 6 point, uh, plus minus 6.8 expanded. Uh, we've seen a procedure of 60 minutes, uh, fluoroscopy 11.3 and 67 with the, the control that we've done with the intracardial echography, echo. So, and with the TEE also, uh, we've done some controls on the rest. And uh, results, the, implementation, the successful implantation was 74, 98.7%, 67, 67 of them, almost 90%, required one device, 8 patients, 10.7% uh, required two devices, and these were the devices that we used in these cases, 
the DSO, the in blood sugar was uh, 63 patients, was the majority. Complications of two patients, 2.7%. Uh, One of them had an embolization on the device, on the circumflex, that was required surgery. And the other one had uh, an AV block, uh, an intermittent complete AV block. In conclusion, uh, the cases can be approached in uh, different ways, this requires, depending on the anatomy and the situation. Of course, we will need experience and patience to perform a, a complete analysis and uh, a thoughtful analysis of a thorough analysis of the type of uh, lesion that we need to close. The image is imaging is crucial. We recommend the use of a TE or intracardial echo, ICE. So, and the real time TE, the 3D TE is great. We recommend that, and the success rate could be over 90%. So, thank you very much for your attention. Great, Carlos. It was excellent, and. We are going to leave the questions for the end of the session, as Jose mentioned. David Kani has had a bit of a problem and will join us during the last talk. We're going to continue with Juan Pablo Sandoval, who will also show us in the session on how do I do it, his experience and recommendations as regards the kissing stent implantation in pulmonary artery branches. Juan Pablo, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alejandro and Jose. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the kind invitation to participate in this Solasi event. And I was asked to talk briefly about how we do the kissing stent implantation in the branch pulmonary in the pulmonary arteries I have no disclosure for this presentation and treatment of the stenosis of pulmonary artery has to be performed in a clinical context and trying to determine which are the mechanisms to do this procedure in this patient we need to have objective measures of decreased flow to affected lung that may be reflected in mismatch or ventilation perfusion mismatch that can create dyspnea or exertion in these patients or signs of right ventricular hypertension that may limit the ability to increase CO with exercise and we su this is suggested when the pressure of the right ventricle exceeds two-thirds of the systemic. There are some groups of patients in which even small obstructive gradients require aggressive therapy with only one ventricle, trying to remember the context of how balloon angioplasty started in pulmonary arteries. We see the first, saw the first cases before where we tried dilating balloons of the, in the pulmonary branches and balloon angioplasty showed some acute effects and in the short term but in general terms in the middle term i'm sorry but it has been used consistent consistent yeah in a consistent in a constant manner their role is somewhat limited currently in small infants or with patients that cannot have a balloon that can be expanded up to a adult size or those patients who have a complex anatomy. As I said before, stent implantation is effective in different variants of narrow lesions or stenotic regions, uh, lesions of the artery, the pulmonary artery branches. We need to recognize the type of design of the stent we are going to be using. If it is closed cell or hybrid or open cell, each of them has some advantages, intrinsic advantages, and in general terms, when we do the treatment for these pulmonary arteries, these are stents that are different and we expand them with a balloon. This is a video I'm showing of a classic example of a one lesion of a stenosis in the proximal origin of the left branch 
where we have to do an evaluation, a hemodynamic evaluation of pressures, seep and geographic projections that we can have with caudal views and in lateral views, determine the size of the balloon to be the same or slightly bigger than the vessel and doing a control stent deployment to keep the position and avoid displacement and to avoid and to do a control and geography so that we can check first of all that we do not have any vascular lesions and then to assess the angiographical result and the new measurement of the pressure and bifurcating lesions are lesions that are found commonly in the PCI, renal or autoiliac, and they are regarded as, as the most challenging uh, lesions to treat and literature is continuing to be has continued to be saturated with studies to explore the best way to treat these lesions, whether attacking the main vessel or the next vessel and in different variants to try and have a better result and have the patency of the vessels in the constant content of implanting in stents in bifurcations. This article is very important because it shows the initial experience and the long-term results in the context of this pathology. It is important to recognize that it is very common after surgical procedures of complete repair of the tetralogy of phallus and similar. It is also worth mentioning that treatment with the stenting is very good for the relief of the initial gradient and reduces the pressure and the ventricle and we also need to recognize that due to the complexity and sometimes in the context within this the complication rate is no uh, minor so we should take that into account although patency may be kept the risk of restenosis is over than if we just treat isolated vessels this is important to point out and they may require further stent dilation in the future and sometimes the placement of these stents do not complicate subsequent surgery if necessary. This is the technique that is described and mostly used when we do kissing stent. We have two very long sheets that cross the two branches of the pulmonary artery and you do a deployment, a simultaneous deployment, such as the, the result in a double barrel that has to be open in the adjacent pulmonary branches. This is a video that shows an example of our patients where we see, where we do a stent implantation in a PA bifurcation. How we do that, as you can see, it's a ventricle that is very dilated. The patient, non-surgical patient with a severe stenosis of both branches, mainly the right one, as I said before, we need to have the angiography a selective one or a biplane if available because currently with rotational angiography or some other techniques we need to see this we need to have two long sheets that are separate to have stiff wire or extra stiff wires in each stenotic vessel we do injections manual injections to see the position of the stent and in general terms mount them on appropriately sized balloons and do and a simultaneous balloon inflation to have a proper expansion of the stents and trying to inflate them both at the same time that helps us to avoid puncture or rupture of a contralateral balloon with some of the struts. Uh, we repeat the angiography to see whether we need to further uh, expand the stent and we assess the integrity of the vessel. This is a very good result because we can place them in bifurcating lesions without interrupting or without connecting them one to the other and having a good hemodynamic and angiographic result. And finally, we need to recognize that there are some other variants and new ways in which we can try to treat these bifurcating lesions. I believe one of the most used one is this one that is called Y-shaped uh, stent complex we place a stent hybrid or open cell stent trying to place it directly on the branches jailing the other so that we can access through the struts of that first stent and place a second stent 
through that stent placed initially. This technique has also already described results of a group from the Netherlands. And we can see that these stents may be connected or sometimes not connected. And sometimes we need to see that if we can treat this lesion, does not exclude the fact that we may have to re-intervene in a number of occasions in the future. But we have very good outcomes in some uh, other patients. This is an example of how we worked in this with this technique, a patient with truncus arteriosus uh, repair, a RVPA conduit, and a proximal LPA stenosis. As I said before, we have new possibilities currently to do any, uh, an angiographic evaluation that is more precise. Initially, placing a stent, intra-stent, open, you see all the outflow tract directed to the right uh, branch. With your rotational angiography to see the stenosis that is clearly identified, this type of reconstruction allows us to identify what is the narrowest point before placing the material in this area and once we have the access through the struts to the other branch that is sometimes very difficult to do but we can do it it is important to do a sequential dilation of balloons of different sizes up to we have up to the moment we have a balloon of the correct size that we define as the appropriate one for that lesion and we can do the implantation of that stent as you can see in this example these are connected this is a Y shape that allows us to have very good results from an angiographic point of view and a hemodynamic point of view this is the example described in the technique the Y shape technique it is also very important to mention something in these patients in early post-op, it is not infrequent that they have a bad evolution, a ventilatory uh, data that are very complex, and in some patients, interventions have to do very quick, and we need to do a bailout technique. These types of interventions with that plasty areas with uh, very uh, flexible lesions, we may have severe complications, such as in this case. You can see a rupture of the um, uh, LAP rupture. This is the complication we may have, especially when they are done, especially in the post-op. As a conclusion, we have to remember that bifurcating lesions represent a challenge and they are technically demanding interventions. Adequate planning and Accurate intra-procedural imaging are paramount. So is having the right equipment, guide wires, long sheets, and stents, and also understanding how we need to choose our stent depending on the performance we need and that the techniques that are used, the conventional with kissing balloon or different ones such as the Y stenting require coordination between or among operators with experience because these are procedures that are simplified if two or more operators work. And we always have to be aware that of the lesions that and complications we may have in the with the procedure. First, um, mainly during post-op, I'm open to questions and to the debate and a great hug from Mexico. Thank you very much, Dr. Sandoval and everyone for respecting the time that is available. La siguiente charla la dará el Dr. Welcome from Fan. Gracias por compartir su experiencia con nosotros y bienvenido a Solasi. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jose. And uh, first of all, um, I would like to thank the Solasi um, having me um, this year virtually. Um, you know, I miss uh, I miss um, uh, Latin America. So hope I can be there. Um, you know, next year or um, um, anytime. 
uh, if it's possible. So, um, so my um, talk, um, can, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Can you hear me, sir? Okay, yes. right. Yeah, so uh, my talk uh, will discuss understand placement in doctor satirosis and probably dependent circulation and technical modification. So I have no financial disclosure related to this talk. Um, so when, when uh, talking about technical modifications, I would like to say that I will address in three kind of things. Uh, the first thing is about to be uh, dealing with the closing duct. And second will be uh, about the tortuous ductus. Um, and also the third one will be the pulmonary coarcation. Um, so before I start, I would like to maybe share with you uh, the instrument and my workhorses um, that um, usually I usually do. Uh, starting from the catheter, and as you can see here, um, the JR catheter for French uh, would be um, the, my um, usable um, catheter to uh, guide uh, the guide wire for me. And then um, using guiding catheter, uh, pigtail sometimes you have to cut uh, in order to make sure that we have, I have a good angulation um, to deal with the very acute uh, or um, a bending of the uh, um, uh, ductus. Uh, and also sometimes I need a micro catheter. Um, for the choreic guide wires, um, uh, most of the time, whisper, uh, I mean, hydrophilic wire uh, is very useful. Uh, but sometimes you need to deal with the very uh, um, stenosis or, I mean, like closing or atritic um, ductus, uh, um, you may need to use a CTO wire. Um, choreic stent, definitely, um, whatever is available, I think it's very useful. Um, previously, I, I use only the best stand, but at, at nowadays uh, we don't have it anymore in my cat lab uh, for the just bare metal stand. So uh, we use orthodox losing stand. Uh, I don't have time for that, but um, you know it works very well. Um, at least uh, in uh, more than six or eight months, at yeah, longevity was good. So uh, for balloons, um, most of the time I, would, I don't use it for um, dilation, but I just use for interrogation. I'll show you later on. Um, yeah, start with the um, a closing ductus, as you can see here, it's very uh, severe um, um, stenosis, especially at the pulmonary end. Um, so with that, uh, you need a gentle touch. Gentle mean that uh, you need uh, a little uh, spinning, pushing, and sometimes maybe pulling back of the, uh, the guide wire, uh, especially the choric guide wire, hydrophilic one. And after you can um, get over um, that kind of you nose, and then you can uh, put the stent in. Uh, with this, as you can see, uh, initially you may um, uh, um, interrogate this, uh, and you probably thought that it would be okay, but eventually you need a second stent just to make sure that the, all, the whole length of ductus can be completely uh, um, um, stented. Uh, this one also a challenging one, as you can appreciate that um, we come from the x ray artery. Uh, because this is ductus, it's vertical uh, alignment. Um, so uh, with that, there's very limited flow here, as you can see, just a little dimple here. Uh, but we're lucky uh, that time, just um, having the quarry guide wire, uh, just drilling uh, gently, and then we can manage to cross it. And after that, um, the whole thing would be uh, quite um, straightforward because uh, you know exactly that it's... Uh, uh, it's there and then uh, well this patient actually we did CT uh, previously so that's why we know exactly that the ductus is not that long. Uh, so eventually uh, we managed to put a high pressure balloon here uh, in order to um, um, you know make the ductus getting bigger but as you can see here sometimes you're not um, lucky enough to completely uh, abolish the waste especially if the duct is closing for a long time. So um, so how about the tortuous duct? So as you can see here, uh, from the still picture, it's very tortuous and also there's some constriction here at the primary end and also the proximal LPA and partly of the RPA. Uh, so um, you know exactly if you deal with this, um, you, have to, you have more risk of having procedural failure, uh, primary artery gelling or unintended reintervention. So be careful on that. A challenge to be starting from crossing uh, length interrogation, gelling peer branches, send migration, embolization, or even change of the ductal configuration after removing the guide wire. I'll show you later on. But just to share with you that when you deal with this kind of thing, you need at least um, different viewpoints. Uh, it means that you cannot just rely on one plane, but you need other plane to 
figure it out or to confirm with that. Uh, you can see the echo is not very clear. It's just uh, showing you that this is vertical ductus, uh, but you can't appreciate this kind of angulation curves um, with the, the, the 2D echo. Uh, so you really need the uh, angio, I mean 3D, uh, I mean CT angio, in order to uh, uh, delineate how uh, the ductal tortuosity uh, is and then how you're going to deal with this in terms of the approach, the angulation, and also uh, which size of the uh, um, pulmonary artery that you should deal with. Um, then um, you can see that even if you have the Y here, but it's not uh, very easy for you to just, um, you know, dealing with this because it's very curved and also um, it tortuous here. Um, so eventually uh, we need another supporting Y on the other side, as you can see here, make it run faster that you need to cross it. And even crossing is sometimes very challenging. Um, but again, uh, I was lucky enough that day, uh, I crossed that and then I can uh, decide whether which side of the, of the, of the PDA, I mean, of the, of the pulmonary artery that I should deal with. And as you can see here, um, uh, sometimes when you deal with the very tortuous ductus, you need to in interrogate it. And my practical way to do interrogation of the length of the ductus is just to use the, um, the Cori a balloon, which I know exactly the length here. And then I can just um, decide whether, which, where that I put a stent in. Like this particular case, I would like to put the stent from here up to there. Uh, sorry, this is a bit deep. So I probably need to come back here and then go up to around here. So uh, with that, I know exactly the length. And then after that, uh, I just um, decide to put the stent as um, you can see here that uh, uh, initially, even if I do interrogation, uh, but I, I really need a second stand in order to, in order to uh, completely abolish uh, the uh, uh, risk of the um, ductal constriction, especially at the aortic end, even if it's uh, less. And this is uh, the final result here. Sorry um, that I did not show you in very clear imaging because uh, this is a newborn baby. So most of the time you need uh, to spare the contrast media as less as possible. Right, um, so how about this one? You can see here, it's quite tortuous and also you have another issue of the small left pulmonary artery here. So with that, uh, again, uh, you need um, to cross it. And you know, crossing is very challenging as you can see here, even if you use the whisper core guide wire, which is very uh, flexible and very uh, hydrophilic, but again, uh, it's very much of the curves here. Um, so with that, um, after you can, um, you know, get into the right pulmonary artery, uh, it's not strong enough for you to put a stent in. So that's why you need uh, to uh, exchange it. And initially, you need to support it with the body Y, and then you exchange it with the microcatheter and use the stiffer Y, which is Iron Man, uh, you know, to get into that position. And then after that, you put a stent in. As you can see here, now you implant the stent. And then um, when everything is all right, this is pre and post procedure. You can see immediate after you implant the stand, the left pulmonary artery because it's under fill. So it's getting bigger immediately after the stand is completely uh, expand. Um, so again, just to share with you, this is quite important thing also. Uh, when you deal with the, the, the dodgers or vertical doctor, sometimes you put the stand in uh, you know, the balloon stent and the Y it looks very okay. But after you remove the balloon and then the stent is changing the position, you shape here. And then after you completely remove everything, you can see there, it's like that. So um, sometimes you can predict, but sometimes you cannot. And in this particular case, six months later, because of uh, the proximal part is not uh, completely uh, um, uh, stented. So uh, we need to come back with another stent, um, you know, in order to make sure that the flow is getting to the pulmonary circulation very nicely. This is pulmonary tricia patient, uh, VSD. Uh, and also this one, very challenging. Uh, you can see that there's a pulmonary coarctation on both sides, on the left and on the right side. Uh, so this particular case, uh, we decide to go to the right side. And as usual, we go uh, with the balloon interrogation first to make sure that how long of the stent that we need. And then to put a stent in, and after we put a stent in, you can see that um, the, there's a kink of, of the pulmonary artery there. 
And because this is open source, then uh, sometimes uh, you may lucky enough uh, to have the flow immediately to get there. But this particular case, uh, we decide to, uh, you know, went into the, to go into another side, which is the left formula artery using the, another Y. And then we uh, dilate the side branch here, as you can see here with the uh, balloon, uh, 2.5 millimeter. And then um, uh, with hope that this uh, proximal part of the LPA can be dilated too and hope that it may grow. Uh, but sometimes you're not lucky. In this particular case, definitely, um, you know, uh, immediate was fine. But eventually this patient required the uh, left bump, uh, BT shunt uh, in the next um, three to four months because the LPA didn't grow. So again, this is, again, just to share with you, this is palliative procedure and you may require repeated peer rehabilitation later on. Um, so which duct should not be stented? I would say that if you got a retortuous duct, uh, more than two bends, I will not try to do it. Uh, if the lock duct is larger than four millimeter without constriction, I won't do it. Um, if the proximal, um, if the vascular excess diameter size is less than four French cheese, uh, I also will not do it. Pulmonary coarctation depends. I, I share some of you, uh, some of the cases, uh, but again, this is controversial. You need to be very careful when you have to deal with this. Make sure you talk to the surgeon well and make sure that you understand well with the anatomy before you go into this. So uh, in conclusion, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that duct sensing is a life-saving procedure, yet it's a high-risk palliation. Uh, so you need a teamwork, definitely. You need a robust technical skill, and also you need a proper instrument for different duct anatomy. Uh, make sure that you have meticulous decision-making and also steps. And last but not least, um, tortuous duct and pulmonary coarctation are always challenging to deal with, so be careful with that. Thank you. Thank you, Warwick, and thank you very much. Great, great talk, great experience. We thank will you, leave, Yeah, we will leave the question at, 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 at the end. Unfortunately, sure. Dr. Damien Kenny is uh, is uh, uh, connected. Uh, he had had some problem, as we mentioned, but now he's with us. Uh, welcome, uh, Damien. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, that you uh, are uh, in this uh, peaks uh, in this. So last uh, meeting, and we really uh, thank you for your uh, presence here. Please, um, you will talk about how to prepare the right ventricular outflow tract uh, in order to implant a pulmonary valve. So uh, you have a, a, a 15 minutes time. Uh, we are waiting for your talk. Thank you very much, Damien. Thanks, Alejandro, and greetings to everybody. I'm so sorry I'm a little bit late coming on. Um, unavoidable, I'm sure you'll all sympathize. Um, I hope everybody's keeping well around the world in these crazy times and congratulations on the meeting at uh, Great Talk Warkin. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, hopefully you guys will be able to see um, things. Um, and I was tasked with talking about ORV to PA uh, conduit preparation for pulmonary valve implantation. And again, I'm very, very grateful for the kind invitation, uh, for a very prestigious meeting and a very, very uh, prestigious group. So I think when we look at, um, at pulmonary valve implantation, it's really a success story. When you think back from the first implant on September 12, 2000 by Philippe Bonhoeffer and a little 12-year-old boy with a stenosed or VTPA conduit, all the way to current day where we've implanted over 20,000 valves. We have FDA approval and CE marking for two balloon expandable systems, FDA approval for one self-expanding system, and we hope to have... Uh, you know, further international approval for a number of different valve systems uh, over the coming years. And really, we're starting to compete with surgery uh, to the same extent that in some stage, maybe pulmonary valve replacement really will be, or surgical pulmonary valve replacement won't be very commonplace. And when we look at surgery and the, and the impact of transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement, particularly into dysfunctional or VTPA conduits, I would have thought the outcomes, it's fair to say, are somewhat comparable to surgery now in the very least. Um, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve uh, is from the 2015 paper looking at the seven-year uh, follow-up data from the IDE trial uh, in the US. And we can see the freedom from reintervention at five years is a, just about 75%.
On the right hand side of the screen, you can see Jim Tweddle's uh, old paper, which was again looking at a parable group of patients who'd had an RV to PA conduit uh, and followed them up for a number of years. And again, the freedom from reintervention or from conduit failure was about 75%. So I think in a short space of time, we've really been able to you know, exert um, or demonstrate um, outcomes that are somewhat comparable uh, to surgery, uh, of course, with a lot less morbidity. And when we talk about how we, we've learned a lot over those 20 years, how we should prepare a conduit, uh, really what we want to achieve is to minimize stent fracture. Uh, and we learned that early on, try and avoid coronary or aortic compression uh, to try and minimize the residual or VOT gradient, because I think that probably has an impact both with reintervention rates and with risk of endocarditis with some of the valve systems and also minimize the risk of conduit rupture while we're implanting. And really what we're trying to provide is an optimal environment for the stent valve to work. Now, when we talk about stent fracture, I, I suppose this was identified fairly early on in the Great Ormond Street experience with the valve that uh, when they were placing the valve in these very you know, aggressive uh, and uh, suboptimal uh, environments uh, that were heavily stenosed that the valve fractured. Uh, and you know, what they did was they looked at risk factors for why that would happen and also tried to classify the stent fractures that, were, uh, that happened. And they classified them in three different ways. This was type one stent fracture, whereby there was no loss of stent integrity. Type two, where there was loss of integrity, restenosis, uh, but no distal embolization. And, and, and type three then when you, were, when you basically had fragmentation or embolization of the stent. And they looked at uh, risk factors for that implantation into a native right ventricular outflow tract, calcification, if there was no calcification along the right ventricular outflow tract, um, and then uh, whether there was recoil of the, uh, the pulmonary valve, the percutaneous pulmonary valve when it was put in. So they were some of the early evaluations of what stent fractures were and uh, you know, potentially why they occurred. Again, there was a number of different studies, but follow on data then from the group in the US uh, who looked at the benefits potentially pre-stenting and again, looked at what were the risk factors uh, for stent um, fracture in this group of patients. And again, they found that if you had a stent that was opposed to the anterior chest wall, uh, or if there was compression of the uh, transcatheter pulmonary valve, again, you were more likely to have early valve failure uh, due to stent fracture. Uh, and again, you can see what happens here and it can be treated. And again, as I mentioned, there have been a number of papers now that have since come out advocating for the benefit of pre-stenting in this uh, environment uh, to try and again, increase longevity of the stent valve. So really what we're about, we have to provide adequate stent or adequate conduit preparation. Here's a, a seven or eight year old boy who had a, a calcified or VTPA conduit. You can see it there clearly he's had a stent already placed in his LPA. Uh, and you can see we've placed one uh, covered stent, uh, CP covered stent initially, because uh, we were a little bit worried. Uh, we had assessed the coronaries and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but really we haven't opened this up adequately to a level that we would like. So what we did was we kept on stenting until we'd actually achieved that. And what we can see on the left-hand side of the screen is by placing another covered CP stent and then a bare metal stent inside it and with a high pressure non-compliant balloon. And when you actually inflate that Atlas balloon and deflate it, you can see there's very little recoil of that stent complex after you've done that. So suggesting that you've got an adequate conduit preparation uh, for your stent valve once you put the melody in then on the right-hand side. But there's still a number of unanswered questions about this. How small is too small for us to be placing these stent valves into? How, what approach should we take when we're doing the procedure? Because we need to make sure the coronaries are okay, but we don't want to you know, rupture these heavily calcified conduits. What types of stent we should put in and how many should we put in? And what is an adequate size, valve size and gradient, again, for growing populations? And so, and again, we have a number of different valve systems that we have available to us now for these uh, calcified conduits. In the smaller conduits group, I mean, there's been some data come out now suggesting that really we can replace pulmonary valves with very small conduits. Uh, I suppose it's up to each individual to decide if that's the right thing to do over the course of a patient's life. Um, this is again from the North American uh, study whereby they looked at conduits down to 12 millimeters. Uh, and you can see in the right hand side of the left hand side of the screen uh, with stenting and then subsequently with valve implantation, how the conduit uh, gradient uh, is able to be diminished from I mean, a 50 down to, I don't know, 10, maybe less than 10. And how you can see on the right-hand side of the screen that the original conduit diameters are somewhere around about 12 have been able to push it up to, to maybe uh, 18 to 20, uh, again, with pre-stenting of balloons. So we can push these conduits out. 
But and this again shows some difference between the ability um, of freedom from reintervention, whether it's a homograph or a contegra, uh, when you're stretching these conduits out, both are uh, amenable to it, but uh, maybe a slightly better freedom from reintervention in a homograft. But it potentially does come at a little bit of a risk. Uh, this was a, a study from uh, 14 patients um, from a French experience, whereby they had a 50% conduit um, uh, disruption uh, you know, incidents um, by implanting in, in smaller conduits and uh, needing to have covered stents put in somewhat emergently to try and deal with this. So I think it's important that when we start pushing these conduits out that we realize that it, the risk of conduit um, uh, disruption goes up somewhat. So when we look at the approach, we need to be somewhat patient specific about it. What's the patient size? What's the conduit size? Is there a good indication? Do we and have we looked at the coronary artery uh, uh, anomalies? And what is there a degree of how much conduit calcification is there? And then the morphology of the conduit stenosis is it proximal, distal? Is it is it throughout the whole conduit? Uh, is there any conduit dilatation? And what do the branch pulmonary arteries look like? These are all important bits of information. And again, it's a little bit of a, a trade off between suspicion and query about coronary artery abnormalities and degree of, cal of conduit calcification because as we start to assess the conduit with balloon dilatation, we need to be cognizant that we could disrupt the conduit at the same time. So this isn't a data-driven technique, but this is something we have evolved uh, to. We tend to pre-assess the coronaries to make sure there's no coronary existing uh, coronary artery abnormality, and we try and risk stratify based on some data that I'll show you. Um, again, we start with a somewhat compliant balloon to kind of provide a broad anatomical overview and then do an aortic root angiogram. And if we're concerned, then we move to selective angiography. And then we tend to start off with a balloon to calcified conduit ratio of about 1.2 to 1, a sort of somewhat non-compliant balloon uh, and use and increase by serial uh, two millimeter increments with serial or VOT angiography after each balloon dilatation or balloon assessment to make sure we haven't caused any conduit disruption. And then, you know, the final balloon size should be close to proposed stent diameter. And we may move to selective angiography. In some cases, if we have a lot of, of calcification, we may decide to put, and we think the coronary is okay, we may decide to place a covered stent initially and then use the non-compliant balloon to stretch that covered stent up uh, rather than uh, just go bare and, uh, and try and run the risk of cracking the, the conduit itself. Now, it's extraordinarily important to assess the coronaries. I think we all know this. Again, there's some good data come out from the uh, group in, in, in the US, from the US trial. This is over 350 patients, I think, uh, that they looked at published back in 2013, uh, 340, uh, 404 patients, 343, uh, you see on the right side of the screen that we're able to implant into. Uh, just some things to point out. The degree or rate of coronary artery compression is about 5%. Um, interestingly, coronary compression testing was only performed in 41%. I hope in a contemporary series, we wouldn't see that. I think this should be done in everybody. I think that's important. The sites of compression have been identified. So LAD seems to be the most common. I think it's important again to assess preoperatively or pre because sometimes there will be coronary stenosis before you actually do anything, uh, potentially in ROS patients, et cetera, who've had transfer of buttons. Uh, who's at increased risk? Um, if you have a normal coronary artery anatomy to start with, you're significantly increased risk. Um, if you have a transposition um, diagnosis, you're increased risk. Uh, and again, if you have normal coronary artery anatomy, it's 71% versus 14% and a very significant p-value there uh, to start with. Majority with the LAD arising from the right sinus. Uh, the course tends to run underneath the OVUT conduit and therefore you need to consider your projections when you're doing your balloon assessment uh, to make sure and sometimes down the barrel view, which I'll show you is, uh, is quite useful. But it's not just about the coronaries. Here's an interesting case. This was a 21-year-old guy who'd had aortic stenosis, had a ROS after a balloon aortic valvuloplasty, had a heavily calcified conduit with a mean gradient, I think, of around about 40 on echo correspondent. Uh, on the cath, we decided to go ahead. We actually self-fashioned a covered stent. Uh, this was when I was in the US. Um, and we placed that in. Uh, you can see that we get a reasonable result of that. And then we go with a second stent uh, because of the fact that uh, the first stent hadn't knocked it out. And, you know, we'd no gradient here. And certainly on the lateral, it looked a little bit uh, um, better uh, for the stent valve. Um, maybe now we would have tried to, on that AP view, knock it out a little bit more. Um, here's the uh, the final. Here's the Edwards valve going in. We put in a 26 Sapien. Um with a good result. Uh, there's the sapien in place, just some wire induced pulmonary incompetence. And then, as I mentioned, this is this down the barrel view here, if it'll play um, on the right hand side of the screen there, that shows that the coronaries are actually okay, that we've not uh, 
compress the coronaries at all. But this guy came back to see me at six weeks or eight weeks post procedure. He had a mean gradient or peak gradient of 21 across his valve. He was fine, but he had a no pulmonary regurgitation, but a continuous murmur. So we were a bit perplexed about what happened. We did a CTA orthogram. We found that there was a, a aortopulmonary fistula at the distal end, at the proximal end of the right pulmonary artery, distal end of the conduit uh, from the aorta into the PA. Uh, so we went back to the cath lab and actually we saw it then when we performed an angiogram, which I think we hadn't identified the first time around. And we went and uh, occluded that off with an eight millimeter AVP uh, four with no further flow in it. So I think we need to be cognizant of not only the coronaries, but also the aorta. And that's why paying attention to your uh, exit angiogram is really important because I've actually seen one more of these since this time. Conduit disruption. I mean, we've talked about coronaries, but what about conduit disruption? Again, this is a nice study from Eunice and the group in France, uh, 99 patients. Overall incidence is around about 10%. Again, heavily calcified and stenosed conduits uh, more susceptible. Mark Avelli gives a very nice talk about the importance of having covered stents available for this and particularly long covered stents because sometimes you may get conduit disruption or conduit um, dissection at the distal end of the conduit. And I'll show you a nice example of that coming up now. Uh, and important to have long uh, covered stents, uh, CP covered stents for that, because uh, sometimes uh, you only have a limited amount of time if you're bleeding into the thorax or the hemithorax. So this was, and I'm very grateful to Ahmed Chalibi for uh, loaning me this. This was a nice case that Ahmed did recently. You can see on the left-hand side of the screen, this was a heavily calcified conduit. Well, it was a, a, a stenose conduit, um, whereby he'd placed a CP stent in and when he performed an angiogram, you can see that there's a distal aneurysm of the conduit there. And so the question was, would you now fail the surgery or would you consider trying to treat this? But what Ahmed did was he uh, put in a flower blossom stent, a covered stent on two balloons over two wires in the respective branch pulmonary arteries and got a very nice seal on it afterwards, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen there, with no uh, residual flow into the uh, into the um, into the aneurysm. And then he went ahead and put a pulse to valve in. Uh, with uh, good pulmonary competence or good pulmonary competence, I should say, and no further leak into the uh, into the aneurysm following or into the um, disruption after that had occurred. Um, what about smaller patients? Well, we can do smaller patients. Uh, again, I think it's really important to decide when you're doing these, what is the best in the rest of the patient? I mean, if you look at somebody that has a 14 millimeter conduit in um, or even a 12 millimeter conduit who's eight or nine years of age, uh, you'd have to ask yourself, if you're not able to get that up to at least 20 millimeters or 18 to 20 millimeters, would it be in the child's best interest to go and have a further operation and have a bigger conduit come in and then come back and do surgery at that stage? Because, you know, we know there are risk factors for reintervention with this group. And I'll show that to you just uh, as I come to the end of the talk now. But this was a patient who'd had uh, sort of a variant of Schoen's. I'd had a very, very, very difficult post-operative course at a hybrid initially. You could see the branch pulmonary arteries are still not perfect. And then ended up having mechanical mitral valve, which clotted off and was on ECMO, et cetera. Uh, but he did very well and has done very well since. And his RVDPA conduit became stenosed, uh, a little bit symptomatic with that. Uh, he was about nine or 10 kilograms at the time. So you can see we've gone sub xiphoid per ventricular. Uh, again, his anticoagulation was a bit of an issue. The surgeons didn't want to go back at this. Uh, so because of the area of narrowing, we decided again to flower blossom the stent, the pre-stent. Um, you can see that going up there with the, or when it's dilated on the right hand side of the screen. And then we felt that based on the lateral, we probably needed a second stent here. So again, we're trying to provide adequate uh, conduit preparation. And we managed to get this up to a reasonable size despite his overall size. And again, the final result was quite nice there on the right hand side of the screen. The branch pulmonary arteries, still some mild narrowing, but not much gradient across them. So we left them alone. I think there is an association. This is some nice work from Amy Armstrong, again, from the um, multi-center melody valve trials that have carried out, I think, over 300 patients. There is an association between patient age and implant and outcome after transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement. You can see here from the Kaplan-Meier that if you're less than 12 years of age, your freedom for survival at five years is significantly less than old, older patients. So again, when we're looking at younger patients, I do think we need to have a good indication to do it. I think we should strongly consider surgery uh, just because we can do it, it doesn't mean that we always need to um, because it will provide a better substrate for patients. And the whole argument for doing this is that we try and limit the amount of sternotomies the patient has lifelong. Uh, again, there are some data to suggest that uh, if you have a younger patient, uh, I, again, less than 12 years of age or a gradient over 15 millimeters of mercury at the end of the case, that you are more susceptible to endocarditis, particularly with the melody valve. And again, I'd sort of 
urge people to think carefully about doing this in smaller patients unless there's a good indication and unless you can get a good size valve in with a low gradient at the end of the case because I think we're just setting ourselves up to fail somewhat. So is it too soon to celebrate with transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement in this group of patients? Um, nice study again from the CCRC or the, and the C3PO uh, registry uh, from 2014 to 2016. And um, this was 530 patients, a 26% risk of adverse event, 13% risk of serious adverse event, you know, not insignificant rate of mortality, almost 1%. And um, the SAE was highest in the homograph conduit or VOT substrate. So again, need to be cognizant of that. Radiation exposure is also higher. So we take on these cases. I think it has been a success story for sure, but I do think we need to be cognizant of that there are complications and patient selection is very important if we're gonna put these patients through to get optimum outcomes. So again, to reiterate, it is a success story. Uh, we've made great progress in 20 years, I think, uh, um, and there's more to come from this for sure. So in conclusions, patient selection is really, really important. And I think we need to have a longer term view of this uh, process, just not do it because we can get a valve in. We need to get low gradients. We need to make it as big as it can be for adult in a safe way without uh, affecting the coronaries or uh, leading to conduit disruption with a rate of around 10%. A systematic approach is really, really important. And again, we need to try and provide an optimal environment for that stent valve to work, which means ensuring that we pre-stent as much as we can uh, and not rely on the stent valve to do the work first for that. And really, you've got to wonder whether or not this type of work should be done in specialist centers. I know more and more adult centers, certainly in the US, are looking at doing this now. I think if you don't have a congenital surgeon, uh, in your center and if you don't have a surgeon in-house when you're doing these cases, I, I think that's putting both you and the patient at risk and needs to be strongly considered. So thanks very much. Fortunately, we have some 20 minutes for questions to the panelists. Dr. Alexandra Heath, we have Sandra Perez, uh, Luis Alfredo Morales Tiribaldos, ni Rodrigo Nicolás da Costa, ni Aldana Perez Tomas. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, if there are no questions from the panelists, I have a question. Tengo una pregunta para el doctor Hijasi. Tengo preocupaciones por la progresión de trombos, especialmente en fístulas grandes. ¿Qué piensas sobre la eh, anticoagulación más la doble antiagregación de plaquetas? ¿Y por cuánto tiempo deberíamos hacerlo? Gran, excelente pregunta, Alonso, José Alonso. Esto me pasó con dos pacientes eh, que habíamos eh, trabajado con neparina y lo que hago con grandes fístulas es eh, obviamente uso eh, heparina y tratamiento con estradiol segundo y obviamente que no podemos mantenerlos por heparina porque no, no es posible pero entonces espero eh, cuatro o seis horas antes de quitar Vaina, eh, después sigo con el tratamiento y empiezo con warfarina. Mi experiencia he trabajado con warfarina además de aspirina, las dos cosas. Y al menos trabajo con 2,4, 2,5 o más. Y eh, comienzo con heparina y después continúo con warfarina. Eso al menos durante 6 meses a un año. El angiograma es importante. Y bueno, obviamente que tomo conclusiones de eso, pero esto es una cuestión para grandes fístulas eh, en este caso. Para creo que esa es la forma para hacerlo. Tengo una pregunta para eh, Carlos Zaval. Carlos, excelente eh, charla. Recientemente hemos tenido algunos debates sobre la impl implantación de eh, múltiples... Eh, digamos en el transepto que si tenemos múltiples eh, eh, sí, ah, eh, eh, los trabajan a todos en el mismo procedimiento o trabajan de manera escalonada empiezan con el más grande por ejemplo y después en el segundo procedimiento en el segundo más grande etcétera según una publicación de la gente de Frankfurt que incluyó mil pacientes entre BFOs y eh, CIAs eh, recomendaba no cerrar múltiples defectos en el mismo procedimiento en especial si están cerca entre sí debido a la posibilidad de un 
cierre completo entre los, eh, los 6 a 12 meses después de la intervención. ¿Tenía algún comentario al respecto? Sí, gracias Alejandro. Creo que todo depende del de caso, de una cuestión de caso por caso, eh, de la anatomía y del tamaño. Si los defectos son grandes, lo suficientemente grandes como para causar un shunt significativo, preferimos cerrar ambos en la misma sesión, pero si tenemos un defecto grande y uno pequeño, podemos tomarlo así de manera escalonada. Pero creo que en otros casos, en la anatomía, depende de la anatomía y de los defectos. Thank you, Carlos. Doctor Morales, I have a question for Doctor uh, Zaval. Do you prefer using uh, devices already designed for uh, spiriformat? Spiriform? I've seen that you use more, uh, have more experience with um, blood cell devices, but do you have a, a device for a piriform? Sorry, for a cribiform? Or do you, what do you, do you prefer? We had, yes, we had access to the cribiform devices for one experience in, we have one case with that device, but they haven't brought it here to Mexico, the cribriform devices, so we did this for uh, any arithmetic septal defects. We would rather uh, approach them with a patent for aminoval devices. Dr. Warken, cuando tiene que abrir un stand lateral que sale de la rama contralateral. ¿Cómo elige el tamaño del balón? Gracias, es una pregunta importante. Esta es la pregunta del millón de dólares para mí, porque inicialmente trataba de eh, abrir en la rama lateral con el mismo catéter que usaría, pero con el mismo, está en 4 milímetros. Pero inicialmente, hace unos... 5 o 6 años eh, usaba algo de 4 o 5 milímetros pero lo que exper experimenté fue que el Sten se distorsionaba y se quedaba en muy mal estado entonces sabía que no podía hacer eso, ya no podía hacer más eso entonces en este momento, mi, en la práctica si tengo que ir a una rama lateral busco 40 o 50% del diámetro en este caso trato de buscar algo que no sea más grande que 2,5 milímetros del, para la rama lateral. Esa es mi práctica ahora. Entonces no sé si alguno de ustedes pueden compartir eh, también qué opinan respecto de esto. Algo de lo que aprendí también fue que ahora usamos el stent para la arteria coronaria. Y si no hacemos nada, eh, es probable que el flujo vaya hacia las, ladas, eh, hacia las ramas laterales especialmente si tenemos que usar un... Eh, tal vez tenemos que hacerlo aunque tengamos que usar un balón grande We have time for one more question, Dr. Pila, please Thank you, José Me Mi pregunta también es para el Dr. Borekan eh, para casos de ductos cerrados que tuve que no fueron tratables y quería preguntarle ¿cuándo cree que puede ser posible recanalizar el ductus total? si presta atención a si hay picos o no quiero, quiero saber que me cuente qué, qué opina respecto de esto gracias Carlos otra vez eh, honestamente creo que es un caso bastante importante. Una de las cosas que sobre las que me siento más optimista para continuar es cuando coloco el catéter guía eh, hasta el osteum y hago una inyección pequeña, veo un poquito de flujo que, que va hacia la arteria pulmonar a través del ductus. Ese es el momento en el que me tengo mucha confianza de que hay allí un, un orificio. 
Entonces eh, tenemos que ser eh, cuidadosos, tenemos que ser... Eh, si nosotros empujamos el, la, la cuerda con toda la fuerza, vamos a tener problemas. Creo que eh, obviamente que necesita un poco de trabajo, un poco de tacto. Hay que tener una buena cuerda y hay que probar. Obviamente también uno no siempre puede llegar a tener suerte, pero, pero esa es una de las formas que lo hago. Would you like to do any other question? Uh, Carlos uh, wanted to do a question first. Una pregunta también para Warakan. En casos de ductos tortuosos con ambas arterias pulmonares con estenosis. ¿Alguna vez usa, usó la técnica de Kiss Instant con ¿Dónde usar como los estén? Esta es una pregunta importante. Mi, mi práctica, yo traté de usar un, la menor cantidad de estén, o la mayor cantidad de material de estén, como fue posible. Nunca he hecho tanto por eso tantas estén. Entonces, eh, el cirujano me dice que, por favor, trata de mantener el estén lo más corto que, pueda ser, que sea posible. Entonces, eh, si hago eso, mi cirujano está feliz. Pero si tengo las eh, una de este tipo de estenosis, entonces hago, eh, hago esto. De, entonces, tengo que ver si, si uso el, el lado derecho o izquierdo. Busco usar la técnica más apropiada. Esta pregunta es para Damien Kenny. Damien, en esta parte del mundo nosotros tenemos en general tres stent para eh, tenemos el para el TSB, tenemos el, los convencionales, tenemos eh, el Palmas eh, 450 y, y otro más de ellos. En tu opinión, ¿cree que tiene alguno de estos stent alguna indicación especial? En cuanto a fuerza radial o en ese sentido, eh, tal vez eh, a ver si alguno de estos podemos. Si tenemos, bueno, nosotros tenemos, eh, tenemos estenes, estenes fuertes, creo que Palmas es el más resistente y creemos que mientras más eh, estenes ponemos, me, más problemas podemos tener en la vena, entonces tenemos que tener el máximo provecho de cada estén que ponemos. Y nosotros tendemos a usar el P40, P40-40, P40-10, P50 de las palmas y creemos que son los más resistentes. Entonces, eh, sabemos que vienen algunas otras variantes, Bentley, eh, el Optimus, esos no los usamos en el SBT y también el CP, pero es un poco más blando, entonces tal vez necesita alguno más de, de, apoyo, de apoyo y con los eh, convencionales pasa que a veces se calcifican. José, ¿tenemos tiempo para una pregunta más? ¿Hay alguno de los panelistas? Eh, o José, si quieres hacer una pregunta. If there are no more questions, I have one more question for... If uh, there are no more questions, I have one more question for Dr. Saval. Which would be the limit so as not to try the procedure? I think that from our point of view, uh, the largest limitation is when you have to use more than two devices. If you cannot uh, close the, the, the ASD with uh, more than two devices, then we opt for surgery because of the cost of the procedure. If, you do it, if, you could, if we can do it with two devices, we'd rather do it with interventionism. And if we can do it with one, it's even better. Thank you very much. Okay, it's been a pleasure sharing with uh, Alejandro the moderation of this uh, table and of this panel and listen to all of these distinguished guests. We'll finish this panel. And thank you all and for being here. Gracias.
Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start with the following session. It is an honor for me being here with you in this Congress. Unfortunately, we cannot drink coffee and be together physically, but we are participating of an amazing Congress. We're going to start this session. The first speaker is Dr. Kristen Krauser, Chief of Cardiovascular Surgery in Pediatrics of Australian Hospital. He will talk about lymphatic embolization in dysfunctional fontan Kreutzer surgery, how to select the right patient. It is a great pleasure for me being invited to Solasi. We share this passion for interventions Today, I have to talk about lymphatic embolization, and I would like to say that out of these 50 years of evolution, we have done a great progress and we have improved the candidate to reserve the surgery. We know the importance in these patients, need to have a good ventricular function, and we have seen that we and sometimes need to, needed to change the parameters. We have improved the extracardiac conduit. In here, we have the the information that we have optimized for the technique. In this, we have the right ventricle is not touched. We preserve some other structures and the importance of pro protecting some areas. We know the, that the fountain has an over life of in 2021 we have a lot of problems that are very worrying. There are some ways we, uh, we can fail. Then the failure of Fontan with optimal, suboptimal management. And then the Fontan failure due to the failure of the ventricle. This shouldn't be called a Fontan failure. From 71, there was a, a statement that we could live with, with this situation. What is the first? What is the Fontan failure? We have to be honest. Suboptimal management is our failure, not Fontan's failures. Most of SVCHD have normal pulmonary arteries at birth. Subaortic stenosis can and should be avoided since birth. Chronic volume outload, overload, long standing, or loose bands, like a, such as a big shant, also has to be avoided. The phrenic nerve palsy is oh, the only possibility to increase the preload of the single ventricle in inspiration page of patients with only one ventricle has to be avoided because we know that it is iatrogenic. Perfect CV, CPV management and organ protection at Fontan is very important. And the technical perfection of the Fontan pathway can and should be always present. If we're going to talk about how Fontan modern fontan fail in these works. We understand that all patients that are, have that have died due to the fontan had at least one surgical defect possible to intervene at the time of at the time of the complication, such as a conduct that is distorted, stenosis of pulmonary arteries, obstructed conduit, if we see what happens with uh, survival, we see that unfortunately patients that have a morphology of this left, of left ventricle that is not correct have a larger incidence than those that correspond to the tricuspid problems. Now let's talk about lymphatics and fountain circulation. Fountain circulation operates at or above the functional limits of the lymphatic circulation. There is a high central venous pressure and that produces 
an increase of the post load of the infar of the of this area. In some studies, we see that the flow decreases when the pressure reaches 20, 25 milligrams of mercury. We know that these pressures produce hemostasis in the thorax, will have thoracic duct dilation, and we will have valve incompetence of the lymphatic valves in the major lymphatic conduits. Will not have opening of dormant communications because a lot of other communications will be opened in those cases we have a very complicated situation and lymph will find the way such as the lymph complication the early ones pleural effusions pulmonary lymphatic edema ascites and late complications we have effusions societies plastic bronchitis ple and of course associated ones to the process such as uh, liver fibrosis renal failure lung fibrosis and myocardial fibrosis i found a couple of years ago uh, dr merle sweet the most prominent in this area and she asked me so christian and the question that you have here so my father has uh, taught a procedure that creates cardiac failure and uh, your father devised a procedure that is basically creating pure right heart failure and you guys never thought of lymphatics and we started analyzing this what happens is in all of the tissues when we have lymphedema we have a cascade of fibrosis that is that happens in any tissue that has lymphedema. Lymphatic complications are present very early. We see this in this work in Philadelphia that studied before Fontan patients that were going to go to Fontan and they saw that there existed four types of, of our abnormalities. B ones type 1, then we had type 2, abnormalities extending to the mediastinum, type 3, and type 4, abnormal reperfusion extending to the lung. And what they observed in this study was that there was increased LAOS, a chest tube drainage in chest, chest also an increase in chest tube drainage, abnormalities in the mediastinum, an increase in mortality and takedown incidence in type 4. All of this makes us think, think that we should change the lymphatic drainage in patients with Fontan in the territory where there is less pressure than is basically the pulmonary veins of the left uh, atrium. In Fontan, they have low pressure diastole and inspiration which are the physiological characteristics that we can see for the uh, lymphatic drainage. This is the Frasca procedure for patients with these cardiopathies. This is this inserted. We go to the this other chamber. We see an angiography. This is the innominate vein reaching the left auricle and a complete drainage. And we have a fenestration. But there is also a, lymphatic, a proper lymphatic drainage. So who can undergo these procedures? We can do them to patients that have high risk of fountain procedure, MRI types three and four, in the fountain surgery and per patients with early failure, ascites or hydrothorax or patients with failing fountain with PBPLE or effusions or ascites. 
from the 17 we have been performing a prospective work and all the font time we do a prior MRI a study of 16 patients and 10 of them had low anomality and we did a fenestrated fontan extra cardiac one and types 3 and 4 that have abnormal lymphatic abnormalities we did an extra cardiac fontan with lymphatic decompression and none of the patients died but there was less volume of effusions for patients in group B these patients generally are we are seeing this uh, trend in patients there are less complications in some of the procedures so we're going to talk about protein losing enteropathy and interventions is it is characterized by the loss of proteins we perform in 15% of patients start with RV morphology there are three types one is the diffuse intestinal lymphangiectasia type 2 associated with TD obstruction retrograde intestinal intestinal flow with leak that is the type 2 and type 3 increased liver flow with leak and rupture of the duct at an enteric level and this is associated with fontan but this is just the tip of the iceberg because this surgery produces a vicious cycle for the GI with elevated CVP, decreased mesenteric perfusion, elevated mesenteric vascular resistance. All of these patients have portal hypertension, mild to moderate. This produces a chronic splanic inflammation. Of course, there is a, a lot of pressure And all of this produces the rupture of the duct in the lymphatic comp due to the lymphatic compression. For these patients that have this problem, the criteria for TD decompression is for this patient to have a preserved or mildly depressed single ventricle function that the MRI they have a, a patent thoracic duct, ideally to the left. We can do it on the right, but it requires, requires a larger surgery. The, we will have to perform an MRI to these patients. And if CD, MRL, if TD is not clearly seen on coronary plane, of two T2 MRI. Lymphatic embolization was secondary to TD decompression and then the embolization, if necessary, of the lung lymphatic collaterals for PV. This is mandatory because we cannot compete with the negative pressure of the air duct. If a collateral has opened to the trachea, there is a there is a physiology of this plastic. It is very difficult for the collateral to stop draining to the airway due to the negative pressure. So it is very difficult to do, but for example, in some other cases we can do it if we have a different pressure of eight to 10 millimeters of mercury. Of course, for embolizations, what we have to do is to rule out there is residual lesions first. And we have to think that the embolization has to preserve or reestablish the lymphatic drainage because if we obstruct all the drainage, the patient will be worse and the curve, the curve will be worse than the disease. Always we have to preserve the TD 
and aim only for lymphatic collaterals, but not for big lymphatic conducts. We say it is secondary to TDT compression because if it has opened a lymphatic collateral to the airway, it will do that again. We can have a symphatic, lymphatic system that is very fatigued and cannot drain properly. If we have to do embolization, we need to see the anatomy of the liver, the way of the embolization. This is done with a percutaneous puncture at the periportal level with a 22G needle. We confirm the position with a contrast dye, detecting the drainage to the fistula, for example. Then we flush with a 10% glucose solution and we occlude these uh, collaterals with injection. We can also do it in a patient where we have occlusion of the lymphatic system and the blood must not be within a lymphatic system because that is very problematic for PB lymphatic embolization. We can have a transgastric puncture with a chaven uh, needle. In Belgium, they are performing this in a percutaneous way. There are also uh, trans another approach, different types of approaches. This is an image of the uh, hosp private hospital of Cordoba. You can see the cisterna puncture and how we have the thoracic duct that is, is being dilated. It measures six millimeters. And this was a very difficult case. This is the same patient already having here the smoke and the contrast in the left atrium showing that the patient has the thoracic uh, duct that is decompressed. These are images of a, call, a doctor, a well-known doctor. We could solve the problem that we were having through the collocation of a stent within the thoracic duct and now the duct is draining perfectly. Then we have another image courtesy of Yuav Dori as well. We do a selective lymphatic embolization. You can see the gray, the big loss, the big, big leak. You can see the e-coils. And this is the clinical experience in decompression of failing fontans. You can see all of the information that you have here too with plastic bronchitis and three effusions, as ascites, I'm sorry. These has, have been the outcomes for each of the patients. I wanted to see that ventricular dysfunction is a factor, a risk factor for these patients and they will not improve if the failure continues. I would like to thank this effort, collaborative effort by the lymphomaniacs, are the professionals from here, Vivek Haidortal, Joe Habitori, Victor Haraska and myself. We have a group study and we share all of our experience in cardiovascular surgery, we did this publication. We expressed our thoughts about surgery and intervention in these types of fontan failure. And the lymphatic flow disorders are serious. Sometimes they can be life-threatening. And the alteration of the uh, 
lymphatic system is part of this but it may be reversed imaging is the key first step in diagnosis and to guide therapy we need to have images of the lymph system lymphatic system we need to have a multidisciplinary approach of course of interventional cardiologists and there are many interventional techniques to use to treat lymphatic flow disorders lymphatic decompression can be achieved in front of circulation this is a the in vein downturn is a valid alternative and promising results for patients at risk of lymphatic failure. I would like to thank you again for the invitation to participate. I hope we can see each other. Thank you very much. Good morning. I am Dr. Alberto Miguel Sigata, Head of Hemodynamics in the Hospital Garrahan. And the topic today is the percutaneous closure of septum defects. And uh, to see if we should move forward with all kinds of, uh, of these kinds of procedures. This is the topic of this uh, talk. First thing that we should uh, clarify is that the closing the DAC is uh, considered uh, an elective treatment between four and six uh, years old. But there's a small percentage of uh, patients that when they have uh, interocular uh, difficulties, that with the ones that we can close through okay, catheterization, they have uh, clinical symptoms that makes them uh, susceptible to receive treatment before. And uh, these are patients that are under 15 kilos. Indications for this group are very strict. Uh, for example, an untreatable uh, congestive, congestive heart failure. Uh, for example, respiratory uh, infections, repeated infections. You need uh, more than six uh, hospitalizations per year that require treatment, the pulmonary dysplasia, and uh, some patients with uh, uh, the severe uh, issues, which is, could be uh, a renal uh, failure or hepatic failure along with the SD, and also associated defects like uh, children who have, uh, other than the uh, ASD, uh, conductors or CCC, uh, some patients with uh, shunt, with left right shunt due to a CCC, uh, sorry, a cyanotic uh, congestive uh, uh, congenital disease. <clears throat> some patients that have been subject subjective and that they have a risk of embolization, paradoxal embolization when we, they are finished the finishing the procedure and the lower vena cava is uh, obstructed. In these cases, they can do this procedure. Before. Of course, what you're going to have to do is. Uh, we need to see if, uh, uh, other than the indication, if the patient is, uh, is appropriate for the procedure. We need to uh, look at if the, the uh, edges, the rims of the ASD are uh, appropriate, uh, both in size, four to five millimeters, for an uh, under 10 years old, and five millimeters uh, uh, over four uh, millimeters for under 10 kilos and five for over 10 kilos and this is uh, the firm firmness and the thickness that can contain the device without an embolization this uh, is usually for patients with a single defect or if they have multiple defects they need to be close enough to be able to be closed with a single occluder they may be, have to be closed, closed with one occluder, but it's going to be very difficult with these types of patients. We need to uh, also rule out the presence of a PAPVR. And we need to do this uh, through the femoral, uh, femoral uh, vein. So the size of the femoral vein, femoral vein needs to be enough to accommodate the type of catheter that we're going to use. If they don't, uh, we may do it through transhepatic uh, access. 
You also need to have the country, the country indication, uh, no country indications for precutaneous closure, and not uh, not a single requirement of cardiovascular surgery because the procedure would not would be un unnecessary. Then uh, we exclude uh, patients who have a very high uh, pulmonary resistance, uh, over six uh, wood units, and patients who have uh, four to six uh, wood units. If we try to do it. You generally need to think uh, using a fenestrated device or to fenestrate one of the devices. The, once uh, the 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 BSD, DSD is uh, closed, we need to uh, analyze if this is going to happen. We need to analyze if the patients have a ventricular the dysfunction on the right or left ventricles with an ejection fraction over thirty percent under thirty percent. Patients who have infections or sepsis, patients with intracardiac thrombus, or patients who are contraindicated for antiplatelet treatment. The regression uh, of uh, where they have a an early uh, regression of uh, so one of the advantages is the early regression of uh, hemodynamic consequences. We do not require uh, an extracorporeal uh, circulation pump. The patient stops having a left right shunt. Uh, the this, as we said before, we the patient does not require an extracorporeal circulation pump. We have a shorter post-op uh, time, and they have the they don't have the the scar of a thoracotomy. And towards the future, since we're going to use a future uh, a device where the ASD is not so large. Uh, because you know that the ASDs uh, start growing as the patient grows and the, the hole starts growing. So, so in the future we have uh, less material in the interatrial uh, inter uh, inter septum. These patients, uh, their disadvantages are that the patients are more serious than asymptomatic uh, patients uh, uh, over under five, four years old, which, uh, so they have a larger risk of complication. They have uh, both at uh, vascular and valvular levels and arrhythmia and as for arrhythmias or conduction uh, disorders which may be caused due to the size of the device. Uh, if the device compresses some of the noble structures, uh, we need uh, such as the, the AV node. Uh, they have a much smaller vascular and intracardiac uh, diameters. They have less uh, smaller distance with other structures. We have technical limitations in the in the devices that we can use. The, some of the devices are uh, well established for older children and for adults, but they are hard to use in these patients. The measurements with a balloon, which may be done uh, with, for these kinds of patients. So we need to uh, be aware and check uh, using the transesophagic uh, uh, echo, echo, and the devices that we can use as uh, the Amplatzer devices, and because they go through with a transeptal introducer, which is a smaller. In general, they are used with a five to eight French introducers. The other devices require a larger French uh, number. And of course, one of the main difficulties is uh, at the uh, if the occluder can get embolized and we need to uh, do a rescue of the occluder and due to the conditions of the patients this is very difficult so we need to be very careful with the prepare preparation of these uh, patients with, and with the possible disadvantages that we may have. So the pre previous assessment is done usually by using a TTE uh, with a supra uh, external as well as the costal view so we can may do a, a TEE before the procedure in the procedure we use a fluoroscopy and uh, eventually with a sorry and time from time to time with a TEE there are some cases where we might have an ACE uh, if we have a venous uh, vascular access and we, when we have a, at least age for 8 French and if we don't have a pediatric uh, probe and we need to do the procedure, 
even if it is the, not the most uh, advisable, if, you, if we are sure that the edge is, uh, the rims are the most appropriate, we could do it with a TTE. The post procedure assessment is done with the TTE. Now we're going to show what are we going to uh, consider. We're going to consider the size of the, the ASD and uh, especially the size of the total septum. This is going to be assessed uh, using a TE. There are many uh, indices uh, as for the size of the device, the size of the septum, the total septum size, the kilos of uh, body weight of the patient. And uh, we've had two or three uh, publications where all of these indices are not considered at all and they only check that once the device is placed and before releasing the device, the device is uh, well uh, placed. <coughs> now we're going to consider the rims. The rims are extremely important. And here we have uh, an appropriate rim on the left, where the patient uh, can be seen with an uh, appropriate uh, aortic edge. In the center part, we see that we have a, a good aortic rim and a very thin uh, posterior, uh, very anterior rim. That can make us doubt if the, this uh, rim is going to be appropriate. So, if we have doubts with the transesophageal, uh, with the TE, we may do a dilation with the balloon. And the last one on the right. We see that there is, there is no aortic rim, and so they have no uh, posterior rim. So around 60% of the patients have uh, very little, uh, they, they don't have a posterior rim, but, uh, so, but we want to find uh, patients with a posterior and inferior to a superior uh, rim, with a superior vena cava, and with the uh, auricular ventricular uh, uh, for the publications that uh, what the headache is a criteria it's five millimeters some of them have gone down to four and we have the indication of them being uh, six to seven millimeters uh, away from with the other valves the implantation techniques the freak, most frequent ones is the one that we're going to do to open the disc on the left atrium and sometimes since the left atria of these patients are very small the device that we're going to uh, implant is very large, uh, so sometimes the the disc is kind of occluded and it does not set well on on its position. So in these cases, we can do uh, the technique of opening the tip of the device on the left atrium, on the uh, superior left, superior right, uh, vena porta, and we could do a little jump like uh, moving it all together towards the interatrial uh, inter inter septum. This technique can be used and it requires another access. And the balloons that are used uh, more frequently are uh, quite large and they, have, uh, they require an important uh, French size. For the Blaster 4000 are the ones that are used the most because they require a smaller French size, or we can do it with, uh, with other types of balloons. Here we have a device. We can see it uh, placed here, and with the aortic uh, rim, with the posterior rim, and uh, superior vena cava, and the inferior vena cava, and then uh, with the color in the, uh, to see how the device is set in the end. In conclusion, uh, the performing these kind of procedures is feasible in centers with a vast medical experience in uh, closing of ASDs in, pa in pediatric patients and if they have uh, done a learning curve in patients, in, in smaller patients uh, under 20 kilos, under 15 kilos and then under 10 kilos. The, there is a learning curve we need to have uh, institutional support, uh, which is appropriate if there are any, uh, for any circumstances that may arise. And we need to have a, a proper screening of the patients. We need to uh, have the availability of imaging 
for the case. Uh, we need to have uh, the appropriate type of materials and devices to be used. And if you have uh, many doubts with the rims, with the TT, or if they probably were able to perform a TE, you may even uh, have to, you may even be able to do a, a CAT scan and do a 3D reconstruction of the shape of the rims of the patient. And based on that, we can decide if uh, we should do this or if we should uh, send them to the surgery. Uh, then we need to plan the technique of the, the closure. And uh, this is to optimize the results and to uh, reduce and uh, minimize the risk of complications, which in these patients uh, is a lot larger than in patients that are over four years old. So if all of these uh, conditions are, uh, are there, we can move forward in the percutaneous treatment of this population. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizing committee of Salasi Kasi 2021 for this opportunity to share this talk with you in the following 15 minutes. I will talk about rotational angiography with 3D reconstruction, a new tool in the diagnosis of congenital cardiopathy. I do not have any conflicts of interest for this presentation. We know that 3D RA is, is, the, is a technique that has been available during the last 10 years. We know that cardiopath uh, congenital cardiopathies are associated with anatomies that are complex and we need high definition imaging. 3D RA is crucial in the diagnosis, planification, therapy although it is not a standardized technique of the specialty but it is the it will be used even more in the future it will take us to uh, advanced visualization augmented reality mixed reality virtual reality and 3d printing we also know that we have had some analogic technologies and then we had digital technology and that gave us an idea of two dimensions. In the last years, we have been using pl uh, uh, flat detectors, and we also have 3D images, and that changed from two to three dimensions. We need to understand to be able to have a better treatment, which are the objectives of this technology improving the uh, diagnostic precision, minimizing exposure to ionizing radiation and use of contrast, and the overlap of uh, 3D RA imaging with fluoroscopy, we have better projections and can guide the interventions. We can also integrate this with MRI, CT, and 3D echocardiographies. How do we do this and what is our protocol? We place one or two centimeters per kilo of iodine, iodine contrast of low osmolality that is diluted one to one or two to one with a social, um, sorry, a solution of normal saline, doses of radiation of these numbers that you have here. And we use an Arctic, Arctic one uh, Siemens and reconstruction with 3D viewer and Dyna CT for the 3D RA. Which are the questions that we have with these techniques? And it has not been quite uh, frequently used. It exposes patients to high radiation and there is a discrepancy in measurement of the structures since it is a 3D reconstruction of anatomic structures that are very difficult and the impossibility of visualizing the airways and the relationship it has to a comparison with a CT. There are some problems with the audio. We could solve some of these things and I can show you. I will try to uh, demonstrate that. We know that we can be done with low radiation, preserving the image quality. As this article says, the radiation dose is from five to eight millisieverts, leading to a resistance in the use. 
but we have reduced the number of frames and the energy per frame and we're also working in the reduction of these millisieverts to a very low to 1.2 or 2.6 millisieverts. This is possible up to reaching levels that are competitive of using the same radiation that a cardiac CT, gated cardiac CT uses without compromise of the image. We come from this study of 248 frames, then 124, 82, up to 31 frames, and the quality of the image has not, has not been altered. So it is possible to de decrease the FPS. We know that it's a drastic reduction of radiation with simple measurements. Simple measurements, this was published by the Netherlands. It was seen that the reduction of frames from 60 to 30 frames per second, an active collimation of the X-ray beam, the use of a already available low dosage program for each technology and a pre 3D RA run check to see the tube current below 100 million pairs. With this simple protocol, we could reduce in 66% the dose, the radiation dose, and in 79 in the use of the catheterization with an excellent image. So this is a drastic reduction of the dose used while keeping the excellent image quality. So this is possible and we have solved the first problem. The second problem is measuring the structures since it is stipulated that in the 3D RA we have the reconstruction and the correlation is excellent as, a, as the study of the Toronto people. There is an excellent correlation between 2D and 3D with the measurement of all of these structures. And lastly, the visualization of the airways. This was our study. We used a software for the airway of soft parts. And in this part, we can see with a great definition the correlation of the airway as regards this pulmonary branch on the right that was the only one in this patient, so we have an idea of the correlation. So three, those three uh, questions, we could solve them. What are the other advantages of these interventions? We have a, an overlap of the 3D image and the fluoroscopy in real time to use as a roadmap. And there is also a fusion of this uh, 3D technology with a CT and MRI to have a roadmap to help us in the catheterization, selective catheterization of a specific vessel in an uh, AV malformation. And this, with the fusion technique, also helps us to do the selection, that, and that is very helpful for us. Another advantage the placement of sense in the left pulmonary branch. We have a risk of compression in some anatomical subsets of the compression of the ipsilateral bronchi. We can see in radioscopy how it can be compressed. So in this case, we place a stent in the left pulmonary branch. This compresses the airway. And there's a great study by Roman and collaborators where the stent is placed. Then a balloon within the airway. It is The thorax is manually compressed. So we have an oval shape of the stent instead of a circular one. So we avoid the compression of the airway. And with this, we stimulated assembling the stent in two balloons to, be, to have an oval position instead of a circular one to avoid bronchi compression. These are images of our lab. In this case, we have a, a left uh, pulmonary branch stenosis, post astomosis of Glenn, and stenting, we see that the, the stenosis was severe and after the severe, the stent, how we solve the problem. We have another patient with stenosis of the same branch with 
after anastomosis, clean anastomosis, and we see the stenting and how it was reconstructed in a 3D printing, in a 3D imaging to see the position of the stent and the vascular wall. We have another study that is very useful, rotational uh, angiography, the 3D one. This we had in this case we had a blood lock tossing anastomosis and we can see the collaterals here that help us plan for the following interventions or surgery. In this case we have the visualization of collaterals, the veno arterius one. After Fontan Krauser, you can see the branches with bilateral collaterals and we can have a, a better treatment for them. This is a visualization of Fontan Krauser anastomosis with an extracardiac tube and pulmonary artery branches. After the, um, the percutaneous close of the fenestration, you can see all of the anatomy. And we changed colors so you can see the device of the extracardiac part and to have a good an idea of this anatomy of the patient so as to avoid failure of the fontan surgery. This is another case where we see uh, an anastomosis of the fontan crosser. There is a proximal narrowing of the tube that is seen very good for the pulmonary arteries. It is very useful to use this. This was a visualization of the aortic arch and the stent without residual lesions. This is a visualization of the stenosis of the right pulmonary branch after surgery of bidirectional clean and stenting. You can see very clearly the stent in this branch. This was another case that we recently did visualization of the venous anomalous drainage in the, in, the, in the pulmonary area that was dual. It had a collector, the pulmonary veins filling the upper end. It was a, a two-way, it had a two-way drainage. You can see in this image the drainage changing colors to see this anomalous vessel and how we could occlude it. It is very useful. This is a different case where we use this technology of 3D RA in the visualization of pulmonary branches after Janet surgery with the Lecomte maneuver. And we can see that the pulmonary branches are not distorted, so they are, have no stenosis. In this case, we place a stent in the RVOT, in a patient with only one branch, the right one, you can see the 3D reconstruction, you can see the, play, the stenting, and then the coarctation. And in this case, we see the relationship with the air, of the pulmonary branches with the airways, and you can do this with this technology and the soft parts of the airways and the relationship to the pulmonary branches that is very, very useful. There are some connection issues. I wanted to show you that this technology has been used in the to see the relation of the coronary arteries with the calcified tubes of the right ventricle to the uh, pulmonary artery before the implant of a percutaneous pulmonary valve and you can see different projections and the distance 10.6 millimeters you see the distance of the balloon and the calcified area area to rule out compromise of this section in the same group of the Netherlands we can observe or assess the RVOT and crushing of a cusp, aortic cusp. There are some problems, technical problems, and we cannot listen to the audio. It is very important in this case to assess the RVOT and having this 3D RA technology is very good. 
As a conclusion, we know that 3D RA is crucial in diagnosis, planification, and therapy in, of congenital heart disease, and we need to integrate data with other technologies of that are provide cross-sectional images such as MRI, CT, and 3D echocardiography, and we also know that we can do a reduction of radiation. We have a precision in measurements, and we can always also have a good visualization of the airways in real time. And we can do that with specific protocols, having this um, tool as a very uh, good element for our diagnosis. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is Rafael Linze. <coughs> I am a cardiologist, a pediatrician in the pediatrics cardiology in the Medellin, Colombia. I'm going to talk to you about the administration of the anastomos uh, of London Grosser Anastomosis and its closure necessary. In 1971, uh, the Fontan operation, uh, they developed uh, the, this original operation and this was applied to all of the patients with an anatomical defect. We've seen that the uh, doctor uh, Castaneda did a modification to this uh, technique so the patient would have a less complex post-op with uh, pleural drainages and uh, with the issues that we have with the with techniques that we have right now. The idea was to modify the contact cell surgery for patients with a high risk by creating a small fenestration. We have a escape valve, a left right right left uh, shunt, which theoretically improves the QS, but uh, it uh, the, creates a, no, a quick overload of volume to the volume. It limits the pressure of the cable system, and it increases the preload of the systemic ventricle. And so uh, that's the issue of leaving the frustration open. The right to left sh shunt uh, could cause a, sh a stroke, for example. And let's remember which is the, the Ten Commandments of the... or Four Commandments here for Fontan. Is that uh, we need to consider uh, this case uh, well the ten or four commandments, but uh, they've turned to four and to two. And the first time is uh, the pulmonary artery right size, the PMAP, the the, v, the normal VI function, uh, sorry, uh, left ventricle function, and uh, of course we need to have a systemic. Uh, right ventricle. It's very important to have an absence of distortion of the pulmonary uh, artery and the competence of the uh, valve in the... and we need, of course we can have a normal systemic ventricle drainage and uh, we might have the need of uh, peacemakers and to be able to do it over two years of age. This uh, publication in England uh, talks about the uh, rise uh, the early influencing the factors influencing the early late outcome in Fontan. There are technical issues. The components, the high risk components, are the ones that would uh, be uh, taken to the fenestrated Fontan surgery. And you have the idea that sometimes you do a Fontan. There's a, this uh, study published in 2019 progress in pediatric cardiology and that uh, most of them still have a uh, fenestration this varies uh, depending on the center and that the uh, fenestration is uh, more common in high risk patients in the reality there uh, it's been used in up to 64 centers in the United States five of the there are five large centers which do uh, five eight to ten uh, surgeries uh, in uh, Fontan and some centers use it in 100% uh, of their patients and some do it in only 8% of their patients and especially in patients that have uh, it's more common in patients of high risk especially those who have a systemic right ventricle in more studies to still confir confirm this when the Fontan surgery uh, 
the fenestrated uh, fondant surgery. Everybody started to use it, but uh, we saw that it was not appropriate for all uh, the patients. In San Francisco, they, they did a study and they found that there was a, they did not find a, they did not find a statistical difference in patients who are not at risk. And it's not necessary for our patients and maybe we need to have a, have assess this. We need to perform, don't need to perform it routinely. And uh, after they need to check for the need for fenestration after the bypass. The idea of fenestration is to, uh, it has pros and cons and it increases the preload of the ventricle and it's a source of cardiac uh, spend, uh, output so but it has a fenestration it has some uh, cons that are the need for the, the, close, the late closing the paradoxal embolism and those may be. This is uh, the, the application of the Fontancarosa procedure. This, uh, here we have a, a paper in Latin America. And I did a, and we can see that uh, one of the higher, the risk factors is living at a great high, height. And uh, that leads to a risk of uh, pulmonary function issues. It's not clear what do we refer as living at a great height, but uh, most of the centers are between zero or 100 or 200 meters above sea level. But some cities are there in China and in Latin America. They are at uh, greater heights, and in this publication in Denver, they assessed 103 patients with fontan surgery. 70 of them survived to the adult age, 24 of them died, 18 required, uh, so that's 23%, and a clinical, uh, clinical collapse that required uh, moving to sea level was required in 13. There was no relation in the type, the age, or the, the moment of the procedure. The type, the age, or the time of the procedure of Fontana and the long-term uh, result. And the long-term re uh, results after the Fontana was negatively affected by a higher altitude of residence. Uh, many years ago, this was published in 2011, Dr. Ramirez with the Institute of Pediatric uh, Cardiology. They when they did the fontan, the non-fenestrated fontan, uh, they uh, because we we are talking about a pretty high side because uh, most people said it should be fenestrated, but here we have uh, in uh, another group that uh, only for people with a uh, high pulmonary resistance. Here there are many uh, cases here with. And here, just patients with high pulmonary resistance. The question is, then, if we should fenestrate or not? And the recommendation right now is to doing it only on high-risk patients, patients with a pressure over to uh, UW per square meter, uh, with this patients with the distorted uh, pulmonary artery uh, branches, uh, with a bad uh, systolic or diastolic ventricular fun function or with an insufficiency of the AV valve. And of course, if we are in a uh, high altitude. This is what happens in the uh, evolution of uh, patients. They start going well, they do the fontan, and we can see that the cardiac risk increases in these patients. And clinical Clinically, they could be treated further. Another importance is the, the exercise. This is a normal versus a fontan, best case, and the worst case of the fontan uh, procedure. Here we have a, we still have the fenestration. This curve is flatter because uh, the, the child would not tolerate the exercise. So there are no centers with the, it's the centers you should use institutional criteria uh, for these patients. We see that there were no uh, clear criteria, but we need to have an, an unobstructed fontan uh, access, no collateral uh, veno-venous uh, decompressive 
uh, collateral that may be significant. The base uh, baseline fontan pressure needs to be under 15 milligram millimeters of uh, mercury, and the base uh, cardiac index of two liters per minute per square meter, and a, a decreasing cardiac uh, index of uh, over uh, under sorry 20 uh, percent. So the closure of the front administration was followed by an increase in sat oxygen saturation that there was no statistically different statistical difference in administration or not. So one we should close and not. Most of them do it gradually and spontaneously. Uh, then we could do a, a late closing. And uh, there is a benefit in increasing the saturation that uh, turns into favorable, re favorable results for uh, body growth, uh, tolerance to exercise, and neurological development. Do we know when is the optimal moment? Uh, there are AR, it is when they are uh, indications is when they are aortic uh, saturation under 90 and uh, tolerance to the occlusion with a balloon. Another important thing is that with the exercise, they can get a better. Uh, Resistance. Here's the one the thing that we see here with the fenestration in the patient. It's all patent. So the moment of the idea moment of closing the, the fenestration is still debatable. We can postpone until at least six months after fi in, uh, finishing with the fontan circulation if the O2 sats are over 90 or 92 percent and the occlusion uh, test is tolerated. And who is the, the ideal candidate that we should consider? First of all, with the saturation, and over 90 and 92%. And in the post-op uh, assessment, uh, if the fontan was good or bad, that we should not have a, a shunt, uh, we should not have no kinds of obstructions with uh, low resistance, good ventricular function, and an absence of uh, in valve, uh, AV valve insufficiency, that is significant. We need to assess the, the arterial and venous collaterals after 10, 15 to 20 minutes after the occlusion in order to improve the result of Fontan. And the criteria for closure are a pressure over 18 millimeters of uh, mercury, AV difference uh, rising to under 33%, a saturation of the fontan circles over 40%, uh, more than 30% uh, of dropping QS, and that the increase of the medium uh, pressure, mean pressure of the fontan is over 4. Here's a fenestration closure. It's a patient with a fenestrated fontan. Here we see the, this collateral here, and then this, uh, this side, one of the veins that is, uh, becomes patent after fontan. And what we do here is symbolize the collateral system through vena venous uh, access. And here we see with the balloon, we see that it's occluded. And here we have the devices that may use that, uh, maybe with uh, some with different kinds of devices. Every person needs to see which is we with which are they more comfortable. In, the case of, uh, in some cases, the complexity is uh, very large, so you need to assess case by case. This is uh, one of the, the uh, tests with the uh, Fontan group. We have 122 patients, percutaneous closure in 53, spontaneous closure in 10, and opening the fenestration in 55 patients. You have the, the, you have the percentage distribution of the, the cardiopathy, the heart diseases. 24% with the atresia is the most. And here we have uh, the patients were under five years old, uh, the, the weight is uh, 18, the mid and the body surface is 0.72. The functional class that we had after uh, while is uh, one or two, most of them. And then we have the failed font, failure in font, the failed fontans, both as we consider with the different uh, types of failure. Here's the change of the saturation, the oxygen sat after the uh, pre and post uh, the fenestration closure. Uh, two patients uh, died, a female, 21 years old, uh, 
with the pulmonary branches that never grew up and another female uh, which had a heart transplant was the other person, the other uh, patient that died. So we see now that, uh, as Albert I said, we cannot solve uh, current problems with the same uh, way of thinking in which we created them. Uh, it's the idea is that uh, we created the fenestration with the idea that we needed to close it, but we see that uh, some patients we need to just leave it open. So it's difficult to achieve a good uh, balance with, between the cyanosis and all of the rest of the pathologies. And my final consideration is that the best thing of Fontan is that it removes the volume load of the single ventricle. So if no fenestration is needed, it would be better to close it. This is important. Uh, the data of the catheterization under anesthesia do not reflect the data in the real world. And we need to be as close as uh, the reality as possible. The, this is a double-edged sword because some patients need it. If they don't need it, it's best not to have it and it's uh, clear evidence of hypoxemia and uh, there's many of the polycythemia polycythemia is increase creates a larger risk there are no yes no answers some people close the the fenestrations to, to avoid multisystemic difficulties caused by the the high center of venous pressure the problem is that the children is exposed to polycythemia systema a cyanosis with limitation in the tolerance to the exercise if the hemodynamics allows it generally closes and then you deal with the consequences uh, uh, later. The problem with the cyanosis, uh, persistent cyanosis for small ch for young child is uh, de devastating for their activities. It creates learning difficulties and problems with polycythemia. It's tossing a coin and deciding what, how much are we willing to tolerate and what are we willing to call tolerate in these children. It's not the same as with adults. Not. Uh, not all the, the investigations have proven that uh, the closing the fenestration creates such large benefits. So we need to make decisions with patients with polycythemia and and if they have uh, the numbers of occlusions, so we need to assess very carefully if we take them to uh, the closing the fenestration. So we don't have a clear answer if we have to cl open to close all or to leave them all open. We need to the make this decision uh, as a routine decision but we need to decide on a case-by-case -case basis to uh, be able to go better thank you very much thank you very much the presentations were amazing we're going to go now to give the floor to the panelists dr serran antunes carla siniestra sinesterra santiago justo to make the questions to the great presenters that we had today. Hello everyone, it is a pleasure for me being here with you. I am Serra Antunes. The presentations were very good. I would like to make a question to Christians, two questions in fact. Hello Serrana, how are you? One of them is, why not to think about doing plastic surgery in patients you choose to do fenestrated fontan as a method of choosing, doing also that in the thoracic duct? That is the first question. And the second one, you know that we have patients we you already performed the surgery how do we do the following the follow-up of those patients mri post-op when what with what frequency maybe you can say something about that thank you thank you sarana it is great seeing you i will turn on my camera for you to see me it is very interesting the first question since we are already doing HRASCA surgery with Fontan. What we do in our patients, in all of the Fontan, we do an MRI before, and if we consider a hepatic failure, we do that instead of a fenestration. I am very influenced by the Philadelphia group. I believe they have had great conclusions, specifically, with the surgical technique. Today, 
we have had no mortality and that has been compared at Hospital Privado de Córdoba and one of Buenos Aires. We work with the same methodology and the patients we see that have a thoracic problem before Fontan procedure. We suspect that these patients will not do well after the Fontan procedure. Most of them who have this thoracic problem at the time of Glenn that can be a risky situation. Instead of doing the fenestration, we do the lymphatic decompression of Kraska. And we have six patients of a total co cohort of 15. Six patients required Kraska. Now the question is, do we, will Kraska replace fenestration? Mm, that is a very good question. And I believe that fenestration is a physiological aspect because it takes out all the lymph. That will be an ideal fenestration because I have a different volume, a grade a flow without a saturation, a lack of saturation. What we see in patients with classic one and the horasca is that saturation is the same, 90% approximately. Now the important difference is in the amount of pleural effusion that they have. They patients with lymphatic problems have less um, less complications. And sometimes you prefer Horasca procedure two days of drainage and that's okay. And that is a very marked difference we are observing. I believe that this will be solved when we can do what the same what we did with hypoplasia and the trial of the single ventricle as compared in Sano versus the Bichant. When we can compare a cohort of 500 patients with Fontan extra cardiac with fenest classic fenestration and that at that time we will have an answer whether it, if it is beneficial or not for patients. And if it avoids the complications, the literous complications you have with the Fontan surgery, there are complications because the lymph cannot be drained with a good system. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you and a very good presentation. Any other question? If there are no questions, I would like to make one to Alejandro. As regards the time I was with the camera off, I'm sorry. The time or training, you need to give technicians for these types of imaging with the rotational imaging and whether you have to modify the cath lab, if we have to modify the table, the anesthesia, for example, for the Haraska for the 3D RA, I'm sorry. I tell you our reality and what we did. All of this work in the 3D RA came from my proposal to the team. It, it was not the case, but the technician Javier Ojola, who was uh, finding out about that, he posed that uh, method and we started talking about this. So the team, there is the technical team, the nursing team, the hemodynamic, and the anesthesiologists have to talk about this. You have to plan it with time before entering. You need the disposition, the placement of the lab is the same. Hoses have to be uh, far away from 
from the area where you're going to do the angiography. This requires an extra time of accommodating the patient and all of the wires and catheters for the patient and also the space for the machine to rotate and not to have any interference with other equipments. Now, once we have that dynamic, it is very simple. The injection is very simple. The dilution, the usual dilution. Then after one of two seconds, you activate the tower and you can see the rotational angiography. And after that, the technician is very fast for the 3D reconstruction. They go to the workstation while we are still working with the patient and doing the reconstruction. And the most important thing, Jose, that we have achieved, I showed a lot, was that with the same software, we could do the representation of the airways. Uh, software of soft areas to see the relation to the airways. So it has to come from uh, the from the whole team and the specialist in bioimaging is crucial for the reconstruction and for the possibility of doing this and to prepare both the anesthesiologist beforehand and the rest of the team as well. But once you have the dynamics, it is very easy, Jose. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Excellent presentations. I would like to make a question to Dr. Siegata. For us who work in Latin America, we do not have a lot of resources for different procedures. As regards the indices you, you use or what are, what are your guides to know whether a patient below 15 kilos can undergo treatment? What do you know about the, the size of the device? We have 1.6, for example. When we took the patient to the cath lab, for example, we need to know that we have to perform the closure or not. What is your parameter whether you take the patient or not? Our parameters are basically keeping a relation with the total septum and to see that we do not compress any noble structure with the device we're going to place. In general, we try to respect that relation shape as you mentioned. Although in literature, we find some articles about patients under 10 kilos who were placed devices of up to 28 millimeters. The truth is that I do not agree with that and I would be very afraid of doing such a procedure because the basic problem is that you cannot fail, as you uh, said, because if the device is embolized, the patient dies probably. So we take into account the size of the hole and to be certain that the rims are very good and depending on that we'll see the device size we're going to place and we try for that size not to exceed the total diameter of the septum. But in the last articles we have seen they have left behind all of the indexes that were available. We try to choose patients. We are certain we can close in a proper way the hole without um, compromising it. And as I said, with my work team, sometimes you wonder, okay, this patient, does he have con contraindications to go to surgery? Because if there are no contraindications, let's go to surgery. If you are hesitant whether you can close it or not, you send that patient to surgery. But if the surgeon says, okay, this patient has a contra absolute contraindication due to this and this and this other reason, well, I try to close that whenever that is within the inclusion criteria that we mentioned and the size of the septum and the relations, relationships of the device. We do not have in the hospital, I believe we do not have more than one patient a year due to this. And I 
believe that the, device, the biggest device has been of 17 millimeters. So we are not that bold as in some other articles. Thank you very much. One comment to Dr. Lindsay. In the Fontan patients that comes with fenestration, any risk, any consideration for embolization? We have not reached the adult experience yet, but if all these patients, so adult patients who have a patent fenestration and big groups, there are some publications. Sometimes we're afraid of anticoagulation in children and we also use antiplatelets, but that depends on the center. We try to keep them with anticoagulation if we have a patent situation. And in adult patients, we may have a problem, so we need to continue with anticoagulation. If the patient is an adult and with a fenestration, I don't know what we could do with them because if uh, he could deal with the fenestration for, how, for, how, for that long, we may not need to solve that in an adult age. Okay, thank you very much. I wanted to make a question to Dr. Linz as well. In the case we have a patient that has been selected um, to close the Fontan fenestration and that patient after starts having symptoms such as enteropathy or plastic bronchitis, which would be the... What will we do with these patients? First of all, as Kreuzer mentioned, we do not have experience with surgery, this type of surgeries. We want us to start. We have enteropathies and bronchitis of the patients. We have closed fenestration in. We have to open in two patients percutaneously. And it is described that it is very difficult to open. It was not easy if you open the fenestration again in the devices. or we perforate with Brockenberg and we fenestrate with the stent. We have done that. These stents are difficult to solve in, in the, at that stage. And in general, it, if the patient fails, they, these cases will be very complicated and there will maybe embolization in cases of cardiac, and we we'll, may need cardiac transplant and we can connect with the uh, right, the left pulmonary. We we can do it and, and not open the fenestration in that side. Sometimes we have done it with a device with that without a lot of complications, as the literature had mentioned. We follow some of them. The plastic bronchitis improved from the enteropathy. We have. We did everything we could, we used stents, but it, when one fontan fails, there's very little to do. When things are not well and things are not working, we end up with a transplant. Alejandro, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you. Liliana, the question is about Rafa. Uh, but the question is about Christian. With all the knowledge we have had during the last years, what you mentioned and research about lymphatic circulations and alterations, we, for example, have uh, we tend not to close fenestrations due to the long-term result of fontan closure closure that may be necessary. We're very cautious about closing them. We keep uh, plan, uh, patients with antiplatelets and not anticoagulants. Uh, or if we ha have arrhythmias, that may change things. And we are very conservative and we are trying to close even less fenestrations than before. From your surgical point of view, do you recommend your interventionist 
to close the fenestrations of patients. Are you more cautious with this in the development or taking a look at the long-term complications? Do you have an algorithm you can mention? No, the question is very good and there is a doubt that everyone has in the whole world. I do not have an algorithm because for me closing fenestration has to de depends on the patient. We need to know if we uh, use uh, antiplatelet and then uh, anticoagulants or if we see the development and the follow-up, long-term follow-up, a lot of our patients so close the fenestration spontaneously. So 50% of patients have the fenestration closed. So then you have to ask yourself, why are you going to close a fenestration? If the patient is cyanotic and the cyanosis is persistent, probably the fenestration is necessary. So you have to do a complete evaluation of the patient and to see the hepatic function, the liver function, the, the stress test and do a good catheterization and you have to make a decision whether to close it or not. And it depends on the patient. You cannot do that as the Boston friends did and they say, okay, at the six months we're going to close the fenestration. No, I believe that is that will depend on each of the patients. If we close less, I believe it is because we're more cautious and some patients need that and some patients don't. So we have to identify those who do not need that. And I agree with what Lindsay said. There are some fenestrations that must be closed because the patient has a worse ex exercise capacity because they have an open fenestration that they don't need. But I hope, I, I wish, Hraska fenestrations are better tolerated and they allow for patients to have a better aerobic or exercise capacity because or to have a better preload but this is something that we cannot say and this is just my wish. Any other question? Yes, can I make a question? To Dr. Lince. In your experience in patients with the close of fenestration, in the long term follow up, how many months did you need to re fenestrate this, the circuit? We closed two and had to do a re fenestration of a plastic bronchitis in one case. You are afraid of doing this because they believe it, it is. It is very difficult to break the tubes. But for us, it was not, not very difficult. We did a perforation with a broken bird needle. And all the stents had to be fenestrated. Because as Dr. Alejandro and Dr. Graves said, at the beginning, we were less afraid and we closed more. And we had children with fenestration and catheterization and today we changed the paradigm because we're seeing that Fontan is palliative care, let's say, and they may have problems in the lymphatic system that is not infrequent, that we have enteropathies and bronchitis patients. And with Fontan with perfect numbers in the catheterization, we're okay, and Fontan sometimes does not work probably will have to implement even more studies of the lymphatic system for these patients to see which problems they have. But we could perform the fenestration and they were good. But the series are initial and they are very small children so we have to wait with time what happens. So we will have more failed fontans probably. But we will have to be very careful with these patients. Thank you very much. Last question, we are on time. For Alejandro, how are you Alejandro? The cardiac sequence, do you have any precaution? 
when the cardiac is very uh, the, the cardiac is very is very hard the heart rate is very high no we do not take into account the heart rate we do not perform with blockers it depends on the structure that you may see we try to focus the contrast in that structure and with the magnet turn of six seconds and with good use of contrast we can observe that the heart rate has not been a problem and we did not need to decrease it and in general it is not a problem as in some other methods for example the MRI or something in this case we did not have any problem and that is not a contraindication thank you very much Alejandro thank you very much for everything the presentations were excellent we're in time so we have to close the session thank you Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we start with a new session, a session that is always very interesting in the entire Congress. Uh, this is the nightmare cases. I wanted to go to the dictionary and say nightmare. In most cases, where uh, it usually refers to sleeping, uh, but we are usually very awake, and it's the serious and continuous uh, concern that somebody have may have due to an adversity is the other the definition that is away from the sleeping and we've all had uh, nightmare cases and it asks if we know that it uh, produces tachycardia tachycardia tachypnea uh, high blood pressure uh, sudoration, uh, sweating mouth dryness and the uh, raise of certain abdominal pelvian uh, organs to the cervical uh, region. I say this because we're uh, still early and it's just in a congress. But we know that uh, the courage is what helps us uh, overcome this adversity most of the times. We will listen now to the experience of five colleagues uh, of their uh, nightmare cases. Alejandro Peirone, my, my co-presenter, my co-moderator, is going to introduce them. Thank you, Luis, an excellent presentation. Uh, here for this nightmare cases we have uh, five Latin American uh, presenters with a lot of experience and we're going to enjoy a lot as we do always in these uh, sessions. We're first going to start with Professor Damski Barbosa in, uh, from Argentina. Afterward we'll have uh, Liliana Farrin from Corrientes with a uh, great experience and she's probably going to provide us with a great case. Then afterward, afterward, we will have Germán de Nestrosa from Favaloro Foundation in Buenos Aires, who will uh, have a very interesting case, I'm sure. Uh, next, we have, uh, even though we don't have uh, him connected, it's uh, Dr. Federico Borges from Venezuela. He's going to we're going to present his case, his selected case. And finally, we're going to have uh, Dr. João Luis Manica from Brazil, who's going to be the last presenter with uh, his nightmare case. So let's start with doctor uh, from Jesus Damski Barbosa. Okay, good luck to everyone. <coughs> good morning all. I'd like to thank uh, the scientific committee for inviting me to participate in this session where we're going to uh, tell you a little bit about the things that we do in the hemodynamics room. And this time what joins us is our nightmare case. I want to thank Dr. Jose Alonso and Dr. Alejandro Peirone, who uh, have done the greatest effort uh, to make this a reality. Okay, five-year-old patient with 35 kilos of weight, uh, gender male, and they had been uh, uh, had surgery for a post-surgical sur uh, sorry surgery for a subaortic VSD with a residual shunt. <coughs> they had been. Uh, the, this uh, patient had, been, uh, had, had surgery at two years old with the Gore-Tex patch with quilted points and after the procedure uh, they had a shot residual a few days later. 
The patient continued with a pulmonary hyperflow with signs of heart failure and we established a QPQS of 2.1 to 1. Okay, uh, we are asked to perform the procedure. Here we have the aortography. We can see perfectly the area of the patch. This is the area of the patch and the residual uh, shunt. And we measured with this channel uh, that had around 6 millimeters, both in the angiography as in the echo. Unfortunately, uh, our uh, backups, our backup hard drives were stolen, so we do not have uh, all of the images for this patient. Carrying, carrying on with the procedure, we uh, at that point we decided to uh, do a catheterization closure. Uh, we request uh, a Sira type, uh, LifeTech Sira type uh, device, type 3, gluter, 10 millimeters, and we said we're going to go in a strategy where we have a, a patch in an area, uh, so we went with a, an eccentric type 3. Uh, with 10 millimeters of diameter. First we look at the arteriovenous loop. We went with a snare type, a gooseneck, gooseneck type. And in the second one we see the, the arteriovenous uh, loop performed. And in the third we see the, the sheath going through a defect. Here we see um, the prosthesis was an eccentric prosthesis. Here we can see the, the mark pointing down. Its relation uh, with the aorta. We started going into that ventricular bag caused by the patch. We released the, the right disc. And once we released the right disc, we did all of the uh, necessary controls to uh, be able to to make sure that it was in condition and with no relation with the aortic valve. And you can see in the second image that the residual uh, shunt was minimal, so we were sure that we was we were okay. So we decided to release the prosthetics, the prosthesis. And we were satisfied with a procedure that had taken around 45 minutes. We had uh, considered the procedure finished. When everything was finished, happy, we were leaving home, we were going home. And uh, Dr. Jesus, the patient has a murmur. The nurse calls. The patient has a murmur, we said. Okay, this is a problem. Here's the devil sneaking in. We did a radioscopy and it definitely the prosthesis was gone. Here we have the oblique projections. And uh, this is the right side. So we went looking for it. With uh, 10 French sheaths. We see how we were able to uh, to lace it, we were able to snare it to take it to the lower cava and vena cava, and we were able to uh, take it perfectly in the sheath and pull it out. At that moment, we said, "Okay, what do we do?" Uh, we were there. We decided to use the same sheath with Sira uh, uh, with a larger device with a larger diameter. We weren't sure if. Uh, this was uh, if we were going to use the same prosthesis for with 10 millimeters or a larger diameter prosthesis. But since we were uh, in a <coughs> in a sac where we, we had uh, membranes, and so we decided to over uh, the stent. So we went with a 12 millimeter device. So we went. This is what we saw when we were going in and the uh, left ventricle it was very difficult to maneuver with the, with the sheath. Here we are positioning the right disc, as you see in the image. 
and when it was released here we can see the the final check we consider the procedure successful and the patient went home and 48 hours later there was an excellent uh, condition and the controls uh, this patient has been for a few years and uh, they have no residual the patient has no residual shunt so thank you very much Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizing committee. We're going to show you a challenging case in the middle of the pandemic. Our tick pathology, only congenital can we intervene. This was a female, a female patient, hypertens hypertense that had entered by our institution with a type B, our tick dissection, two stents were implanted, Hercules T of 32 by 160, from the origin of this left subclavian artery to the celiac trunk. <coughs> CTs, annual CTs were performed, and we see a leak of and an aneurysmatic sac of the artery. This was sealed with coils and vascular plaque. On June 23rd of uh, this year, enters the hospital of the area for hemoptysis franca and enlarged, uh, an enlarged mediastinum. We perform a CT and increase in diameter of the aneurysm with periprosthesis leak against the uh, bron the origin bronchite. <coughs> the patient enters uh, lucid and stable hemodynamically, but in the EKG, we see a periprosthesis leak, and in the contrast CT, we see contact with the left uh, bronchi origin. We rule out COVID-19 and the patient enters the cath lab and we see the periprosthetic leak to the thoracic area, dying with the contrast in hematoma. In the angiography jet, we can measure a diameter of the hole of 18 millimeters. So we decide to perform the implant of a, a closure of the uh, AST of 20 millimeters. Well, when we did the angiography, we saw that the contrast goes through the device. And there is no peri-device contrast. When we took the sheath, below the implanted device on a second uh, hole and we implant in this an unplatzer device of 10 millimeters. Again the angiographic control that shows a passage of contrast through the devices and not peri device around the device. We do a control and geography from the aortic arch that shows a decrease of the passage of contrast through it. <coughs> the CT at 24 hours shows passage still of the contrast through the devices, which can be evidenced here in this 3D reconstruction in which we we'll still see flow through them. In this CT, we can see that there is no passage of contrast in the devices that are well positioned. Both discs are aligned.
there is no connection, there seems to be a problem with the audio. We cannot listen to the speaker. Again, a 3D reconstruction. This CT was done at seven days. <coughs> and we can see both devices in perfect position without passage or leakage between them. The connection has been lost again. The same happens as we can see in these images. The patient evolved and was in good hemodynamics condition without hemoptysis. The CT of control does not show any flow of through the devices. The thoracic aorta continued of 85 millimeters without increase in the dia diameter and the pres presence of dissection, distal dissection in the abdominal aorta above the renal arteries up to the bifurcation and the start of the left iliac. We decide for discharge and a re-evaluation for the implant of a new stent as an out outpatient procedure. Is <coughs> okay? Deja de hablar. No sé si se le corta. The connection has been lost again with the speaker. We cannot listen to the speaker. Thank you very much for your attention. I wanted to show the effective resolution with a good work team, teamwork. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. We don't know when are we meeting right now. I want to thank the organization and uh, everyone who has decided that I should uh, present my nightmare case. <coughs> this is uh, something that I like uh, sharing these uh, cases where you feel that you not, don't know what to do and I think that it's a very important uh, learning moment uh, that we can learn and we can share things the way that they happen that you did not expect and uh, in my collective, in our collective experience, it's a, it's a great uh, pool of general wisdom. So I thank everyone for being part of this uh, organization, this congress that I love very much. And uh, I wish that I could see you personally and have a few beers, beers with all of you. So, okay. As you know, as I work in uh, a lot of foundation, and in this is my nightmare case. This is a 32-year-old patient who reached the cath lab to get a, an angioplasty or a graft, and with the intention of preparing a graft for a percutaneous uh, placement of a valve. So we implanted a, the idea was to implant a valve, a medity valve. 32-year-old patient was uh, had a as an operation as a child with a stenosis and a severe uh, ventricular uh, dysfunction and problems with the outflow tract. And we did a we did a work uh, sort of corrective surgery at 11 years old with a Rastelli and, and a homograft. They she spent uh, seven years without follow up. Then she appeared on the foundation uh, over the last uh, few years with a uh, critical stenosis of the homograft, arrhythmia, dyspnea, a functional class 3 or 4, and with a severe right ventricular dysfunction, which made it impossible almost to solve this surgery, surgically. The cardiologist who does uh, congenital cardiopathies uh, referred her to hemodynamics to try to alleviate this severe uh, the severe uh, ventricular dysfunction and if the anatomy allowed it and in, if she had a low gradient in both sides under 20 which is the, the objective that we had we would go th uh, through and place a melody valve when you have these kinds of patients you always remember the cases where you did not have any kind of success 
And this is uh, one of the cases that I showed you, uh, the calcification uh, grade degree of the graft. And we had no chance of doing anything, either surgical or percutaneous. We will never be able to go through this homograft, a balloon or a stent that was able to open it. This is the case that I'm telling you right now. This patient has a left ventriculography, uh, so you see uh, a residual DSD, and uh, so this, uh, this aorta, you have the classification of a pyramidal uh, shape with a distal stenosis, very severe distal stenosis, and the homograft, other than being uh, severely calcified, the stenosis is not just in the ductus, but also in the entry to the branches. So, since the graft was at 20, uh, it was 20, 21, we decided to go with safety measurement. We did the front temporal file, and I was concerned about the union of the graft and the pulmonary branches. As you can see here, where the, the arrow marks, we have a place where the stenosis uh, had a gradient of 80 to 90, 90 millimeters of mercury, it was a critical point. So in order to for us to, to have a better ease of mind, we decided to open the graph with a balloon, with a high pressure balloon, put the the more stable and safe uh, and safest uh, wire, and we didn't start with a lander, but we started with a numblats extractive, and we decided to move on forward a sheet to be able to access quickly. So this is a 10 French uh, sheath. So the way that we should do before uh, opening a, a graft, we need to check the possibility of coronary compression, especially with uh, patients with such an extension of the large vessels and where the grafts were put over the left coronary. We did a, a coronary angiography and we decided to use a crystal balloon, not an elastomeric. We because we're going to use a balloon that we're going to provide the same pressure that we're going to do to the stent in the end if we are able to place it. So, if, regardless of the brand that you have, we decided to use a Vaviloplasty balloon. With six atmospheres, the, the homograph opened correctly. We did not see any fractures that would uh, call uh, our attention, but we also did a another check to uh, check where the problem was. The problem was uh, with if we, the, the graft was uh, stenosed, was uh, thinned. The union of the graft had 20 years with uh, the left pulmonary uh, when you, there with an issue. And uh, we see a breakage of the graft, which seems uh, relatively controlled, but what we did was uh, quickly insert a stent, a CB stent, a cover, the CP stand, 39 millimeters long. We did not believe that it was long because as you see in the profile, we angled the, the woman. So if the stent is too long, the, the angling, you, we may have some issues with uh, the possibility of continuing to treat that graft. And in spite of being in a very difficult place, maybe the, the, the it would have been better to use another technique, but we were very comfortable with the position and with the absence of initial bleeding. What we did was try to uh, treat, continue treating that uh, homograft and the patient continued with uh, to still with uh, refractory uh, hypotension and, tachyca and tach tachycardia and uh, it required ionotropics. So we went with the second CP stand quickly, a 45 millimeter distal from the initial stand, trying to cover as much uh, the largest portion of a calcified uh, whole graft and this gave us a certain stability that lasted for around 30 minutes. After 30 minutes of uh, recovery with trop uh, tropics with uh, drugs with blood, we realized that the patient was bleeding somewhere which, which we could not find. And what we did was uh, ask uh, people with a uh, cardiovascular surgery, and they said that if there's uh, an issue and a, a stent is broken, then cover it and plug it with a stent. 
We went with another stent, a little bit more distally, because we saw, thought that the lesion of the homograft could be in anywhere that uh, we had mm -hmm. calcium. And we placed the third stent, but uh, now without, uh, with no possibility of recovery in spite of the drugs, in spite of the, the bleeding of uh, providing fluids. And we found in the evaluation of the thoracic echo that we have a massive uh, level of blood in the left hematorex. In spite of the stent that closed mostly most of the part of the calcified st uh, uh, graft, so we saw where could this patient be bleeding. So we did a new angiography, almost in uh, permanent uh, arrest, and we found that laterally to the second stent, where there was no uh, bleeding, we still found a blood loss. So we placed a fourth, fourth CP stent which could have been the, in which we could have had the, the close, the breakage place uh, with the second stand, but with CP, uh, with advanced CP uh, maneuvers. This was starting to become an eternal nightmare. We had uh, over two hours and a half of treatment, and we found no response in the patient. We found no response on the stand placement, and after three hours of treatment, four stents, and uh, the first CP stand implanted. You see how we found that uh, one of the grafts was broken, not only distally, but also proximally. It broke uh, because of the pressure that we they inflated the balloons, it broke because of the CPR, it broke because there it was uh, 20 years without a follow-up, and it was going to break regardless of what we did, and see how after we battled, and we looked for a thousand options not only in covering these uh, fractures that in this case uh, there was no way of recovering the patient and the patient died over three hours later after starting the procedure. <coughs> What's the message? Which are the conclusions that we can get from all of this? Uh, if we're going to face a patient with a severely calcified mm -hmm. uh, homograft the, me the preventative measures need to be extreme. I was thinking about this case for a long, long time, and uh, the first thing is that to have ECMO stand standing by in the in the room, this is an option. If we have it, you need to use it. The <laughs> second is to have a transeptal sheath, a 14 French, with a stand mounted on the on the uh, TS, on the RVOT in parallel. The third, the <laughs> third thing is to have a, a lander type a wire or a similar in another branch. Four is to impact a covered uh, stent before the coronary test uh, with the balloon smaller to the homograph. And fifth, to uh, think initially in a hybrid procedure with a previous femoral annulation. So this was a, a real nightmare case. I thank you all for your attention and thank you everybody and hope to see you all very soon. I just got the, the nick of time. Thank you for your attention. First of all, I would like to thank Solasi for the invitation to participate in this conference. This first, this is a nightmare case. The problem that we always have is related to the VST. This is a teenager with a big VSD with an aneurysm 18 millimeters and we decided to place a needle occluder coil that is of control release with fibers to control the amount of blood. It was the typical placement. There was a residual shunt that we tend to see in these types of coils. So expected was it was a successful after placement, two or three after or hours after. There is an embolism, hematuria, a low fever, and at 24 hours we lost 8 uh, grams of milligrams of hemoglobin. We place another coil in this residual part in the superior area of this coil. You can see that there was a passage or a connection because the VSE was very big. So we decided to enter there and place a second coil. First of all, we needed to place to go through the uh, hole 
these are very difficult to go through. We place the guide with a catheter to the right ventricle and trying to negotiate our way to the of the catheter to place the second coil. The decision of placing the second coil was a ductus coil, need occluder as well, but of the ductus arteriosus of control uh, release but without fiber. We try to negotiate our, our way and what tends to happen is that sometimes we lose the, the path and we restart to look for the route again and try to move through the uh, small BSD that we found. We could place a second wire to have a better support for the passage of the catheter on the right ventricle. This was very good so far. And then we place a second coil for extra passage in the res uh, that we have had and the, in the residual shunt. And the fibers were very uh, useful. In our case materials, we had some 3% uh, of embolism that was sold in the first two to three days or we place a coil such as this if the embolism was important. You can see the second coil from the right ventricle. It is a coil of a ductus arteriosus and the catheter was a bit within the right ventricle and you can see that the tip of that coil seemed to have to be fixed in the base of the right ventricle. So we decided to deploy the coil upwards trying to obliterate this hole to stop the hemolysis. Always guided with the imaging that said that the amount of the shunt that saw had been reduced. So we had it deployed, we thought this last loop in the left ventricle would make the coil work and as the echographist said that the shunt had decreased significantly we were not worried about the possibility of having a problem. While we released it, here we have the first problem. It goes to the tip of the right ventricle and it was stuck in there, in the cordae tendine, and it was strong enough to take a needle occluder PDA coil and move it of an intermediate uh, strength. And what is the decision that we have to do? We have a patient that continues with hemolysis and a migrated coil in the ventricular uh, po point. What is our most important problem? We had to stop hemolysis or the patient would uh, end up in surgery. And the coil that we had in the tip of the right ventricle, we had to find a way to solve this after that. So we decided to place a second coil of ductus arteriosus, nine by six, need occluder of intermediate strength and this is what we did so we took more coil you can see the retrograde uh, access that we're having for the coil the small part was uh, to the back here we have a lot of material in the aneurysm or the tip of the right ventricle and we were looking for the end to be in the left ventricle here we see the end in the left ventricle and our echographist, who has always been our greatest guide, say, okay, now we have a small insufficiency of the aorta. We do not see a significant um, shunt, residual shunt in the VSD. But there is a maneuver that is placing a pigtail, putting the, the coil in the upper part of the aorta. And in that way, the coil could reformulate and we also stop the aortic regurgitation. Now we had to retrieve the needle occluder that was migrated. We could conclude with that and the nightmare stopped there. This relationship of t this time of 10 minutes, this presentation of 10 minutes was represented two to three hours of discussions about what were, we were going to do with this procedure. This was a very awful nightmare, but with a, a successful resolution, the tricuspid and the aorta remained without lesions and the evolution of the patient was very favorable. Olá, very bom dia. Meu nome é João Mânica, sou cardiologista intervencionista 
especializada em doenças cardíacas congênitas, trabalho entre outros hospitais, no Hospital Munhoz de Vento de Porto Alegre. Agradeço o convite à comissão organizadora do Congresso, esperamos que o ano que vem uh, todos possamos se encontrar fisicamente no Congresso de 2022. Então, eu vou apresentar o, o Nightmare Session. O paciente tem 52 anos, é um paciente um pouco diferente do que a gente está habituado a, a lidar no nosso dia a dia, um paciente com obesidade mórbida, tem, tinha 216 quilos na época, casado, um filho de 12 anos, e foi submetido, então, em 2017, a uma cirurgia bariátrica com a técnica de sleeve gástrico. Quatro dias após a alta dessa cirurgia do estômago, ele desenvolveu uma deiscência da ferida operatória e percebeu drenagem de comida pela pele. Né? Ele percebeu isso quando ele comeu um picolé de uva e saiu pela pele da região uh, abdominal. Além disso, começou com uma importante dor no ombro, no ombro esquerdo. Foi então diagnosticado uma fístula gástrica. Deixa eu passar aqui. Então, a partir de então, o, o nightmare do nosso paciente começou e continuou até duas semanas atrás, em 2021. Então, esse nightmare de, de hoje vai, será um nightmare do paciente, uma resolução um pouco diferente do habitual. Em 2017, para vocês terem ideia do que passou esse paciente, ele teve hospitalização prolongada com diversos procedimentos uh, de tentativa de fechamento da fístula, como inserção, remoção de endoprótese, fistulostomia, injeção de tício, surgisis, que é um biological graft, clipes metálicos e números sem sucesso. Em 2018, ele foi submetido a 12 endoscopias digestivas altas, também uma pro, uh, internação hospitalar prolongada, fizeram inúmeras coagulações com argônio por endoscopia, também para tentativa de cicatrização sem sucesso, foi então inserido um catéter pigteio, né, para manter essa colisão subfrênica drenada. Em 2019, outros diferentes procedimentos tentando ocluir sem sucesso a fístula gástrica, como curativos a vácuo, double pigteio na na coleção subfrênica e outros inúmeros diferentes procedimentos, todos sem sucesso. Em 2020, ele foi hospitalizado por uma sepsis severa, um quadro grave, também recebeu inúmeros procedimentos com argônio e, pelo meio de 2020, ele conseguiu, pela primeira vez desde 2017, cicatrizar a sua fístula e voltar a ter uma ingestão oral, que ocorreu por oito meses. Em 2021, entretanto, a fístula recorreu, e o nightmare do nosso paciente também. Em resumo, de 2017 a 2021, né, exceto por oito meses de ingestão oral, no, que, foram em dois, que aconteceu em 2020, o nosso paciente permaneceu quase quatro anos de nutrição parenteral e nutrição nasoenteral, sem ingerir nada por via oral. Foram dois anos de internação hospitalar, mais de 20 tomografias abdominais. Esse paciente uh, me referiu, há duas semanas atrás, que ele não teve vida matrimonial, não teve vida de pai com seu filho de 12 anos, não teve vida profissional, nem mesmo vida social, durante todos esses quatro anos de luta contra a sua fístula gástrica. Então esse, na verdade, é o nightmare de hoje, é o nightmare do nosso paciente. A literatura, até 2009, nos mostrava apenas dois casos de fechamento de fístula gástrica utilizando o oclusor cardíaco. Em 2019, foi então publicado uma, um estudo multicêntrico com 40 casos de oclusão liderados por um colega de São Paulo. 
o procedimento de intenção, então, foi a oclusão da fístula gástrica com o oclusor cardíaco. Vocês podem notar aqui a cara ou a face de desespero do cardiologista e intervencionista realizando endoscopia digestiva. Aqui a duodenoscopia, a imagem, mostrando então o orifício de entrada da fístula, que apresentava aproximadamente 4 milímetros. Esse orifício foi canulado, então, com papilótomo, pelo gastroenterologista, obviamente, pelo qual foi injetado o contraste. Então, vocês notem aqui, senhores, que a fístula tinha um trajeto tuneliforme no início, de aproximadamente 10 milímetros de comprimento, depois ela abria para um, para um início de coleção e depois uma grande coleção subfrênica, onde vocês podem ver aqui o pigtail inserido. Bom, a partir desse papilótomo foi inserido uma guia, que é habitualmente utilizada pelos endoscopistas, né, por duodenoscopia, com, uh, é, é através do duodenoscópio que a gente consegue inserir essa guia. Essa guia foi colocada dentro da coleção e o duodenoscópio foi removido. Ele tinha que ser removido porque o duodenoscópio é muito mais comprido que o nosso sistema de liberação. Nosso sistema de liberação de 120 centímetros, mais ou menos, o duodenoscópio tem quase 2 metros. Então, removemos o duodenoscópio. Entretanto, quando fomos passar o sistema de liberação do dispositivo, essa guia se mostrou muito mole, pouco suporte para cruzar o defeito diminuto, né, com várias curvas. Então, a gente ficou com o sistema de liberação aqui sem conseguir cruzar o defeito com a utilização dessa guia. Então, a, o que fizemos foi uh, recolocar o, o duodenoscópio, recolocar o papilótomo e, a partir daí, colocar uma guia extra stiff amplex que a gente habitualmente utiliza nas oclusões e, a partir daí, então, conseguimos cruzar facilmente o, o defeito com o sistema de liberação. Devido à forma do defeito tuleriforme, um pouco mais longa, nós optamos por utilizar um dispositivo de CIV. Então, aqui a gente já cruzou todo o defeito, já estamos lá naquela parte, daquela coleção mais, uh, mais uh, avantajada. É, o sistema de liberação está bem posicionado. Vou passar aqui. Então, optamos por utilizar um dispositivo de CIV, 8 milímetros, da Oclutec, Aqui eu coloquei ele nessa porção menor da coleção, ele ficou bem apertado, vocês notam que o disco esquerdo não está completamente aberto, ele está bem apertado. E com o, o duodenoscópio ao lado da, do sistema de liberação, a gente controlou a liberação e o aspecto dele na mucosa gástrica. Ele ficou muito bem posicionado. Aqui vocês podem ver a, a, o, o abscesso subfrênico, o um corte tomográfico, mostrando um abscesso importante antes do procedimento. E a tomografia, três dias após, a, após o procedimento, mostrando uma regressão quase completa do abscesso. Importante regressão e melhora do aspecto tomográfico da, da coleção subfrênica. O paciente retornou via oral sete dias após o procedimento e teve alta 10 dias após o procedimento. Esse aqui é o e-mail do, do paciente agradecendo, então, a, a equipe de proporcionar a oportunidade de continuar nesse mundo, ser feliz com minha família e ver meu filho crescer. Foi, foi muito gratificante, porque a gente não tem ideia o sofrimento desse paciente durante esses quatro anos. Né? Ele comenta que quando tudo começou, o filho dele era um adolescente muito jovem e durante esses quatro anos que ele não conseguiu acompanhar o crescimento, o seu filho já estava bem maior, já com 16 anos e agora ele vai ter a oportunidade, provavelmente, de, de seguir uma vida de pai, uma vida de família mais adequada. Queria agradecer, né, um agradecimento especial ao Dr. Nelson Coelho, 
gastroenterologista que assumiu essa batalha, que passar, esse paciente passou por inúmeros colegas de várias cidades do Brasil, e ele assumiu, e ele que teve a, a ideia de, de realizar esse tratamento e acabou entrando em contato comigo para a gente fazer, e a todo o, o staff do laboratório de hemodinâmica do Hospital Luiz de Vento. Muito obrigado. Ok, we're back. Luiz, uh, these uh, have been uh, presentations of the nightmare cases. Amazing, very information, very, very informative. And we have really learned. Do you think that we could open the discussion and some additional comments? Of course. <coughs> We've had, uh, we have Juan Pablo Sandoval and Fernando here, if any of you uh, can start with any of the questions. Hello, uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this forum. I was uh, thrilled by the diversity of topics that the nightmare case is involved. Uh, I imagine having been there, it's uh, dedication and you can see the dedication and the work and what keeps the, the adrenaline high in the adverse moments. So my question is uh, directed to Herman, which is a situation that may happen to any of us and that uh, have uh, had to intervene in prosthetic uh, ducts, uh, calcified prosthetic ducts we're trying to place a uh, pulmonary prosthetics prosthesis sorry and if you had had a, a favorable uh, response from your surgeon to get this patient to before the, the placement of the stents i understand that for them it might be an adverse situation and sometimes the situation is contained and you can take them to the or and it's probably a better chance uh, what what was the reason not to take the patient to surgery When we saw the first rupture, that was a contained rupture, the patient hemodynamically was already uh, in a bad condition, so we had no chance of not having to solve it there. And the, the mistake that uh, we made was that uh, because we faced many uh, patients with, a homo, with calcified homografts with possibility of fractures, most of them are controlled, and even uh, we had a, we, even with bleeding to the mediastinum, and we need to know that it might fracture, it might fracture into a thousand pieces. So you can do two things: either you don't do anything, and the other thing is to use a 14 French transeptal sheath on one branch and put the the wi the wire uh, on the other one. So on that transeptal sheath, you should have a stent loaded, even if it is in the lower vena cava. That may have been the mistake that we, the first mistake that we had. That we didn't think that the rupture in this woman would have been dramatic because the time that we, that it took to uh, place the stent, to take the stent to that place and to put it in, uh, we think that that was precious time that we wasted uh, um, in solving the problem. So there's no time to call the surgeon. Well, maybe there is, but uh, we need to see which were our alternatives. But once the graft is broken, the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then it's not at all prudent to uh, to not solve it in the hemodynamics room. So in another case, we had a patient who was pretty stable, even though we had a continued bleeding, we had the, the cardiovascular surgery team next to us in their room, and we told them, uh, put them in ECMO because I don't think that the bleeding is controlled. Yeah, but it's alive, it has a anisotropically stable and we stopped bleeding and the surgeons thought that it was not appropriate to put the patient in ECMO, so we insisted on treating this uh, in our way. But I don't think that in that case it was not, a, I don't think that in that case it was a good idea to call the surgeon. I want to add a comment here. Uh, because I would probably prepare it with a closed stent. 
having it in a lower vena cava, but what was the degree of calcification? Because well, how, why would you do it like that? I mean, what's the degree of calcification that you would need to have to have a stent ready like that? What I think that if the patient has is an adult, they have we have faced plenty of calcified stents the, in the teenager patients that uh, had uh, controlled breakages. But when the homograft is over 10 years old and has a calcification degree uh, from moderate to severe, but the patient is old, then you need to spend whatever it, it needs to have two femoral uh, accesses and two wires and I was talking to Jesus about a patient that we were going to work together and I had a patient that if I see this I, I put in a sheath and I inflate the balloon with the sheath on the side because it doesn't matter because the sheath does not complicate the procedure if you inflate it because what, what you can't do is go and open the stents without checking the coronaries and you cannot try uh, treat the stent with a balloon that it's not going to reach the, the final diameter that you need. So maybe you need a 24, you open it too much, or with a balloon of a uh, valvuloplasty balloon, if you want to go to 18 and 20, it cuts the circulation and the coronary collapses. So you need to make sure what you're going to use to place the stent, but you need to have another loaded uh, distal, uh, on a distal uh, sheath. I, uh, that's, this is the way that I think that, how would I do it again? Because uh, I might have to do it again and it's horrible to place a stent and see that there's a continuous uh, bleeding and another one and uh, bleeding and uh, more stents and bleeding and I don't know if you agree with this technique but the other thing that we could do is uh, with the melody, the melody was has a very novel uh, system which is called the ensemble which uh, it travels very smoothly and we could use that uh, because the problem is, uh, what's the problem? When it's bleeding, you always uh, find uh, different uh, difficulties. The sheath uh, gets kinked, the stand has issues. So we ha were having an active bleeding to the mediastinum. We took three minutes, but it, they were bleeding to the mediastinus, so, mediastinum. So I think that this is the best way to treat a dramatic injury like this one, a dramatic lesion. If uh, there's no bleeding, we, we can take all the time in the world, but we need it to be fast. Ale, uh, thank you, Herman. I really value, uh, I know that many other cases you've had a happy ending, and usually nightmare cases or nightmare cases have a happy ending, but it's a uh, very brave, your, your, um, I really value your attitude in, in submitting this case. My question now is for Joaco. Jo and uh, this is, I had a tracheoesophageal uh, issue after a, an abdominal surgery. And uh, the issue that we had, and this case was similar to yours, and the problem that we had was to select the device and the size of the device. Uh, Joe, are you here? Yes, yes I am. We had a case of a similar type. We had a tracheoesophagic uh, uh, fistula after an abdominal surgery. And the patient had mediastinitis. So, and uh, the man was uh, emaciated. And what we did was, uh, through a digestive way, we, catheter uh, we did the catheterization of the fistula and we did a loop to the airway uh, between the mouth and uh, the, the the sinuses, the, the sinuses. So my question is, uh, how did you decide to use uh, a VSD device of 18 millimeters? In our, this patient, we used a vascular uh, access. It was not the best device. Vascular uh, device that was not placed. Uh, we had to rescue and use a ASD device, which was much larger than the one that uh, we had defined initially to have a grip both on the, the airway as in the digestive uh, way. Just out of curiosity, how did you receive, decide the device Gracias, and the size? Alejandro. Uh, 
vou falar em português. É muito difícil essa escolha porque uh, a literatura é escassa e a grande série de escrita não, não, não falava em quais dispositivos utilizados. Uh, o que me atentou no momento é que havia um trajeto tuneliforme razoavelmente longo, é, de uns 8 milímetros, e eu achei que um dispositivo de C&A, os discos ficariam muito deformados pela proximidade dos discos, e o, disco de, o, o dispositivo de C&V, por ter mais ou menos 7 milímetros de, de, de distância entre os discos, ficaria, né, quedaria mais confortável. Essa foi a decisão, eu fiquei muito preocupado porque era um, um, um defeito pequeno também, de 3, 4 milímetros, não quis botar um menor para não embolizar, mas é, não existe regra, não tem, é, a gente tem que usar um pouco a criatividade e, e obviamente, a, o quadro desesperador do paciente, infelizmente, nos encoraja a, a fazer esse tipo de procedimento, porque ele não tinha outra saída. Então, uh, 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 acho que aquilo, mas não, não existe uma regra, talvez um dispositivo de C&A, né? a tomografia de controle mostrou o dispositivo no local, sem embolização, mas enfim, a gente não sabe nem como vai prosseguir isso. Né? Ok, perfeito. Uma outra pergunta, Luiz? Oscar Fernandez is a panelist, is over there. I don't know if he wants to uh, ask or make a comment. Yes, uh, hello Oscar. How are you? Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the, the organization, uh, the organizers of the event. Alejandro for all the effort and all of you, the presenters for all of the efforts. Uh, sorry, and the rest of the sorry, the rest of the committee, to the, the effort that you made to make this uh, Solasi come true. My question is for Jose. Sorry, for Jesus. Jesus. Nobody likes to see when things uh, go out of hand. Uh, now, looking at this uh, in a retrospective, the embolization of that device, uh, what, what's your analysis of the causes of that embolization? Yes, uh, unfortunately, I said about the, the echoes, because in the echo we saw that when we removed the prosthesis, we saw that the device was like laying down. We saw that it was uh, laying down. And we believe that it was the reason because we had a, with a slight prolapse of that uh, left disc in that channel. So this is the reason of the embolization. And the fact is that when we place the larger device, if you look at the image clearly, it's more vertical, it's less horizontal, not as horizontal as the other one that we have. So when we over uh, on the area, it's clearly an area that we can over distend, that that's a patch, there's no conductive tissue. So it was uh, more vertical, it was uh, better positioned, so this patient could, uh, could have a better result. The thing about the happy ending, Alejandro, it all depends on how. Because that day I had to meet with my wife and I wasn't able to. <laughs> I just uh, I was talking about the patient, just just that. I want to ask uh, something, uh, Lilian to Liliana. Uh, there is no sound. Okay, you cannot hear you, Luis. Uh, you are muted. Lilian, I wanted to ask if the second hole you saw it after plugging the first or if you knew already that you had two holes. No, we saw the second hole when the sheath was removed after releasing the first device. The sheath automatically uh, fell in that hole. 
Uh, have you seen this uh, described? Any other similar cases? There are similar cases, yes. Described, uh, published, yes. It's a very interesting case, a uh, difficult case. Uh, amazing, spectacular. They are assessing if they are going to place uh, an endoprothesis, a uh, thoracic abdominal uh, stent, and because it, the patient has an aneurysm in the distal part in the bifurcation, so the patient is going to be assessed to see if they're going to uh, put a stent. Okay, anybody wants to ask another question? Jose, a comment? I see you over there. Yes, congratulations on your presentations uh, to continue with Liliana. It's a very complicated case. My question is destined to what was how was the, the choice of the device? Uh, why why filling the aneurysm and covering the mouth the, the mouth? Because we had uh, active bleeding, in spite it, that it wasn't what we expected and the orifice, the aneurysm was 88, uh, so it was very large to try to plug it, and the hole was uh, very de well delimited. So the implant of both uh, prosthesis, which was what we had in our bank, so to say it like that, if we had any availability, we maybe could have used. Uh, with a be better different prosthesis but we had uh, these uh, sizes that were adapted uh, correctly to, to this patient and what I was going to ask you that uh, you already saw it that uh, what was the step forward the steps forward for the patient yes the patient continued stable the CTs the control CTs after a week did not show any more bleeding and the uh, yeah, aneurysm uh, diameter and the hematoma diameter remains the same and they are assessing uh, to see if we are going to place another stent. Thank you. This has been a very interesting uh, panel. We have some time left but we see nobody raising their hands. I see no questions on the chat, the chat room. Uh, so Luis, what do you think if we start closing the panel? Yes, this have been uh, spectacular presentations. I don't know if uh, I think that we continue here. Well, maybe not, but but we're going to have a break until six. That we have the final session of the congress, right? Correct. Yes, we can go shopping now. We can go to the mall. So the final session is going to close. Everything is going to be uh, for ventricular, uh, interventricular complications. Uh, so we can start the final session. Thank you, Luis, and thank you, everyone.
Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start with the last session we have today in our Congress. It is about a very interesting topic for a lot of us. The ventricular septal defect closure, déjà vu. The speakers we have today are experts in this field, so it is an honor for us having them here. We'll start with Dr. Federico Borges. Unfortunately, he won't be available for the questions because he's having an internet connection problem. Then we have Jesus Damsky Barbosa, Dr. Jose Pivernus from Garrahan Hospital, and Warakam Propham, who will end the session. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this conference. It is great for us having uh, been here with our friends in this virtual Congress. And I'm, I'm so sorry we cannot be together physically. In this opportunity, we're going to talk about the prolapse of the uh, aortic semilunar with the uh, VSD. Is it contraindicated? Is the closure contraindicated? These are challenges when we have a prolapse of this type. If we go to the guidelines, the guidelines say that the closure of the this is uh, can be of a 2B. It is not 100% affected. But no one talks about the different variants of the different SVSCs. There are several types. With aneurysm, without aneurysm, the subaortic one that is uh, pressuring the semilunar to the orifice. If in the orifice of the VSD we have this, that is very challenging. We're going to check the literature. We did our study in the 2016, and if we had a VSD with a prolapse of the aortic um, semilunar and we try to do a closure, we could try and we, we could try in 64 cases, but we could only close one, for example. It is very difficult to close a VSD that has a semilunar aortic. This was in 2016. Now, a lot of time after that, we have managed to see some interesting things. There is some other article, this one about the VSD closure in more than 400 cases of the VSD without mentioning the prolapse, prolapse of the aortic semilunar or the variants for their closure. So we go back to the same. We do not have a lot of information. This is a Chinese article and we have that they close VSDs that, that have some, some complications. For doubly committed subarterial and ventricular septal defect in these types of VSDs. Here what we had should see is whether if they are double committed VSDs, if there is obstruction of the catheterization, for example, and move that to what we have. It is very difficult to know if we have all of the characteristics to be certain about these procedures. What tends to happen after uh, this uh, semilunar within the VSC, they can rupture. So this is a very a different uh, scenario. But we have the aortic semilunar as being part of the orifice. You can see the aortic semilunar in here. And we cannot see the orifice, the, um, the total amount of this aortic semilunar and deformed within the orifice. It is very difficult to know the measure of the VSD for this type of case. In this case, we have the same. The aortic semilunar, with another view, is within the right ventricle. And we see the catheter, when the catheter moves through the orifice, that orifice that is very small initially 
after the catheter has been placed, it obliterates the aortic semilunar and it increases the amount of the real orifice. It continues to be um, larger than we see in the echo. And if we move with the catheter, we would see that the orifice is bigger. This is placing a device and the device after we place it in this type of patient to this VSD um, size that we have uh, seen goes through without releasing it. The problem is well, it's knowing what is the size of it and which device we're going to choose to the aorta and how we're going to anchor this. In a case in the catheterization, we have a deformity of the semilunar and you can see you can see what appears to be a very small orifice and the semilunar lunar is part of the orifice this is we can measure the vsd it seems to be small but truth is that this semilunar within the orifice is what we see is the vsd and we're not sure which device we're going to use in this patient this is the same patient and we can see how the mammary catheter moves a little, the semilunar one, and when we're going to measure, the VSD was larger than we had thought and we're not 100% sure if we could do a traction, of, a traction of the semilunar valve. We thought it was a very small uh, VSD. This is the catheter sign with this VSD that is small. Sometimes we have very long parts we tend to place the, the end and the guide enters after that. The catheter could not enter through this VSC and when we go to the orifice and it rotates, it moves up the semilunar and goes to the right ventriculum. Ventricle. We thought that the VSD was small, the orifice was small, but it is not small at all. So we're going to have a VSD that is larger than we had thought about. So we will have to see how we're going to move through that. We can see this in the uh, ana an pathological anatomy of the right coronary from the right left ventricle, the aorta, and looking at the semilunar valve, we see the stylet making this uh, semilunar enter the VSD. The VSD is at the back and it is bigger than we had thought and we have to place the semilunar within the orifice. That, that is what happens with echo and catheterization. This will obliterate part of the orifice and the posterior orifice, we will be able to see the, this, the real size of it. Part of this semilunar may be adhered and may, we may not be able to move it and we cannot know the real uh, size of the VSD in surgery. We can see a prolapse of the VSD and at the end you can see the semilunar valve obliterating part of the orifice. This is an injection with a deformity of the aorta to the semilunar valve. Uh, it appeared to be a VSD that it was small, we placed a device and after placing the nightmare of all interventionists, it does not have a support, you have to retrieve and you have to make decisions on about what we're going to do. Maybe we can pass a balloon to insert it within the semilunar, within the VSD, and push this semilunar valve to the aorta. And trying to inflate this balloon to have a real measurement of the VSD so that we can choose the proper device of a different size that should be bigger for us to be able to decide what to place and how to obliterate this. This is the second device that was larger and it is uh, on top of the semilunar valve and it does not have any support to, to stay there. So we could not close that VSD. Residual shunt in the upper portion of the device. This made us retrieve it and not leaving it there. A VSD that is uh, and the aorta is rising over the VSD 
with a name complete aneurysm. This VSD had an incomplete aneurysm. We had a sac there with the contrast, retaining the contrast. This passage is what made us think that when we have aneurysms, uh, can make it difficult for us to place the device. So first tip or detail we need to take into account. If we have an aneurysm, the aneurysm protects the, the closure. And if we have both of these conditions, we, had, we have more than 90% of cases of uh, having a, a good result. One in 64 cases. This is very difficult to place, but after this, we have a complete puncture. So the detail is whether we have aneurysm or not. In these uh, images, it is not easy to see if the semilunar is prolapsed or not. But if we see it in detail, we can see that it forms a, a, a cone within the VSD. That is the cone that we have here. Small details are very important in this case. We had that VSD and this ductus arteriosus that was tubular. The decision was to place a device, an asymmetrical, asymmetrical one, and after that, closing the ductus as well. This device falls within that posterior aneurysm. We had to entangle that and place a, um, a guide, an open guide, from the left ventricle. Then we took it out. We retrieved the device that had migrated. It was not occluding the VSD. We could retrieve that device from the position. And then we know that the VSD is larger. So we go with a four millimeters longer uh, device and we place it within that pseudo aneurysm trying to occlude the, the mouth, let's say, and not the left, the right ventricle on top of the aneurysm. With that, we had a complete occlusion of the VSD and we have again a VSD with the aorta rising over it. Then we went to the ductus arteriosus. We have the, the VSD device placed and in the ductus arteriosus, we placed a coil and an occluder for the shunt. Another detail of the VSD and aneurysm. This aneurysm in the VSD, if we see the semilunar, the semilunar is within this aneurysm, but below that we have an aneurysm that is very good to enter without taking into account the aorta, that the aorta will be on top and placing on the aorta, we can close completely the VSD. The aneurysm gives us an advantage of a 90% of more probabilities of closing the completely the VSC. So the aortic semilunar valve, instead, uh, uh, although it is not in a good shape, we can solve this problem in these types of patients. The rupture of the Valsalva sinus. We have a shunt of the VSC and over the aorta. We had the semilunar one. We had one in systole, one in diastole. The rupture of the sinus of Valsalva facilitates the closure of a VSD that is prolapsed because we enter from the aorta through that rupture and we place the device within the rupture of the sinus of Valsalva, occluding at the same time the VSD with a device, a ductus device or with a muscular VSD device. In this case, we have the result. We had a residual shunt, but thanks to the device, after some days we did not have any more a shunt and the problem was solved. So the rupture of the sinus of, of Valsalva for us in the cath lab it facilitates the possibility of closure. And we can draw some conclusions from here. If we have a semilunar valve prolapse with VSD, 
and if that has an aneurysm, the aneurysm makes it easier for us to close the VST and to have a successful result in more than 90% of the cases. And if we, when it ruptures, we go to a different patient and that makes the closure easier. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everyone. <coughs> I would like to thank the scientific committee for letting me participate in this session. And I would like to talk about uh, closing BSDs in children uh, with less than 10 kilos. And if we look for information, we don't have that much information there uh, for this kind of population, unlike with other BSDs. Uh, this is my, conf my disclosures. Uh, in 2014, we did my first VSD closure with a patient with 4.4 uh, 4, uh, 4 kilos, had a, a ventricular, uh, mid-muscular mid VSD. The, the patient was removed from the complex surgery list. So we did the, our first procedure. Here you can see the measurement of the VSD. And uh, there was a... And so th this was very uh, kind of complex. The echo here we have, and where we see the VSD, the ventricular VSD. And when we do the arterial venous uh, loop, then we did the uh, seven millimeter with the VSD. We put in a muscular uh, seven millimeter. Life tech occluder with a seven uh, sheet, seven French sheet. We did it uh, approaching it through the femoral vein, and here we have the final control with a residual uh, shunt. And our patient, since uh, she was our first case, uh, she was uh, hospitalized for 48 hours and was discharged with no patency. And to date, the, the patient has had no complications and the VSD is completely closed. This encouraged us to continue studying these kinds of patients. We were able to start uh, seeing information. We had uh, one of the most important cases, this is a hijasis case, and we see eight uh, patients. One was uh, frustrated. We do not uh, make a hybrid uh, Treatments, but the, the, what they did in this uh, work was uh, arterial venous uh, access. But the things that they did it through endovascular uh, access. But you need to see that the smallest uh, patient was 3.2 kilograms. Another uh, work that I think that is very important is that says that if we have, uh, if we take the way that we need to look at our patients, it's a, a work by uh, Rauconetti and Kureshi, and if we have a patient with a median of 4.5 kilos, we have uh, multiple classes, uh, and uh, they uh, suggest a transeptal puncture. In this way, they avoid the uh, arterial puncture. Here we have another case uh, where we see how uh, they cross the foramen valve and they cross the VSD and they put the guide on both uh, sides the different positions and to be able to place the corresponding processes and this, they did what they call the transeptal anterograde they opened the right disc first and the second and the left disc second for our way of thinking this work was very important because it uh, started showing us a way. Another very important work is uh, that is similar as for the type of procedure was and, and the access. This was this work by Sardner, uh, where they they work on patients under 20 kilos, and they do uh, also the arterial venous loop. And uh, this is what they call uh, the anterograde uh, transeptal access. We went there, and which are our reflections? The, it's possible to do a VSD closure in patients under 10 kilos, either through an endovascular or hybrid access. Uh, we, did, we, threw, uh, we can avoid the uh, arterial approach, and we can deploy, it, deploy the prosthesis through inantegrated transeptal access, or 
with a Venus Venus loop. So this is why we got, we decided to uh, continue with our experience. This is an important patient, six months of age, six kilos, three hundred uh, grams. A male had been uh, had surgery and did not have a, did, and had an undiagnosed apical BSD. Here we can see in the echo. Uh, the echo we see the the, v, the BSD with a BSD that was a six millimeter BSD. Uh, it was a long one. And we uh, went through a venovenous loop, crossing the foramen ovale. We went through the VSD, and from jugular we looped and uh, went uh, created a venovenous loop. And here, always the bush on the sheath needs to be more than much more than the traction. The pushing is more than traction because we need to remember that. We are need to cross the mitral valve, so it's more pushing than pulling back in order to achieve the loop, the venous 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 loop. Then we leave a catheter in the left ventricle for control. We did a doctor's prosthesis. We used to have work with Life Tech at that point. Since this is a muscular VSD in the in the tip, uh, we had no problems on the distension. And it was perfect, the results uh, were perfect. Uh, here we see the, the follow-up, this case was published. And the patient remained in good general condition and went home in a perfect condition. And no problems from the surgical leg or the VSD leg. Another experience is another one with uh, 20 patients, all of them with fa uh, heart failure. Uh, different. We looked for patients who were with actual heart failure and with difficulties for our surgeons. And here we have uh, the smallest patient was uh, 2 kilos, 900 grams, up to 10 kilos. The gender distribution was uh, larger for females than males. We had six uh, perimembranous uh, VSD and 14 muscular. The associations of all of the different patients, we had one transposition with an apical VSD, an aortic coartation with an aortic stenosis and a BDA, one patient with a venous return anomaly with a pulmonary stenosis, a patient with two coartations who had surgery, one patient with a double aortic outlet and an apical VSD, a patient with a with an ASD, uh, one with and one with uh, a perimembranous VSD with uh, anterior extension, which had uh, been subjected to a banding and had an apical VSD. In our results uh, about the perimembranous VSDs, we had six patients. Uh, out of them, three patients were successful, and three of them were failures. Were uh, sent to surgery. The failures, two of them had a complete AV block. Uh, one of those uh, blocks was during the time of the AV loop and another one had a VTAC. And the other one uh, was at the moment of setting the prosthesis and we removed the prosthesis and we sent them for surgery. As for muscular VSD, all of them were successful for uh, this sample. We know that at some point we will find some difficulties. And uh, for co as for complications, patients under five kilograms, we had one patient with a perimembranous VSD who had an injury of the of the semilunar uh, aortic semilunar. One patient with a muscular VSD uh, that died during surgery. One patient who had an embolis embolization of the prosthesis. And uh, while trying to remove the prosthesis, the patient was serious. We uh, blocked the right branch. The patient went to, through surgery. They removed the prosthesis and they closed the, the VSD, but the patient died during surgery. Both complications were at the beginning of the experience. We knew very little how, about how to uh, 
to uh, perform the procedure and one of the patients uh, did, got uh, an arterial thrombus. The prosthesis was uh, removed and he recovered. Uh, one of the patients had a, a subaortic VSD. Three months later, uh, the patient developed a complete EV block that needed a pacemaker and one patient had a thrombus in the five to 10 kilograms and that improved with heparin. We believe that perimembranous and subaortic VSDs in patients under 10 kilos are surgical. Not in 100% of the cases, but uh, after this experience that we lived, we need to uh, consider all of these issues uh, in detail. Because this is not simple and we could generate large complications. The first patient, the, the TGV, uh, died due to septicemia and the one with the uh, venous return anomaly in the pulmonary veins developed a pulmonary vein stenosis and died during surgery while trying to correct the pulmonary vein stenosis. This is the patient that I was telling you about, the, the one that had the embolization of the right artery. You can see here how the prosthesis was uh, positioned. We had no way of removing it and, and seeing the, the the severity, severity of the patient, we decided to move it to the surgery. Another interesting thing that we see here, we had a perimembranous VSD with a large aortic component with prolapse. We decided to switch the design and to go with an eccentric with a type 3 prosthesis and three months later they uh, developed a complete AV block. Then, this uh, work that I want to show you is uh, similar to the way that we think. was a work that they did uh, with uh, perimembranous VSDs as well as uh, out of the six uh, perimembranous VSDs, all of them were treated with uh, ADO2. And, uh, this is uh, from Pediatric Cardiology, 2018, and one of the perimembranous, one of the patients developed six months after the procedure an AV block, so I we needed a, pay, pay, a pacemaker. So our idea is still the same. If we cannot position a prosthesis, we prefer not to do, not to attempt it. Of course, then appeared our good old friend, the uh, corner MF occluder which is, uh, has uh, some uh, similarities with the ADO2, very friendly, it has uh, anterograde and retrograde positioning. Here we have the image, we have already presented it in, before the society in some other chance, so I'm going to move forward with the cases. But this prosthesis uh, allowed us to work with uh, patients with uh, muscular VSDs. This is a uh, a critical uh, aortic uh, VSD and we opened the valve and we saw that we had this pro procedure that, we, that they had a muscular VSD. We went back, we came back with the prosthesis and uh, we did the occlusion of the, the, of the VSD going through the foramen ovale and we input the pro prosthesis and the VSD was closed. Here we see the check, uh, the controls, the follow-up, and the echo in the follow-up. This was a large prosthesis at 10.8 with a left disc of 14 millimeters. Another one of the most interesting cases that we had, I insist we're still not working with hybrid techniques. We need to uh, train a little bit better to perform this. We had a double, uh, mid ventricular uh, outlet uh, with the VSD for the VSD. We did the venovenous loop. Here we uh, left the guide on because this allows us that if the sheath uh, gets displaced, we can reinsert it without a need for, uh, for wasting time. So in the Last video, we can see how the, the right side starts being released, and see we, here we see the nitocluder. And 
The patient was had surgery and is in excellent uh, condition. And now another case is a uh, perimembranous VSD, and it was associated with a, a pickup VSD. And this patient had uh, an issue. We went uh, with so the the VSD, the perimembranous, and the foramen naval. We got, did a catheterization and uh, tip. We move forward with the sheath. We put in an MFO. Also, one of the big ones. We see the final control and the patient three months after was operated and it is in great general condition. We could close the, the perimembranous VSD What is the protocol that we use? All of our patients with heart failure, with BSDs below 10 millimeters. We have to see whether they have left to right shunt or those who have banding of the pulmonary artery where it is more difficult to see where is the shunt from left to right to see that the BSD is complicated for surgery. What do we have to take into account in this type of patients? First of all, with sub chambers that are smaller, all of the maneuvers are we're going to make are going to be done in patients who are more arrhythmogenic. And while as they are smaller chambers, all of the maneuvers have to be done very precisely and very thoroughly because there is risk of perforation. I have read in some articles that there were some perforations that were they needed to drain. That was not our case, they, um, luckily, but we do not know if that will happen because if that happened in the past, we may have complications as well. This type of patients are more sensitive to prolonged procedures, so we need to be very precise on how we perform the we do not have a lot of room to maneuver and we all always have to evaluate the BSD we are going to intervene if we say that the BSD as the paper set of 2018 has a diameter below six millimeters possibly those patients may can wait until until they are uh, over 10 kilograms and can be treated by means of the two approaches and with less risk than if you do that in patients under 10 kilograms. So we do not have to say, I do not close the perimembranous VSD. I believe that the ones that we are going to close cannot be related to the conduction uh, process because we can have greater complications. Homework, we took uh, work to home and we have to think that this is a procedure with a good window. The TTE and the EET are and the TE are amazing. We believe in our group and this is also my personal opinion that echocardiography has become a, a mandatory collaborator. We need to have this in the cath lab and sometimes it helps us choose better the size and type of prosthesis we need to use. As regards avoiding the arterial approach, I showed you the cases where we had thrombi in the iliac artery. I always try to say that the VSC may be closed perfectly without arterial approach. We have to avoid the arterial approach. And as well as you know that I do that the same for the ductus closure and in contrast I use very low amounts of contrast to close the VSD because the collaborator is the echo so you can see and there is no need to um, infuse contrast all of the time and that is for the benefit, benefit of the patient as well. We need to avoid prolonged procedures or lengthy procedures if we see a patient with heart failure that is very severe 
even if he the person has PSD, sometimes you need to think whether we can use the dissection, the carotid dissection, and from there you can move because sometimes you consider that it may be simple, the procedure. I want you to know that in our experience of carotid dissection, we have one patient who had paralysis of the vocal cords because there passed a nerve, an aberrant nerve, and he had a palsy of the vocal cords and the patient is in rehabilitation. And in patients, we can close the muscular BSEs of all of the types and the perimembranous ones that have aneurysm. Conclusions. The perimembranous BSTs in closure in, less, in patients less than 10 kilos have a lower effectiveness rate and higher probability of complications. It should only be considered in very specific cases to do a procedure, knowing that sometimes we may collaborate with surgery or otherwise we rather have a surgery instead. Muscular BSDs may be treated perfectly endovascularly in each of the ways we have had a great experience there. Echocardiography, transthoracic or transesophageal allows us to choose the best procedure, the diameter, the design, and lastly, I say this again, we need to avoid arterial approach. We do not need to go with the arterial approach. This is a technique that a lot of centers are in, uh, avoiding. There's a, there are a lot of uh, tips of information that of places that do the closure in a venous approach with echocardio without contrast. And they have excellent outcomes. So I believe that slowly we can close the uh, VSE without arterial approach. I would like to thank you very much. Post-surgical uh, closure of VSE, when and how to treat them. The VSE has an incidence of 30% of congenital cardiopathies. During a lot of years, the standard goal has been surgery cardiovascular surgery. The incidence of VSD, residual VSD has been reported in 5 to 25 percent according to the series and we need to see whether the surgeon is a senior or junior surgeon or a trainee. The experience in the closure of v percutaneous VSD starts in uh, 88 but in 2000 we start with the Amplater era starting with important experiences with great results for numerous series. This experience of the native VSDs is translated to the residual or surgical VSDs. There are four possible scenarios in this pathology. A, a patch that may be detached, a fenestrated patch, mus uh, muscular VSDs that are apical and iatrogenic. When we talk about the detachment of the patch, we, there we have certain factors. The tear of the patch, the tear of the myocardial tissue, by bacterial endocarditis or bad positioning of the patch. When we talk with our surgeons, the tear of the myocardial tissue is the most frequent one. We do a suture, but there are two points that are critical. The posterior infer inferior rim, and the superior rim F, edge where we have the aortic and tricuspid valves where we have tissue that is fibrous and sometimes we need to reinforce it with gilted uh, sutures. When we have a fenestrated patch, this is used in surgeries where the anatomy is complex, we have a lot of stenosis or hypoplasia of the tree in this time the closure of the VSD, we leave a central fenestration to avoid f acute failure of the right ventricle. Once we improve the anatomy with the stent or with the flow that is developed, the VSD may be transformed 
into hyper pulmonary hyperflux. Then we have muscular apical VSTs. When we try to close them, it is very difficult to do so. Surgeons develop different techniques to try and close them. Close them. And having a, a ventriculotomy. And on the left, these pathologies have a lot of uh, residual shunt complications. Then we have the atrogenic one. In complex cardiopathies that require um, a management of the RVOT, of the left uh, outro, outro tract, um, hypertrophy of the septum, or in valve replacement of the prosthesis. The AST is uh, weakened, or sometimes the scalpel can cause a direct trauma. When we have a residual BST, we have overload of volume, dysfunction of the left ventricle, arrhythmia, risk of endocarditis, pulmonary hypertension. When to do the treatment? The color uh, Doppler ultrasound is key. It confirms the position, the size, it evaluates the uh, associated structures and steams. Uh, it calculates the uh, hemodynamic repercussion, evaluating the enlargement of the left uh, chambers and calculating the pulmonary uh, pressure. We know that the size below two millimeters has high probability of spontaneous closure and not as compared to the rest of them. As regards the time of surgery and catheterization, there are no clear rules. There are some articles that suggest intervention after six months, allowing for healing and more firmness of the patch to have a good anchorage. But there are some other reports one month after the procedure in our series we have one case seven days after the surgery. If the um, VSD, the residual VST is apical, the patch will not be part of the procedure. If we compare intervention with surgery or catheterization in the reintervention of a VSD after surgery, a residual one, Catheterization has great, uh, less impact, psychological impact. There is no sternotomy, no bleeding risk, lower risk of transfusion of blood, uh, blood products, and recovery is faster. How to do the treatment? The implant technique can be done by a femoral vein, jugular or arterial one, with or without loop. We know that the fe anterior femoral loop um, approach is with a loop. The anterograde jugular one is preferred for the apical ones. The retrograde arterial uh, approach without loop is uh, an approach that we have been starting to use and has been very successful. It's very fat, fact, uh, fast. I'm sorry. It's effective. You can deal with most of the septum with. ADO2 and platzer devices and a limiting factor is that the device is smaller so you cannot intervene with a very high French. The retrograde French uh, femoral approach without loop is very useful. Anterograde is a very good choice. The devices that are recommended are one or two millimeters over the, milli the diameter of the orifice. This has, been, has to be evaluated with the echocardiography. And there is an article that suggests this, measuring this with a balloon of the residual uh, defect to have a good measurement. But as with the experience, you start trusting the echocardiography. The devices used in our services come from amplatzers with muscular VSDs and ADO2 devices are the ones that are used the most. We also use nictoclude for VSDs. Conar that came uh, some time ago. We have also used with a family of 
occluders for muscular VSTs and perimembranous. We have the symmetrical, eccentrical, asymmetrical ones. We have all of these devices as well. The result, when you review the series published on average from 80 to 120 minutes, the problem is solved. Intervention has been successful in all in 96 to 100 percent of cases. We have seen immediate residual shunt after the procedure from a 16 to 27 percent, but after one year it decreases to 4 to 16 percent, being very mild. Arrhythmias. They were present in almost all of the procedures during when the sheath is on the myocardium uh, tissue. They are temporary, as in embolization from 0 to 4.5%. Uh, the reinterventions uh, by catheterization from 0 to 22%. The explants of the prosthesis. 0 to 4.5%, uh, the uh, AV block complete was very feared but was reported from 0 to 4.5%, mortality has been of 0%, diameters of the left ventricle decrease at, a, at months of treatment, at 6 months of, of follow-up. This is a case of a tetralogy of Allot with a corrective surgery with VST of 3.5 millimeters and two collaterals, QPQS of 0, oh, 1.7, and time to surgery from surgery to catheterization was 10 days. The approach was at, um, through the artery and retrograde. You can see the left ventricle the tetralogy of Alec that was corrected and a VST on the posterior inferior rim when we do the catheterization we can confirm that there is a passage of flow that is very important we see the aorta we do the the amplatter AO2 release and then we do the echographic follow-up. This is the presentation of the prosthesis and then the release with the uh, final implant. An ventriculogram to see the position and the trivial residual shunt. With the echocardiography, we see that the aortic valve is patent without lesions and that the VSD is closed. A second case of a pulmonary atresia with VSD and a second ch a re uh, change of homograft and we opt for a corrective surgery with fenestrated patches and we leave an apical VSD, a complex anatomy. The time elapsed from surgery to the catheterization was just up two months. Here we can see with the transesophageal, um, with the TEE, the outflow tract and the aortic valve, and we can see the fenestrated patch. We're doing an aortic uh, release that was very fast in a retrograde approach. We have an amplatter ADO2 occluder here we released it, and there you can see that there is no residual shunt, minimum passage over the superior edge, but fenestration is closed. We review the apical part. We do a second release by through the aorta with an ADO2, 6-4 in this case. Two months after when we had a residual uh, apical sh uh, sh um, VSC in the apical area we implanted an occluder and it occlude and we can see the result here that was very good third case 
aortic stenosis that was congenital, and we did a valve plus uh, aortic valve plasty. We had to change the prosthesis that with the time required a second re uh, change of the prosthesis with the corner technique to open the outflow, outflow tract of the left ventricle. After the surgery, we have a iatrogenic VST from uh, 5 by 8 millimeters. And we went to the intervention one year after surgery, the last surgery. In this case, we had the limiting condition that the aortic valve did not allow us to do the loop, so we decided to do the uh, femoral anterograde and direct uh, approach without loop. The device that we use was this one. We can see the left ventricle, the outflow tract, the prosthesis of the aortic valve, and the VST, the atrogenic one, located 8 millimeters from the uh, um, valve, valvular annulus. This was a very challenging situation. We were afraid of damaging the valve. In fact, we had to program the surgery with standby surgery, having the prosthesis on the table, because if we created damage to the prosthesis and the patient had a, a regurgitation, we may had we could have had uh, severe complications. The, here we can see the valve. We could go through the VSD from the femoral vein of the right ventricle. And we do an exchange of the guide wire with the sheath and we do the release. We use a symmetrical device because we had a certain distance from the prosthesis uh, annuli. The, this is the prosthesis that is implanted. The VSD was closed. As a conclusion, the, the residual after surgery VSD closure has great advantages over the surgical closure in a reintervention. Luckily, we have different types of prosthesis and the election will depend on the operator and their knowledge. And it's reasonable, the late appro um, approach six months after the surgery, for example, to have a better fibrosis of the area and more uh, a better area for the anchorage but it can be done before if necessary thank you very much hello everyone uh, first of all i'd like to thank the organizing committee uh, uh, for your kind invitation uh, for me to be uh, virtually uh, on the solasi uh, meeting this year so my talk uh, will be uh, related to the outflow track vsd initial result. Um, so I'd like to modify a bit uh, of my of the topic uh, from alpha track uh, or sub aortic uh, instead of that it will be a sub arterial VSD initial result. So this is my disclosure. Um, so first of all I'd like to introduce a bit of the uh, VSD in this particular area like how does it look like. So as you can see here when you have a look from the right ventricular side, and this is the septal marginal trabeculation, uh, normally they will have the anterior, superior, and uh, posterior inferior rims here. So the VSD will stick and in between the leg of these two um, rims. And as you can see here also, there will be, as usual and as always, fibrous continuity between pulmonary valve and the aortic valve. So this is a typical um, uh, sub pulmonary or sub arterial or outflow track uh, VSD. So as you can see from this cartoon, uh, that um, when you talk about the, this uh, VSD, the um, conduction system is actually a bit far away because of there's a muscular rim um, that um, allows the, the defect to be away from the conduction system. So uh, when you have this defect, normally you may uh, have relationship, uh, not relationship, but uh, you, have, you may have the, uh, the problem with the aortic valve prolapse 
uh, together with aortic valve regurgitation. So uh, as interventionists, uh, what will we do to close subarterial VSD? As in this particular uh, picture, I would say that uh, our purpose is uh, will be two kind of thing. The first one is to close the defect while with the device, and also we need to support the aortic valve cast to stay not prolapsing and not you know uh, protruding or not uh, distorting. Uh, so it means that not all the VSD in this area can be so, uh, interventionally closed because uh, some of them cannot be closed by the device. I'll show you later on. Um, so that's very important that uh, we need to select the case uh, which is uh, good enough uh, or proper enough. So this is my general practice. Um, if you have the body weight of the patient more than 10 kilo, and you have uh, aortic valve prolapse, but not more than mild degree. I'll show you later on how does it look like. Uh, uh, if you have aortic regurgitation, but less than mild degree, and you have a true defect less than seven millimeters, or if you have like uh, alignment of the septum in normal alignment, and of course should be no other associated uh, cardiac anomalies. Um, so when I said not more than mild, it means that when the valve is prolapsing, if you prolapse, you know, even worse like this one. So if you uh, measure the length uh, between A and C and it's not more than from C and B, so that is um, so-called um, not severe, it's just small. Um, so that's the thing that um, I will use when I think about uh, closing the defect around this area. So uh, here's the echo finding of the transesophageal echo of the patient with mild aortic valve prolapse and mild aortic valve regurgitation. So this particular case is quite reasonable if you think about closing the defect by the device. Uh, Transthoracic trans echo, uh, you may be able to see the hole here and you can see the valve is prolapsing in long axis view. And also in short axis view, you can appreciate that the hole is sitting in between the aortic valve and also pulmonary valve. And also you can appreciate the degree of uh, jet here that demonstrating whether this is the um, AR in uh, how much in terms of the severity. And also uh, you need to measure um, the hole. Uh, most of the time you get uh, scrolling until you see in diastole, uh, in systole you will see the hole in the largest diameter as you can appreciate from these two still pictures. Um, in terms of LV angiogram, um, you may appreciate that if you go for like a routine LAO view, even you add a cranial view, you may not be able to see it very nicely. But if you are more angulated to the lateral, I mean LAO steep, LAO steep enough to 90 degree, you may be able to see the defect uh, here better. Um, uh, so it means that you need to go for more steep uh, to get the good um, picture of this defect. Or sometimes you need to go for RAO, either cranial or caudal, in order to see the defect uh, much easier, as you can appreciate from this angulation. Right, so uh, again, when we measure the, 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 the morphology of the, v, the, the, of the defect, you need to measure the LV entry, you need to measure the RV exit, and also you need to measure the length. Um, so when we uh, calculate, or when, when we put the number into the count, normally we're gonna get uh, the length um, and the diameter here, not there. Because as you can appreciate, if you measure the diameter here and you think this is a good diameter to uh, deal with, uh, you miss the most important part, which is uh, the place where you need to uh, put the device to um, support the defect uh, and also support the aortic valve. Uh, because if you, if you uh, just put the device here and that kind of protrusion of this um, aortic valve may not be able to uh, hold your device. So possible complication, device immobilization definitely most of the time because you underestimate the true VSD diameter, which is the red um, arrow, not the orange arrow. Residual shunt, neoaortic valve regurgitation or pulmonary regurgitation sometimes. Uh, outflow obstruction, if you deal with the small children, uh, ventricular arrhythmia uh, is less commonly occur, but it could happen, especially if you deal with this uh, RVOT, uh, which is very, uh, you know, vulnerable sometimes. 
with the ventricular arrhythmia. So device selection, uh, I would say that you prefer the soft device uh, rather than uh, you know rigid one, and you prefer the double disc, which would be uh, the kind of thing like this. You may have like options like ADO2, Piccolo, Kona MF, or the PFM. This one is not double disc, but it's soft enough to dancing together with the um, magic valve. So uh, as usual, uh, in general, uh, you're gonna open, uh, you're gonna oversize a bit in terms of the device, uh, of the device selection, one or two millimeter larger than the VSG diameter. And you need to make sure that your disc is strong enough to support uh, and not embolize uh, your device when you deploy it. So um, in general, you add four millimeter more than the diameter of the VSD. So we have a sample of how you can approach uh, so you can go either the anti-grade approach or the retrograde approach uh, to deal with the, uh, this defect. And this is the final result. You can appreciate that uh, uh, most of the time when they put the device in the right position, it will point upward like this because the hole is always pointing upward towards the pump you, uh, valve. And here's example of a different kind of device um, used uh, to uh, close the defect in this region. And also, you can also use the uh, very small um, device like Piccolo Occluder uh, to deal with the very small children or small child like 4.6 kilo uh, with uh, recurrent pneumonia and after coarctation repair and having residual shunt that we need to deal with. So let's, let's have a look on the initial result. Uh, so I would like to show two literatures and our data from uh, hospital, my hospital, and also not the Superporn hospital. Uh, the numbers, as you can see. So just to go one by one, uh, as you can appreciate that aortic valve prolapse can occur about thirty to up to nine, one hundred percent, depends on how you select the patient. Uh, but pre-existing aortic regurgitation also is a, one of the common uh, issues that we may deal with. Like uh, in the publication from Taiwan, it's about like 66% of the patient have the pre-existing aortic regurgitation. And when you have a look uh, on the data from our center, so we did compare the patient uh, uh, to close a VSD percutaneously and a surgery. Uh, and you can appreciate that the patient with surgery, uh, the age is less than uh, the patient with uh, percutaneous device closure, uh, similar to the weight. Um, the patient with surgery is um, younger and also um, less weight, uh, significantly in comparison to the uh, case uh, we do percutaneous device closure. And the valve prolapse is, looks pretty much the same. And pre-existing aortic regurgitation also pretty much the same from our series, there's no different. Uh, but just to show with you also that uh, it looks as if the chunt on the surgical case, it's uh, more significant than the chunt uh, on a percutaneous case. And when you have a look on the hemodynamic data between the previous publication and our data, uh, just to share with you that uh, the diameter of VSD looked pretty much the same for the percutaneous um, closure group. Uh, the number is about three to four millimeters. And the device uh, type that using will be um, ADO2 or the MFO or PFM coil. And when we compare our group uh, with the surgery, you can appreciate that VSD diameter in tan catheter case is significantly less than surgical case. And when you have a look on the procedural success, you can appreciate that um, it's uh, the ranging from 91% up to 100%, which is our theory. Uh, and in terms of the approach, 50-50, uh, uh, I would say, 50 can go retrograde and 50 can go anti-grade. Residual shunt uh, depends on the series, uh, but it's ranging from 20% immediately have a resolution up to 80%. Uh, other uh, complication is quite, uh, immediate complication is quite uh, less. Uh, so one patient here got the hemolysis uh, a few days after uh, the procedure done. Uh, 
Uh, so in our series, when we compare uh, the patient with uh, surgery, as you can see, the procedural time is significantly less than surgery, um, you know, when you deal with this uh, by the uh, catheter intervention. Residual shunt uh, is one of the things I would like to say that uh, it's very uh, ranging from 8% up to 50%, depends on the uh, uh, series, but uh, that is the latest follow-up which, uh, you know, the latest follow-up time will be like almost two years. And the worsening of the AR is uh, ranging from 16% up to 21%. In our theory, when we compare this with surgical outcome, it looks uh, pretty much um, the same, I mean, not much different. Uh, but as you can see, that, that looks as if the residual shunt and the new onset of AR is slightly increased in the transcatheter group. So uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that in early phase and selected case of transcatheter closure of subarterial VSD, uh, it's high success rate. And I would say that the residual shunt is somewhat a bit higher than surgery, and we need that data to confirm it, um, you know, in more uh, number of case series. Uh, but the good news is, uh, in comparison to surgery, there's no significant deterioration of the aortic valve regurgitation. So um, that is what I would like to deliver to all of you guys in Latin America. So thanks once again for uh, having me on your very uh, wonderful meeting of Selassie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Guarcan, for joining us. Yes, um, thank you. Um, it's a bit early in the morning, so yes. I'm sorry that I um, Maybe six, at home. <laughs> six or sorry? five? Six or five a.m.? Uh, it's almost it's five a.m. now. Wow, <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> so, so, any questions from, uh, from the panel? ¿O alguna pregunta para, para los expositores? Yo gustaría de hacer una pregunta. Primero quería eh, parabenizar a los palestrantes. Fue realmente alto nivel. Yo aprendí bastante con lo que fue dicho y presentado. Pero yo tengo una pregunta. Una de las preguntas es para Jesús Barbosa. Eh, esa, eh, es claro que esa, esa, ese nuestro miedo, ese nuestro receio de pegar siempre la vía arterial e em artérias muito pequenas, principalmente nas femorais, e uh, parabenizar pela técnica da, da punção ou pela via através do septo intraatrial, mas me preocupa bastante o catéter passando através da válvula mitral e o manuseio através da válvula mitral. E a pergunta seria o seguinte, eu fui incentivado pelo Raul Arrieta, um ano e meio atrás, a utilizar a via... É, axilar arterial para fazer alguns procedimentos e fechamento de canais ou é, válvuloplastias e eu tenho feito isso quase que rotineiramente quando eu preciso usar a via arterial e não utilizar mais a carótida e tenho tido confesso bastante sucesso e colocando até introdutores bastante de 6 e 7 F às vezes o que permite passar dispositivos bastante grandes é, a pergunta ao Jesus seria Tu não achas que essa via axilar seria uma opção bastante interessante ao invés de fazer a punção é, da, do septo interatrial para a oclusão dessa CIVs? Uh, essa seria a pergunta para o Jesus. E a pergunta para o Huracan, embora seja muito cedo, seria: uh, Didn't you have any problem with erosions in the aortic valve? Because the device is pretty close. Uh, to the aortic uh, sinus. So if you have any problem with erosions and late erosions in this kind of, uh, of technique. So yeah, yeah, thank, thanks mean. for the question. Thanks for the question. I think this is a very important question. And, uh, you know, as I, I can show you, uh, I did show you about the data, which was uh, quite initial. Uh, so two, one, two years follow up, that looks fine. Um, but, um, you know, we never know, like 10 years after now, uh, how does it look like? Uh, so, um, you know, by personal contact with Dr. Tin in Vietnam, so he had a lot of experience um, doing this. Um, 
he said, at least in his series, uh, more than five years, there's no issue on progression of the aortic regurgitation uh, or the uh, erosion as you um, uh, ask. Um, so again, uh, I think this is what we need to follow up. And this is what uh, I urge all the uh, cardiologists uh, intervention that uh, we need to be very careful. Uh, we need to be uh, you know, very selected. Uh, uh, case that we uh, should do with the selected device. Um, you can't use any kind of device, definitely. Uh, you need to use the, uh, the soft and um, you know, flexible device. As uh, I previously mentioned that um, ADO2 uh, is okay, the MF4 is okay, the coil uh, is fine, uh, uh, but you need to deal with the residual shunt sometimes. Um, yeah, so uh, this is the thing that uh, I've learned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bueno, a ver si sí, eh, coincido con tus apreciaciones. Eh, en algún momento lo hablamos con Raúl. ¿Te acordás, Raúl, el año pasado o el anteaño? Creo que fue, no me acuerdo bien que él me lo había sugerido. Pero da la casualidad que cuando lo hablamos con él, eh, maniobrando por vía retrógrada, tuvimos lesión por aorta del paciente que yo les relaté que falleció. Y eh, con la mitral, si uno, eh, no, tiene, uno no, no debe realizar un pullback traccionando con una guía, sino la guía debe estar totalmente cubierta por catéter, y lo que uno hace es empujar más la vaina de lo que traccionar. Eh, la vía axilar no, no la empecé con los niños, todo, es hecho axilar, en, tuvimos pacientes pequeños, cerreunductus, he tenido algún tipo de experiencia, pero no en CIB, ¿sí? No es despreciable, ahora vuelvo a reiterar, eh, con mi, atravesando la válvula mitral eh, no tuve dificultades, atravesando la válvula órtica se nos murió un paciente. Entonces, en una población que claramente no es enorme, porque acá uno trata siempre de mantener los protocolos en pacientes mayores, de 10 kilos, entonces los menores de 10 kilos que uno realiza son pacientes en insuficiencia cardíaca, con, con comorbilidades importantes, entonces eh, uno de pronto, eh, si yo voy a atravesar la válvula órtica, le, no sé si no le tengo hoy más respeto que a la válvula mitral, a vida cuenta de las complicaciones. ¿Sí? Gracias. No. Very much. Perfect. I wanted to say something as regards this, this specific point. Jesus, since we started with this experience with ADO2 and fast delivery using a four French introducer, we have not had much complications for the close, closure of the VSE in patients under 10 kilograms if they need it. We have had a very good outcomes so far. Yes, I would like to, since we're talking about this, I would like to ask Pebernibos, the, the choosing of a device when the patch is detached, it is very different from a normal VSE because it has a different shape and how do you choose the device? We tend to overestimate, but what, what is your case. In the cases we have had, we had a lot of echographic information. We did not have to place a balloon to have a better idea of the size. We uh, trust the echo and we could close it with ADO2 devices in most of the cases without further difficulties. We are always talking about up to four and a half millimeters and we always estimate from one to two millimeters apart from that in our cases. What do you think? Yes, I agree with you. We have a tendency of overestimating a little bit more as regards the perimembranos without the patch, but yes. We need to be very careful 
depending on when was the rupture so as not to en uh, enlarge that and continue doing a tear so we have a very specific limit but very good comment so alguna pregunta Huracan sobre este tema te gustaría Huracan recuerdo que traté de cerrar eh, y hacer un cierre de un paciente como nos mostraste y el procedimiento me llevó cuatro horas y finalmente eh, fue muy difícil, finalmente el dispositivo se embolizó y el dispositivo embolizó y, y, y tuvimos que enviar el paciente a cirugía pero terminamos usando otro, sí, otro tipo de, de enfoque sí, gracias por compartir yo tuve la misma experiencia que te ayudaste cuando intenté cerrarlo Again, um, you know, because there is no supporting tissue there at all. So that's why uh, we cannot close the big defect. Um, and sometimes uh, we don't know whether it's small or big because uh, the valve collapsed, I mean, the aortic valve collapsed. So it's uh, avoid us to know, to, to show the real defect, I mean, diameter. So that's why it's very important. Sometimes if you're not sure about the, the real diameter, you need to put the, uh, the sheet Uh, across the defect and then do repeat angio and with that you can uh, be able to uh, know exactly that what size uh, of the defect you are dealing with yeah again so challenging uh, procedure this one <laughs> <laughs> yes and once again thanks for having me thanks for having me I'm really really happy to be there virtually <laughs> One question, Jesus. Your topic was below uh, 10 kilograms, you said. And we have all uh, talked about this for a lot of time. And what about the periventricular? What is your opinion on that? If it is not surgical, not percutaneous, can it be periventricular instead of surgery? When procedures have comorbidities with it, such as the double outflow tract, the VSC, with associations requiring uh, extracorporeal uh, pumps. It simplifies everything and that is better for the patient. But when the patient has a VSC, as we sometimes have of the, of the top part of an end, or uh, mid-ventricular. If I only have to do periventricular, I have to uh, evaluate the heart anatomy. If it has, for example, AST, I'd rather, maybe this is based on my personal experience, but I'm very comfortable with simple procedures within um, the extent of all of these complications, of course. I do not want to make myself bigger than I am, but doing the catheterization through the mitral valve, the VSD is very simple. It's reasonably simple. The radio focus is a very friendly guide. It allows us to, um, to move it. When I showed before in the mid ventricular area that we placed four devices a multiple muscular, one of the VSDs was closed in that way, that it was the first one that we did, that we closed. In that case, for institutional uh, context and the practice that we have, I, I'd rather go with the procedure we do here, but clearly if the patient has to go to the pump, extracorporeal pump, pump yes, we have to go to the periventricular Okay, uh, I have Jose Alonso and maybe he has some comments, some precise comments to do. I wouldn't say criticism, just comments. We use a lot the periventricular access surgeons 
some this is a procedure that is very short and open uh, opening a small toracotomy that can be perfectly done with great results sometimes we do them as Jesus said there are some difficult uh, of access for the surgeon and before the pump enters we close the VSD periventricularly and then they operate a patient in the rest of the malformations that we have and we are doing this very frequently now if you give me a moment I would like to make a question to Dr. Workham Bueno, acá tengo una pregunta para, para, para ti para vos en el dispositivo debería sostener la eh, tricúspide, la válvula tricúspide como O sea, en vista del tema de la insuficiencia aórtica, pero la estenosis, ¿puedes, ¿puedes explicarnos cómo seleccionar el tamaño de dispositivo según los, eh, los orificios? Porque el orificio está más arriba que la válvula tricúspide, como nos, mostra, como nos mostraste. Sí, yeah, so, uh, again, um, if you're not sure about the, the size, um because of the prolapsing of the uh, of the aortic valve, uh, you need to um, have uh, uh, the catheter. I mean, the, the sheath or you know, anything just to push, uh, you know, in the aorta in order to push the, the, the cusp up a bit. And then you do repeated um, LV angio. Uh, with that, uh, you, can, you can know exactly the diameter of the defect. Um, so I will, I will use that diameter and plus about one millimeter, um, you know, of the of the of the size, uh, in order to select the the, the the device. For example, if I have the uh, defect, you know, before before the sheath is in, about um, three millimeters, and somehow uh, when I put the sheath in, it's increased up to four. Then I will I will use four millimeter as the uh, as my defect size. So I plus one is going to be five millimeter. So uh, that that's my uh, calculation uh, um, routinely. Um, and uh, so if I understand your question correctly, uh, that is uh, the diameter that I use. And for the the type of device, um, um, again, um, I prefer the ADO two or the MF four. But nowadays, I I prefer much uh, on the MF four uh, because it looks like a, a, a plug. I mean, how can I say it in English? Um, the there, there's only one um, uh, um, um, uh, how can I say? Let let me think. Um, let's say for the ADO two, there are two flexible points. Uh, you know, the waist is in the middle, and the disc is on both sides, so it's flexible uh, on both sides. But for the for the MFO, the flexible part is only at the at the at the waist, which is only on the on the uh, primary artery side. Uh, so with that, uh, it more um, uh, uh, chance to have uh, uh, stability, and also have uh, less chance to uh, to have the residual shunt. Uh, again, it's very difficult to say, um, but um, this is um, what I what I prefer. Um, oversize a bit about one millimeter, not more than two. Uh, if it's larger than, um, you know, six to seven millimeter, I will avoid to do the procedure. I'm not sure if I answer your question or not. It's quite complex answering. Yes, thank you. Viviana? Pass in mood, Olivian. Estás muteada. Ahí está. Um, a question for uh, Warcam. Um, yes. How are Elena, you? Elena, good to see you. 
Sorry, I didn't open the camera. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, what uh, do you do with the subpulmonary uh, VSD? Uh, I have uh, closed uh, um, an upper tract, uh, which was uh, subpulmonary uh, the VSD, and it was a VSD uh, in which I had put uh, ten eight. MFO. It was uh, bigger than what looks at in the echo. And mm. the, the patient was very good. And the, mm. the last CSI, I showed the case uh, mm. in Frankfurt. And the most uh, commentary was why we didn't uh, do that by perventricular or hybrid procedure. Mm. I, I don't have my surgeon doesn't want to do mm. a hybrid procedure. Mm. So I agree with Jesus uh, that uh, going on transcatheter uh, closure. Um, mm. You had put the limit of 10 kilos. And mm. I am doing the, the same experience with the Jesus of uh, under 10 kilos, this patient was six mm. kilos. Mm. Um, what do you think about a closure dose VSD? Yeah, uh, again, um, you know, uh, my personal practice to close subpulmonary VSD is I try to avoid it, to be honest, um, because I think, I don't know how, how does it look like in the long term. Um, so, uh, so that's why I, I put myself above 10 kilo. I put myself a uh, diameter, uh, you know, less than six to eight millimeter, if I'm not sure. Uh, and luckily that um, the surgeon here in Thailand, they are quite um, okay with this. So, uh, I mean, to do surgery. So, so that's why, uh, again, if, uh, if I'm on your shoes and, you know, uh, you need to, to help the patients out because this is a significant chance, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I may I may I may do uh, the same thing with you, uh, but again with cautions that um, telling the parents that this is uh, you know not uh, routine. Uh, this is uh, what we try to help, uh, but again we can't complain uh, completely say that it's completely safe. Uh, you know, in the five or ten years from now. Um, yeah, so this is what I will uh, will do. So I agree with you. If you have um, uh, less support. Uh, for the surgical uh, kind of uh, modalities, uh, I, I, I may do the same thing with you. Thank you. Alejandro, please go ahead. Uh, 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 pregunta rápida, I que me que una inquietud con la uh, presentación first, de José Luis Piverno. José, José excelente tu presentación. Eh, me me quedó la, la idea, idea que transmitiste que la CIB post-quirúrgica, eh, ustedes tratan de esperarla más allá de los tres, seis meses, si no entendí mal, para cerrar aquella CIB para eh, que se prueba la, la, la endotización o la cicatrización del parche. Uh, uh, Mi idea es de la CIB uh, postquirúrgicas se cierran en el periodo When agudo, sobre todo eh, las que, las que uh, no puede sacar el paciente del ventilador, aquel que tiene insuficiencia cardíaca de alto gasto que no puede ser externado, por lo tanto hace falta intervenirla. Esa es una práctica usual o una estrategia de esperar esta CIB porque muchas de ellas son pequeñas y después no hace falta cerrarla. Eh, me gustaría un I comentario tuyo de esto. Sí, mira, yes. lo que, lo que yo transmití es que no hay reglas claras. Real, primer punto. Uh, um, la sugerencia de, de cerrarla por arriba de los seis meses es una sugerencia sacada de, de lectura de series. ¿no? Sobre todo One Piece, una serie muy grande que tiene. Eh, nosotros en nuestra serie tenemos cerrado una a los siete días y otra a los diez. O sea, que técnicamente se puede hacer Va a depender del tamaño y depende del ecografista, o sea, la evaluación cardiológica, qué, qué grado de repercusión hemodinámica tiene, si se puede esperar o no. Creo que en el grupo, que lo hemos discutido esto, si podemos esperar y que se logre una fibrosis y tener un orificio más estabilizado con un parche estable, Creo que es más sencillo entregar la prótesis y tener menos riesgo de embolización. Como norma, si uno puede esperar, si está en una situación hemodinámica compleja, 
también nosotros hemos avanzado y hemos podido cerrarla sin dificultad. Así que aquí creo que no hay una regla clara, Alejandro. No sé el resto que puedo opinar de esto. Yo... yo... Sí. Coincido también con Alejandro. Si tiene repercusión, no importa cuánto... Cuánto, ¿Cuánto tiempo el post lo tiene? No hay que cerrarlo. Sí, sí, esa es la política nuestra también. Lo que pasa es que si se desprendió parte del parche, no tenemos duda de por qué se desprendió ese parche, es más riesgoso hacerlo en etapa 1. La política nuestra es el chico, no puede salir, el riesgo del de arredo es más grande que intentar cerrarlo por cateterismo. Pero todavía no tenemos una situación adecuada, cuando el paciente lo permite, sí, sí, sí esperamos. Cuando podemos, esperamos. Coincidimos, sí, así será. Ahora, ahora, una última cosita. Si el defecto eh, residual postquirúrgico es, por ejemplo, no tiene involucrado un parche, como puede ser las seis vejas apicales, intentaron cerrarla y no pudieron, bueno, ahí se avanza con absoluta tranquilidad. En una CIB, por ejemplo, de tipo iatrogénica, donde se produjo una lesión directa del bisturí, y acá también eh, los límites de esa CIB, si hay microinfarto local, también son límites no muy claros, no hay quizás también bien, un poquito de cicatrización si le molina el paciente lo en general, José, eh, estoy de acuerdo con vos eh, con respecto a, a la abordaje eh, o, o eso, o es lo que hemos venido haciendo, sobre todo lo, la, la, lo que uno cierra post quirúrgica, es raro el, el, el detenimiento o la deficiencia de parche que sean grandes y que haya que intervenir en lo más común en nuestra, en nuestra vida diaria son aquellas musculares adicionales que a lo mejor no se vieron en un eco previo o algo así, o las musculares múltiples que cierran algunas y queda un, queda un shunt significativo y hace falta cerrarlas en el operatorio. Creo que eh, eh, ahora eh, queda claro que estas musculares adicionales o múltiples son de cierre inmediato y las otras, si se puede estudiar el paciente, puede, puede transcurrir su postoperatorio, esperar sería prudente. Sí, Excelente. Eh, bueno, me gustaría aprovechar aquí eh, que está la Comisión Científica del Congreso, porque ya estamos en la hora. Eh, primero para felicitarlos y me gustaría que dieran las palabras finales. Me acaba de llegar aquí una noticia. 788 personas conectadas en este momento. Eh, muy buen número. El número similar al de ayer. Ayer también a la tarde 850 personas en la sesión de congénitas, en la última sesión. Entonces no sé a ustedes, está José, Alejandro, Liliana, Germán, gente de la, de la Jesús, la de Jesús, gente de la Comisión Científica, me gustaría que, que hagan un cierre de este espectacular evento. Y thank you, Warakan, for your presentation. Graham, your gracias, Graham, gracias, Warakan, por tu thank presentación you. y por tu thank presencia you. aquí. Gracias. Gracias. And again, thanks for having me. Gracias. Agradezco de mi parte. José, empieza vos. José, you can start. Eh, para mí es un placer eh, colaborar. Eh, en esto estamos aprendiendo. Disculpen algunos errores de edición que hemos tenido. Eh, vamos a tratar de mejorar. Eh, en realidad, esperemos que no haya que hacer más virtuales. Quiero agradecer a, a todos los invitados, tanto nacionales como extranjeros, por la buena predisposición que tuvieron ante todas las cosas que hemos pedido, que repitan la charla para grabarla y cosas por el estilo. Y eh, especialmente yo le quiero agradecer al doctor Boracan por que se te haya es muy temprano o muy tarde, este, son más casi 12 horas de diferencia horaria, este, y agradecerle el esfuerzo por haber estado con nosotros y a la gente de PICS que, bueno, colaboran con nosotros para que el Congreso también sea un poco mejor. Eh, no quiero extenderme mucho más, realmente muchas gracias a todos. Creo, como comentó Raúl recién, que la audiencia ha sido muy importante durante los dos días y el nivel de las presentaciones fue realmente excelente. Muchas gracias a todos. Perfecto.
Bueno, yo simplemente eh, también like agradecer, eh, fue un placer trabajar con todos. Eh, nuestra intención con José inicialmente fue incluir a todo el mundo, tratamos de darle participación uh, a todos los colegas de Latinoamérica eh, y a, 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 que, que tengan una este, participación uh, activa. Active eh, la virtualidad no es la mejor forma, pero fue lo mejor que nos salió uh, but eh, y solamente agradecer like a, a todos. Y José, eh, uh, públicamente un placer trabajar con con este voz en esto y después se sumó Jesús y Liliana que también hizo un aporte muy importante. Gracias. Quiero agradecerles a Alejandro y a José por haber llevado la mayor parte del trabajo y hecho una organización perfecta. Eh, el Congreso fue un éxito, como acaba de decir Raúl, con el número de asistentes y el el nivel de las charlas eh, fue magnífico. Así que, bueno, espero que nos podamos ver en el próximo Solasi ya de manera presencial y poder continuar disfrutando de la compañía de todos. Bueno, termino yo diciendo una po dos cositas. Thank you, Waragam. Thank you. Again, you are a, great, a good friend for us. Eh, Raúl, okay. sos un hermano. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my honor. My honor. As always, I'm, I'm Professor Dempsey. Uh, Jose and Alejandro, I say this and say this again. You did most of the effort, so thank you very much to both of you. Thank you very much. See you. See you in the next Solasi. I hope physically together.